Section thirty three of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter thirteen. At half past eleven that evening, five carriages were stationed in the Rue Saint Georges before the famous courtesan's door there was lucien's who had brought rastignac bichu and blondet du Tillet's, the baron de nucingen's the nabob's and florine's she was invited by du Tillet. the closed and doubly shuttered windows were screened by the splendid chinese silk curtains supper was to be served at one wax lights were blazing the dining-room and little drawing-room displayed all their magnificence the party looked forward to such an orgy as only three such women and such men as these could survive they began by playing cards as they had to wait about two hours do you play my lord asked du tillet to peyrade i have played with o'connell pitt fox canning lord brougham lord say at once no end of lords said bichu lord fitzwilliam lord ellenborough lord hartford lord bichu was looking at peyrade's shoes and stooped down what are you looking for asked blondet for the spring one must touch to stop this machine said florine do you play for twenty francs a point i will play for as much as you like to lose he does it well said esther to lucien they all take him for an englishman du tillet nucingen peyrade and rastignac sat down to a whist table florine madame du val noble esther blondet and bichu sat round the fire chatting lucien spent the time in looking through a book of fine engravings supper is ready paccard presently announced in magnificent livery peyrade was placed at florine's left hand and on the other side of him bichu whom esther had enjoined to make the englishman drink freely and challenge him to beat him bichu had the power of drinking an indefinite quantity never in his life had peyrade seen such splendor or tasted of such cookery or seen such fine women i am getting my money's worth this evening for the thousand crowns la val noble has cost me till now thought he and besides i have just won a thousand francs this is an example for men to follow said suzanne who was sitting by lucien with a wave of her hand at the splendors of the dining-room esther had placed lucien next herself and was holding his foot between her own under the table do you hear said madame du val noble addressing peyrade who affected blindness this is how you ought to furnish a house when a man brings millions home from india and wants to do business with the nucingens he should place himself on the same level i belong to a temperance society then you will drink like a fish said bichu for the indies are uncommon hot uncle it was bichu's jest during supper to treat peyrade as an uncle of his returned from india montame de val noble told me you shall have some ideas said nucingen scrutinizing peyrade ah this is what i wanted to hear said du tillet to rastignac the two talking gibberish together you will see they will understand each other at last said bichu guessing what du tillet had said to rastignac sir baronet i have imagined a speculation oh a very comfortable job beaucoup profitable and rich in profits now you will see said blondet to du tillet he will not talk one minute without dragging in the parliament and the english government it is in china in the opium trade yeah i know said nucingen at once as a man who is well acquainted with commercial geography 
but the english government have taken up the opium trade as a means that shall open up china and she shall not allow that we nucingen has cut him out with the government remarked du tillet to blondet ah you have been in the opium trade cried madame de val noble now i understand why you are so narcotic some has stuck in your soul there you see cried the baron to the self-styled opium merchant and pointing to madame de val noble you are like me never shall a millionaire be able to make a woman love him i have loved much and often milady replied peyrade as a result of temperance said bixiou who had just seen peyrade finish his third bottle of claret and now had a bottle of port wine uncorked oh cried peyrade it is very fine the portugal of england blondet du tillet and bixiou smiled at each other peyrade had the power of travestying everything even his wit there are very few englishmen who will not maintain that gold and silver are better in england than elsewhere the fowls and eggs exported from normandy to the london market enable the english to maintain that the poultry and eggs in london are superior very fine to those of paris which come from the same district esther and lucien were dumbfounded by this perfection of costume language and audacity they all ate and drank so well and so heartily while talking and laughing that it went on till four in the morning bixiou flattered himself that he had achieved one of the victories so pleasantly related by bria savarin but at the moment when he was saying to himself as he offered his uncle some more wine i have vanquished england peyrade replied in good french to this malicious scoffer toujours mon garçon go it my boy which no one heard but bixiou hello good man all he is as english as i am my uncle is a gascon i could have no other bixiou and peyrade were alone so no one heard this announcement peyrade rolled off his chair on to the floor paccard forthwith picked him up and carried him to an attic where he fell sound asleep at six o'clock next evening the nabob was roused by the application of a wet cloth with which his face was being washed and awoke to find himself on a camp bed face to face with asie wearing a mask and a black domino well papa peyrade you and i have to settle accounts said she where am i asked he looking about him listen to me said asie and that will sober you though you do not love madame du val noble you love your daughter i suppose my daughter peyrade echoed with a roar yes mademoiselle lydie what then what then she is no longer in the rue des moineaux she has been carried off peyrade breathed a sigh like that of a soldier dying of a mortal wound on the battlefield while you were pretending to be an englishman some one else was pretending to be peyrade your little lydie thought she was with her father and she is now in a safe place oh you will never find her unless you undo the mischief you have done what mischief yesterday monsieur lucien de rubempre had the door shut in his face at the duc de grandlieu's this is due to your intrigues and to the man you let loose on us do not speak listen as he went on seeing peyrade open his mouth you will have your daughter again pure and spotless she added emphasizing her statement by the accent on every word only on the day after that on which monsieur lucien de rubempre 
walks out of saint thomas d'aquin as the husband of mademoiselle clotilde if within ten days lucien de rubempre is not admitted as he has been to the grand lieu's house you to begin with will die a violent death and nothing can save you from the fate that threatens you then when you feel yourself dying you will have time before breathing your last to reflect my daughter is a prostitute for the rest of her life though you have been such a fool as to give us this hold for our clutches you still have sense enough to meditate on this ultimatum from our government do not bark say nothing to any one go to contencens and change your dress and then go home cut will tell you that at a word from you your little didi went downstairs and has not been seen since if you make any fuss if you take any steps your daughter will begin where i tell you she will end she is promised to de marsay with old conquewell i need not mince matters i should think or wear gloves eh? go on downstairs and take care not to meddle in our concerns any more as he left peyrade in a pitiable state every word had been a blow with a club the spy had tears in his eyes and tears hanging from his cheeks at the end of a wet furrow they are waiting dinner for mr johnson said europe putting her head in a moment after peyrade made no reply he went down walked till he reached a cab stand and hurried off to undress at contencens not saying a word to him he resumed the costume of pere Conquewell and got home by eight o'clock he mounted the stairs with a beating heart when the flemish woman heard her master she asked him well and where is mademoiselle with such simplicity that the old spy was obliged to lean against the wall the blow was more than he could bear he went into his daughter's rooms and ended by fainting with grief when he found them empty and heard Kat's story which was that of an abduction as skilfully planned as if he had arranged it himself well well thought he i must knock under i will be revenged later now i must go to corentin this is the first time we have met our foes corentin will leave that handsome boy free to marry an empress if he wishes yes i understand that my little girl should have fallen in love with him at first sight oh that spanish priest is a knowing one courage friend peyrade disgorge your prey the poor father never dreamed of the fearful blow that awaited him on reaching corentin's house bruno the confidential servant who knew peyrade said monsieur is gone away for a long time for ten days where i don't know good god i am losing my wits i ask him where as if we ever told them thought he a few hours before the moment when peyrade was to be roused in his garret in the rue saint georges corentin coming in from his country place at passy had made his way to the duc de grandlieu's in the costume of a retainer of a superior class he wore the ribbon of the legion of honor at his buttonhole he had made up a withered old face with powdered hair deep wrinkles and a colorless skin his eyes were hidden by tortoise-shell spectacles he looked like a retired office clerk on giving his name as monsieur de saint denis he was led to the duke's private room where he found derville reading a letter which he himself had dictated to one of his agents the number whose business it was to write documents the duke took corentin aside to tell him all that he already knew monsieur de saint-denis listened 
coldly and respectfully amusing himself by studying this grand gentleman by penetrating the tufa beneath the velvet cover by scrutinizing this being now and always absorbed in whist and in regard for the house of grandlieu if you will take my advice monsieur said corentin to derville after being duly introduced to the lawyer we shall set out this very afternoon for angouleme by the bordeaux coach which goes quite as fast as the mail and we shall not need to stay there six hours to obtain the information monsieur le duc requires it will be enough if i have understood your grace to ascertain whether monsieur de rubempre's sister and brother-in-law are in a position to give him twelve hundred thousand francs and he turned to the duke you have understood me perfectly said the duke we can be back again in four days corentin went on addressing derville and neither of us will have neglected his business long enough for it to suffer that was the only difficulty i was about to mention to his grace said derville it is now four o'clock i am going home to say a word to my head clerk and pack my travelling bag and after dinner at eight o'clock i will be but shall we get places he said to monsieur de saint denis interrupting himself i will answer for that said corentin be in the yard of the chief office of the messagerie at eight o'clock if there are no places they shall make some for that is the way to serve monseigneur le duc de grandlieu gentlemen said the duke most graciously i postpone my thanks corentin and the lawyer taking this as a dismissal bowed and withdrew at the hour when peyrade was questioning corentin's servant monsieur de saint denis and derville seated in the bordeaux coach were studying each other in silence as they drove out of paris next morning between orleans and tours derville being bored began to converse and corentin condescended to amuse him but keeping his distance he left him to believe that he was in the diplomatic service and was hoping to become consul-general by the good offices of the duc de grandlieu two days after leaving paris corentin and derville got out at Monsle, to the great surprise of the lawyer who thought he was going to angouleme in this little town said corentin we can get the most positive information as regards madame sechard do you know her then asked derville astonished to find corentin so well informed i made the conductor talk finding he was a native of angouleme he tells me that madame sechard lives at marsac and marsac is but a league away from Monsle. i thought we should be at greater advantage here than at angouleme for verifying the facts and besides thought derville as monsieur le duc said i act merely as the witness to the inquiries made by this confidential agent the inn at Monsle, la belle étoile had for its landlord one of those fat and burly men whom we fear we may find no more on our return but who still ten years after are seen standing at their door with as much superfluous flesh as ever in the same linen cap the same apron with the same knife the same oiled hair the same triple chin all stereotyped by novel writers from the immortal cervantes to the immortal walter scott are they not all boastful of their cookery have they not all whatever you please to order and do not all end by giving you the same hectic chicken and vegetables cooked with rank butter they all boast of their fine wines and all make you drink the wine of the country but corentin from his earliest youth had known the art of getting out of an innkeeper things more essential to himself than doubtful dishes and apocryphal wines 
so he gave himself out as a man easy to please and willing to leave himself in the hands of the best cook in Mansle, as he told the fat man there is no difficulty about being the best i am the only one said the host serve us in the side room said corentin winking at derville and do not be afraid of setting the chimney on fire we want to thaw out the frost in our fingers it was not warm in the coach said derville is it far to marsac asked corentin of the innkeeper's wife who came down from the upper regions on hearing that the diligence had dropped two travellers to sleep there are you going to marsac monsieur replied the woman i don't know he said sharply is it far from hence to marsac he repeated after giving the woman time to notice his red ribbon in a chaise a matter of half an hour said the innkeeper's wife do you think that monsieur and madame sechard are likely to be there in winter to be sure they live there all the year round it is now five o'clock we shall still find them up at nine oh yes till ten they have company every evening the cure monsieur marron the doctor good folks then said derville oh the best of good souls replied the woman straightforward honest and not ambitious neither monsieur sechard though he is very well off they say he might have made millions if he had not allowed himself to be robbed of an invention in the paper-making of which the brothers cointet are getting the benefit ah to be sure the brothers cointet said corentin hold your tongue said the innkeeper what can it matter to these gentlemen whether monsieur sechard has a right or no to a patent for his inventions in paper-making if you mean to spend the night here at the belle étoile he went on addressing the travellers here is the book and please to put your names down we have an officer in this town who has nothing to do and spends all his time in nagging at us the devil said corentin while derville entered their names and his profession as attorney to the lower court in the department of the seine i fancied the sechards were very rich some people say they are millionaires replied the innkeeper but as to hindering tongues from wagging you might as well try to stop the river from flowing old sechard left two hundred thousand francs worth of landed property it is said and that is not amiss for a man who began as a workman well and he may have had as much again in savings for he made ten or twelve thousand francs out of his land at last so supposing he were fool enough not to invest his money for ten years that would be all told but even if he lent it at high interest as he is suspected of doing there would be three hundred thousand francs perhaps and that is all five hundred thousand francs is a long way short of a million i should be quite content with the difference and no more of the belle étoile for me really said corentin then monsieur david sechard and his wife have not a fortune of two or three millions why exclaimed the innkeeper's wife that is what the cointets are supposed to have who robbed him of his invention and he does not get more than twenty thousand francs out of them where do you suppose such honest folks would find millions they were very much pinched while the father was alive but for kolb their manager and madame kolb who is as much attached to them as her husband they could scarcely have lived why how much had they with la berberie a thousand francs a year perhaps corentin drew derville aside and said in vino veritas truth lives under a cork for my part i regard an inn as the real registry office of the countryside the notary is not better informed than the innkeeper as to all that goes on in a small neighbourhood you see we are supposed to know all about the cointets and kolb and the rest 
your innkeeper is the living record of every incident he does the work of the police without suspecting it a government should maintain two hundred spies at most for in a country like france there are ten millions of simple-minded informers however we need not trust to this report though even in this little town something would be known about the twelve hundred thousand francs sunk in paying for the rubempre estate we will not stop here long i hope not derville put in and this is why added corentin i have hit on the most natural way of extracting the truth from the mouth of a seychard couple i rely upon you to support by your authority as a lawyer the little trick i shall employ to enable you to hear a clear and complete account of their affairs after dinner we shall set out to call on monsieur seychard said corentin to the innkeeper's wife have beds ready for us we want separate rooms there can be no difficulty under the stars oh monsieur said the woman we invented the sign the pun is to be found in every department said corentin it is no monopoly of yours dinner is served gentlemen said the innkeeper but where the devil can that young fellow have found the money is the anonymous writer accurate can it be the earnings of some handsome baggage said derville as they sat down to dinner ah that will be the subject of another inquiry said corentin lucien de rubempre as the duc de chaulieu tells me lives with a converted jewess who passes for a dutchwoman and is called esther van bogsek what a strange coincidence said the lawyer i am hunting for the heiress of a dutchman named gobsek it is the same name with a transposition of consonants well said corentin you shall have information as to her parentage on my return to paris end of section thirty three Section thirty four of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter fourteen. An hour later, the two agents for the Grandlieu family set out for La Verberie, where Monsieur and Madame Sechard were living never had lucien felt any emotion so deep as that which overcame him at la verberie when comparing his own fate with that of his brother-in-law the two parisians were about to witness the same scene that had so much struck lucien a few days since everything spoke of peace and abundance at the hour when the two strangers were arriving a party of four persons were being entertained in the drawing-room of la verberie the cure of marsac a young priest of five-and-twenty who at madame sechard's request had become tutor to her little boy lucien the country doctor monsieur marron the mayor of the commune and an old colonel who grew roses on a plot of land opposite to la verberie on the other side of the road every evening during the winter these persons came to play an artless game of boston for some team points to borrow the papers or return those they had finished when monsieur and madame sechard had bought la verberie a fine house built of stone and roofed with slate the pleasure grounds consisted of a garden of two acres in the course of time by devoting her savings to the purpose handsome madame sechard had extended her garden as far as a brook by cutting down the vines on some ground she purchased and replacing them with grass plots and clumps of shrubbery at the present time the house surrounded by a park of about twenty acres and enclosed by walls was considered the most imposing place in the neighborhood 
old sechard's former residence with the outhouses attached was now used as the dwelling-house for the manager of about twenty acres of vineyard left by him of five farmsteads bringing in about six thousand francs a year and ten acres of meadow-land lying on the further side of the stream exactly opposite the little park indeed madame sechard hoped to include them in it the next year la verberie was already spoken of in the neighborhood as a chateau and eve sechard was known as the lady of marsac lucien while flattering her vanity had only followed the example of the peasants and vine-dressers courtois the owner of the mill very picturesquely situated a few hundred yards from the meadows of la verberie was in treaty it was said with madame sechard for the sale of his property and this acquisition would give the finishing touch to the estate and the rank of a place in the department madame sechard who did a great deal of good with as much judgment as generosity was equally esteemed and loved her beauty now really splendid was at the height of its bloom she was about six-and-twenty but had preserved all the freshness of youth from living in the tranquillity and abundance of a country life still much in love with her husband she respected him as a clever man who was modest enough to renounce the display of fame in short to complete her portrait it is enough to say that in her whole existence she had never felt a throb of her heart that was not inspired by her husband or her children the tax paid to grief by this happy household was as may be supposed the deep anxiety caused by lucien's career in which eve sechard suspected mysteries which she dreaded all the more because during his last visit lucien roughly cut short all his sister's questions by saying that an ambitious man owed no account of his proceedings to any one but himself in six years lucien had seen his sister but three times and had not written her more than six letters his first visit to la verberie had been on the occasion of his mother's death and his last had been paid with a view to asking the favor of the lie which was so necessary to his advancement this gave rise to a very serious scene between monsieur and madame sechard and their brother and left their happy and respected life troubled by the most terrible suspicions the interior of the house as much altered as the surroundings was comfortable without luxury as will be understood by a glance round the room where the little party were now assembled a pretty aubusson carpet hangings of grey cotton twill bound with green silk brocade the woodwork painted to imitate spa wood carved mahogany furniture covered with grey woollen stuff and green gimp with flower stands gay with flowers in spite of the time of year presented a very pleasing and home-like aspect the window curtains of green brocade the chimney ornaments and the mirror frames were untainted by the bad taste that spoils everything in the provinces and the smallest details all elegant and appropriate gave the mind and eye a sense of repose and of poetry which a clever and loving woman can and ought to infuse into her home madame sechard still in mourning for her father sat by the fire working at some large piece of tapestry with the help of madame kolb the housekeeper to whom she entrusted all the minor cares of the household a chaise has stopped at the door said courtois hearing the sound of wheels outside and to judge by the clatter of metal it belongs to these parts postel and his wife have come to see us no doubt said the doctor no said courtois the chaise has come from Monsle. Montame, said kolb the burly alsatian we have made acquaintance with in a former volume illusion perdue 
here is a lawyer from paris who wants to speak with monsieur a lawyer cried sechard the very word gives me the colic thank you said the mayor of marsac named cachan who for twenty years had been an attorney at angouleme and who had once been required to prosecute sechard my poor david will never improve he will always be absent-minded said eve smiling a lawyer from paris said courtois have you any business in paris no said eve but you have a brother there observed courtois take care lest he should have anything to say about old sechard's estate said cachan he had his finger in some very queer concerns worthy man corentin and derville on entering the room after bowing to the company and giving their names begged to have a private interview with monsieur and madame sechard by all means said sechard but is it a matter of business solely a matter regarding your father's property said corentin then i beg you will allow monsieur the mayor a lawyer formerly at angouleme to be present also are you monsieur derville said cachan addressing corentin no monsieur this is monsieur derville replied corentin introducing the lawyer who bowed but said sechard we are so to speak a family party we have no secrets from our neighbors there is no need to retire to my study where there is no fire our life is in the sight of all men but your father's said corentin was involved in certain mysteries which perhaps you would rather not make public is it anything we need blush for said eve in alarm oh no a sin of his youth said corentin coldly setting one of his mouse-traps monsieur your father left an elder son oh the rascal cried courtois he was never very fond of you monsieur sechard and he kept that secret from you the deep old dog now i understand what he meant when he used to say to me you shall see what you shall see when i am under the turf do not be dismayed monsieur said corentin to sechard while he watched eve out of the corner of his eye a brother exclaimed the doctor then your inheritance is divided into two derville was affecting to examine the fine engravings proofs before letters which hung on the drawing-room walls do not be dismayed madame corentin went on seeing amazement written on madame sechard's handsome features it is only a natural son the rights of a natural son are not the same as those of a legitimate child this man is in the depths of poverty and he has a right to a certain sum calculated on the amount of the estate the millions left by your father at the word millions there was a perfectly unanimous cry from all the persons present and now derville ceased to study the prince old sechard millions said courtois who on earth told you that some peasant monsieur said cachan you are not attached to the treasury you may be told all the facts be quite easy said corentin i give you my word of honor that i am not employed by the treasury cachan who had just signed to everybody to say nothing gave expression to his satisfaction monsieur corentin went on if the whole estate were but a million a natural child's share would still be something considerable but we have not come to threaten a lawsuit on the contrary our purpose is to propose that you should hand over one hundred thousand francs and we will depart one hundred thousand francs cried cachan interrupting him but monsieur 
old sechard left twenty acres of vineyard five small farms ten acres of meadowland here and not a sou besides nothing on earth cried david sechard would induce me to tell a lie and less to a question of money than on any other monsieur he said turning to corentin and derville my father left us besides the land courtois and cachan signalled in vain to sechard he went on three hundred thousand francs which raises the whole estate to about five hundred thousand francs monsieur cachan asked eve sechard what proportion does the law allot to a natural child madame said corentin we are not turks we only require you to swear before these gentlemen that you did not inherit more than five hundred thousand francs from your father-in-law and we can come to an understanding first give me your word of honor that you really are a lawyer said cachan to derville here is my passport replied derville handing him a paper folded in four and monsieur is not as you might suppose an inspector from the treasury so be easy he added we had an important reason for wanting to know the truth as to the sechard estate and we now know it derville took madame sechard's hand and led her very courteously to the further end of the room madame said he in a low voice if it were not that the honor and future prospects of the house of grandlieu are implicated in this affair i would never have lent myself to the stratagem devised by this gentleman of the red ribbon but you must forgive him it was necessary to detect the falsehood by means of which your brother has stolen a march on the beliefs of that ancient family beware now of allowing it to be supposed that you have given your brother twelve hundred thousand francs to repurchase the rubempre estates twelve hundred thousand francs cried madame sechard turning pale where did he get them wretched boy ah that is the question replied derville i fear that the source of his wealth is far from pure the tears rose to eve's eyes as her neighbors could see we have perhaps done you a great service by saving you from abetting a falsehood of which the results may be positively dangerous the lawyer went on derville left madame sechard sitting pale and dejected with tears on her cheeks and bowed to the company to Mansle, said corentin to the little boy who drove the chaise there was but one vacant place in the diligence from bordeaux to paris derville begged corentin to allow him to take it urging a press of business but in his soul he was distrustful of his travelling companion whose diplomatic dexterity and coolness struck him as being the result of practice corentin remained three days longer at Mansle, unable to get away he was obliged to secure a place in the paris coach by writing to bordeaux and did not get back till nine days after leaving home peyrade meanwhile had called every morning either at passy or in paris to inquire whether corentin had returned on the eighth day he left at each house a note written in their peculiar cipher to explain to his friend what death hung over him and to tell him of lydie's abduction and the horrible end to which his enemies had devoted them peyrade bereft of corentin but seconded by contenson still kept up his disguise as a nabob even though his invisible foes had discovered him he very wisely reflected that he might glean some light on the matter by remaining on the field of the contest contenson had brought all his experience into play in his search for lydie and hoped to discover in what house she was hidden 
but as the days went by the impossibility absolutely demonstrated of tracing the slightest clue added hour by hour to peyrade's despair the old spy had a sort of guard about him of twelve or fifteen of the most experienced detectives they watched the neighborhood of the rue des moineaux and the rue taitbout where he lived as a nabob with madame du val noble during the last three days of the term granted by asie to reinstate lucien on his old footing in the hotel de grandlieu contenson never left the veteran of the old general police office and the poetic terror shed throughout the forests of america by the arts of inimical and warring tribes of which cooper made such good use in his novels was here associated with the petty details of paris life the foot passengers the shops the hackney cabs a figure standing at a window everything had to the human ciphers to whom old peyrade had entrusted his safety the thrilling interest which attaches in cooper's romances to a beaver village a rock a bison robe a floating canoe a weed straggling over the water if the spaniard has gone away you have nothing to fear said contenson to peyrade remarking on the perfect peace they lived in but if he is not gone observed peyrade he took one of my men at the back of the chaise but at blois Section thirty five of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter fifteen. Five days after Derville's return, Lucien one morning had a call from Rastignac i am in despair my dear boy said his visitor at finding myself compelled to deliver a message which is entrusted to me because we are known to be intimate your marriage is broken off beyond all hope of reconciliation never set foot again in the hotel de grandlieu to marry clotilde you must wait till her father dies and he is too selfish to die yet a while old whist players sit at table the card table very late clotilde is setting out for italy with madeleine de lenancourt chaulieu the poor girl is so madly in love with you my dear fellow that they have to keep an eye on her she was bent on coming to see you and had plotted an escape that may comfort you in misfortune lucien made no reply he sat gazing at rastignac and is it a misfortune after all his friend went on you will easily find a girl as well born and better looking than clotilde madame de serizy will find you a wife out of spite she cannot endure the grandlieus who never would have anything to say to her she has a niece little clemence de rouvre my dear boy said lucien at length since that supper i am not on terms with madame de serizy she saw me in esther's box and made a scene and i left her to herself a woman of forty does not long keep up a quarrel with so handsome a man as you are said rastignac i know something of these sunsets it lasts ten minutes in the sky and ten years in a woman's heart i have waited a week to hear from her go and call yes i must now are you coming at any rate to the val nobles her nabob is returning the supper given by nucingen i am asked and i shall go said lucien gravely the day after this confirmation of his disaster which carlos heard of at once from asie lucien went to the rue taitbout with rastignac and nucingen 
at midnight nearly all the personages of this drama were assembled in the dining-room that had formerly been esther's a drama of which the interest lay hidden under the very bed of these tumultuous lives and was known only to esther to lucien to peyrade to contenson the mulatto and to peccard who attended his mistress asie without its being known to contenson and peyrade had been asked by madame du val-noble to come and help her cook as they sat down to table peyrade who had given madame du val-noble five hundred francs that the thing might be well done found under his napkin a scrap of paper on which these words were written in pencil the ten days are up at the moment when you sit down to supper peyrade handed the paper to contenson who was standing behind him saying in english did you put my name here contenson read by the light of the wax candles this many tekel of harson and slipped the scrap into his pocket but he knew how difficult it is to verify a handwriting in pencil and above all a sentence written in roman capitals that is to say with mathematical lines since capital letters are wholly made up of straight lines and curves in which it is impossible to detect any trick of the hand as in what is called running hand the supper was absolutely devoid of spirit peyrade was visibly absent-minded of the men about town who give life to a supper only rastignac and lucien were present lucien was gloomy and absorbed in thought rastignac who had lost two thousand francs before supper ate and drank with the hope of recovering them later the three women stricken by this chill looked at each other dullness deprived the dishes of all relish suppers like plays and books have their good and bad luck at the end of the meal ices were served of the kind called plombières as everybody knows this kind of dessert has delicate preserved fruits laid on top of the ice which is served in a little glass not heaped above the rim these ices had been ordered by madame du val-noble of tortoni whose shop is at the corner of the rue taitbout and the boulevard the cook called contenson out of the room to pay the bill contenson who thought this demand on the part of the shop boy rather strange went downstairs and startled him by saying then you have not come from tortoni's and then went straight upstairs again Pacard had meanwhile handed the ices to the company in his absence the mulatto had hardly reached the door when one of the police constables who had kept watch in the rue des moineaux called up the stairs number twenty seven what's up replied contenson flying down again tell papa that his daughter has come home but good god in what a state tell him to come at once she is dying at the moment when contenson re-entered the dining-room old peyrade who had drunk a great deal was swallowing the cherry off his ice they were drinking to the health of madame du val-noble the nabob filled his glass with constantia and emptied it in spite of his distress at the news he had to give peyrade contenson was struck by the eager attention with which paccard was looking at the nabob his eyes sparkled like two fixed flames although it seemed important still this could not delay the mulatto who leaned over his master just as peyrade set his glass down lydie is at home said contenson in a very bad state peyrade rattled out the most french of all french oaths with such a strong southern accent that all the guests looked up in amazement peyrade discovering his blunder acknowledged his disguise by saying to contenson in good french find me a coach i'm off everyone rose 
why who are you said lucien ja who said the baron bichu you told me you shammed englishmen better than he could and i would not believe him said rastignac some bankrupt caught in disguise said du tillet loudly i suspected as much a strange place is paris said madame du val noble after being bankrupt in his own part of town a merchant shows up as a nabob or a dandy in the champs elysees with impunity oh i am unlucky bankrupts are my bane every flower has its peculiar blight said esther quietly mine is like cleopatra's an asp who am i echoed peyrade from the door you will know ere long for if i die i will rise from my grave to clutch your feet every night he looked at esther and lucien as he spoke then he took advantage of the general dismay to vanish with the utmost rapidity meaning to run home without waiting for the coach in the street the spy was gripped by the arm as he crossed the threshold of the outer gate it was asie wrapped in a black hood such as ladies then wore on leaving a ball send for the sacrament papa peyrade said she in the voice that had already prophesied ill a coach was waiting as he jumped in and the carriage vanished as though the wind had swept it away there were five carriages waiting peyrade's men could find out nothing on reaching his house in the rue des vignes one of the quietest and prettiest nooks of the little town of passy corentin who was known there as a retired merchant passionately devoted to gardening found his friend peyrade's note in cipher instead of resting he got into the hackney coach that had brought him thither and was driven to the rue des moineaux where he found only cat from her he heard of lydie's disappearance and remained astounded at peyrade's and his own want of foresight but they do not know me yet said he to himself this crew is capable of anything i must find out if they are killing peyrade for if so i must not be seen any more the viler a man's life is the more he clings to it it becomes at every moment a protest and a revenge corentin went back to the cab and drove to his rooms to assume the disguise of a feeble old man in a scanty greenish overcoat and a tow wig then he returned on foot prompted by his friendship for peyrade he intended to give instructions to his most devoted and cleverest underlings as he went along the rue saint honore to reach the rue saint roch from the place vendome he came up behind a girl in slippers and dressed as a woman dresses for the night she had on a white bed jacket and a nightcap and from time to time gave vent to a sob and an involuntary groan corentin outpaced her and turning round recognized lydie i am a friend of your father's of monsieur Conquel's, said he in his natural voice ah then here is some one i can trust said she do not seem to have recognized me corentin went on for we are pursued by relentless foes and are obliged to disguise ourselves but tell me what has befallen you oh monsieur said the poor child the facts but not the story can be told i am ruined lost and i do not know how where have you come from i don't know monsieur i fled with such precipitancy i have come through so many streets round so many turnings fancying i was being followed and when i met any one that seemed decent i asked my way to get back to the boulevards so as to find the rue de la paix and at last after walking what o'clock is it monsieur half past eleven said corentin i escaped at nightfall said lydie i have been walking for five hours 
well come along you can rest now you will find your good cut oh monsieur there is no rest for me i only want to rest in the grave and i will go and wait for death in a convent if i am worthy to be admitted poor little girl but you struggled oh yes oh if you could only imagine the abject creatures they placed me with they sent you to sleep no doubt ah that is it cried poor lydie a little more strengthened i should be at home i feel that i am dropping and my brain is not quite clear just now i fancied i was in a garden corentin took lydie in his arms and she lost consciousness he carried her upstairs cat he called cat came out with exclamations of joy don't be in too great a hurry to be glad said corentin gravely the girl is very ill when lydie was laid on her bed and recognized her own room by the light of two candles that cat lighted she became delirious she sang scraps of pretty airs broken by vociferations of horrible sentences she had heard her pretty face was mottled with purple patches she mixed up the reminiscences of her pure childhood with those of these ten days of infamy cat sat weeping corentin paced the room stopping now and again to gaze at lydie she is paying her father's debt said he is there a providence above oh i was wise not to have a family on my word of honour a child is indeed a hostage given to misfortune as some philosopher has said oh cried the poor child sitting up in bed and throwing back her fine long hair instead of lying here cat i ought to be stretched in the sand at the bottom of the seine cat instead of crying and looking at your child which will never cure her you ought to go for a doctor the medical officer in the first instance and then monsieur desplein and monsieur bianchon we must save this innocent creature and corentin wrote down the addresses of these two famous physicians at this moment up the stairs came some one to whom they were familiar and the door was opened peyrade in a violent sweat his face purple his eyes almost blood-stained and gasping like a dolphin rushed from the outer door to lydie's room exclaiming where is my child he saw a melancholy sign from corentin and his eyes followed his friend's hand lydie's condition can only be compared to that of a flower tenderly cherished by a gardener now fallen from its stem and crushed by the iron clamped shoes of some peasant ascribe this simile to a father's heart and you will understand the blow that fell on peyrade the tears started to his eyes you are crying it is my father said the girl she could still recognize her father she got out of bed and fell on her knees at the old man's side as he sank into a chair forgive me papa said she in a tone that pierced peyrade's heart and at the same moment he was conscious of what felt like a tremendous blow on his head i am dying the villains were his last words corentin tried to help his friend and received his latest breath dead poisoned said he to himself ah here is the doctor he exclaimed hearing the sound of wheels contenson who came with his mulatto disguise removed stood like a bronze statue as he heard lydie say then you do not forgive me father but it was not my fault she did not understand that her father was dead oh how he stares at me cried the poor crazy girl we must close his eyes said contenson lifting peyrade on to the bed 
we are doing a stupid thing said corentin let us carry him into his own room his daughter is half demented and she will go quite mad when she sees that he is dead she will fancy that she has killed him lydie seeing them carry away her father looked quite stupefied there lies my only friend said corentin seeming much moved when peyrade was laid out on the bed in his own room in all his life he never had but one impulse of cupidity and that was for his daughter let him be an example to you contenson every line of life has its code of honour peyrade did wrong when he mixed himself up with private concerns we have no business to meddle with any but public cases but come what may i swear said he with a voice an emphasis a look that struck horror into contenson to avenge my poor peyrade i will discover the men who are guilty of his death and of his daughter's ruin and as sure as i am myself as i have yet a few days to live which i will risk to accomplish that vengeance every man of them shall die at four o'clock in good health by a clean shave on the place de greve and i will help you said contenson with feeling nothing in fact is more heart-stirring than the spectacle of passion in a cold self-contained and methodical man in whom for twenty years no one has ever detected the smallest impulse of sentiment it is like a molten bar of iron which melts everything it touches and contenson was moved to his depths poor old Conquel, said he looking at corentin he has treated me many a time and i tell you only your bad sort know how to do such things but often has he given me ten francs to go and gamble with after this funeral oration peyrade's two avengers went back to lydie's room hearing cot and the medical officer from the mairie on the stairs go and fetch the chief of police said corentin the public prosecutor will not find grounds for a prosecution in the case still we will report it to the prefecture it may perhaps be of some use monsieur he went on to the medical officer in this room you will see a dead man i do not believe that he died from natural causes you will be good enough to make a post-mortem in the presence of the chief of the police who will come at my request try to discover some traces of poison you will in a few minutes have the opinion of monsieur desplein and monsieur bianchon for whom i have sent to examine the daughter of my best friend she is in a worse plight than he though he is dead i have no need of those gentlemen's assistance in the exercise of my duty said the medical officer well well thought corentin let us have no clashing monsieur he said in a few words i give you my opinion those who have just murdered the father have also ruined the daughter by daylight lydie had yielded to fatigue when the great surgeon and the young physician arrived she was asleep the doctor whose duty it was to sign the death certificate had now opened peyrade's body and was seeking the cause of death while waiting for your patient to awake said corentin to the two famous doctors would you join one of your professional brethren in an examination which cannot fail to interest you and your opinion will be valuable in case of an inquiry your relation died of apoplexy said the official there are all the symptoms of violent congestion of the brain examine him gentlemen and see if there is no poison capable of producing similar symptoms the stomach is in fact full of food substances but short of chemical analysis i find no evidence of poison if the characters of cerebral congestion are well ascertained we have here considering the patient's age a sufficient cause of death observed desplein looking at the enormous mass of material 
did he sup here asked bianchon no said corentin he came here in great haste from the boulevard and found his daughter ruined that was the poison if he loved his daughter said bianchon what known poison could produce a similar effect asked corentin clinging to his idea there is but one said desplein after a careful examination it is a poison found in the malayan archipelago and derived from trees as yet but little known of the strychnos family it is used to poison that dangerous weapon the malay kris at least so it is reported the police commissioner presently arrived corentin told him his suspicions and begged him to draw up a report telling him where and with whom peyrade had supped and the causes of the state in which he found lydie corentin then went to lydie's rooms desplein and bianchon had been examining the poor child he met them at the door well gentlemen asked corentin place the girl under medical care unless she recovers her wits when her child is born if indeed she should have a child she will end her days melancholy mad there is no hope of a cure but in the maternal instinct if it can be aroused corentin paid each of the physicians forty francs in gold and then turned to the police commissioner who had pulled him by the sleeve the medical officer insists on it that death was natural said this functionary and i can hardly report the case especially as the dead man was old Conquel. he had his finger in too many pies and we should not be sure whom we might run foul of men like that die to order very often and my name is corentin said corentin in the man's ear the commissioner started with surprise so just make a note of all this corentin went on it will be very useful by and by send it up only as confidential information the crime cannot be proved and i know that any inquiry would be checked at the very outset but i will catch the criminals some day yet i will watch them and take them red-handed the police official bowed to corentin and left monsieur said cat mademoiselle does nothing but dance and sing what can i do has any change occurred then she has understood that her father is just dead put her into a hackney coach and simply take her to charenton i will write a note to the commissioner-general of police to secure her being suitably provided for the daughter in charenton the father in a pauper's grave said corentin contenson go and fetch the parish hearse and now don carlos herrera you and i will fight it out carlos said contenson he is in spain he is in paris said corentin positively there's a touch of spanish genius of the philip the second type in all this section thirty six of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary what love costs an old man chapter sixteen five days after the nabob's disappearance madame du val noble was sitting by esther's bedside weeping for she felt herself on one of the slopes down to poverty if i only had at least a hundred louis a year with that sum my dear a woman can retire to some little town and find a husband i can get you as much as that said esther how cried madame du val noble oh in a very simple way listen 
you must plan to kill yourself play your part well send for asie and offer her ten thousand francs for two black beads of very thin glass containing a poison which kills you in a second bring them to me and i will give you fifty thousand francs for them why do you not ask her for them yourself said her friend as he would not sell them to me they are not for yourself asked madame du val noble perhaps you who live in the midst of pleasure and luxury in a house of your own and on the eve of an entertainment which will be the talk of paris for ten years which is to cost nucingen twenty thousand francs there are to be strawberries in mid-february they say asparagus grapes melons and a thousand crowns worth of flowers in the rooms what are you talking about there are a thousand crowns worth of roses on the stairs alone and your gown is said to have cost ten thousand francs yes it is of brussels point and delphine his wife is furious but i had a fancy to be disguised as a bride where are the ten thousand francs asked madame du val noble it is all the ready money i have said esther smiling open my table drawer it is under the curl papers people who talk of dying never kill themselves said madame du val noble if it were to commit a crime for shame said esther finishing her friend's thought as she hesitated be quite easy i have no intention of killing anybody i had a friend a very happy woman she is dead i must follow her that is all how foolish how can i help it i promised her i would i should let that bill go dishonoured said her friend smiling do as i tell you and go at once i hear a carriage coming it is nucingen a man who will go mad with joy yes he loves me why do we not love those who love us for indeed they do all they can to please us ah that is the question said madame du val noble it is the old story of the herring which is the most puzzling fish that swims why well no one could ever find out get along my dear i must ask for your fifty thousand francs good-bye then for three days past esther's ways with the baron de nucingen had completely changed the monkey had become a cat the cat had become a woman esther poured out treasures of affection on the old man she was quite charming her way of addressing him with a total absence of mischief or bitterness and all sorts of tender insinuation had carried conviction to the banker's slow wit she called him fritz and he believed that she loved him my poor fritz i have tried you sorely said she i have teased you shamefully your patience has been sublime you loved me i see and i will reward you i like you now i do not know how it is but i should prefer you to a young man it is the result of experience perhaps in the long run we discover at last that pleasure is the coin of the soul and it is not more flattering to be loved for the sake of pleasure than it is to be loved for the sake of money besides young men are too selfish they think more of themselves than of us while you now think only of me i am all your life to you and i will take nothing more from you i want to prove to you how disinterested i am why i have given you nothing cried the baron enchanted i propose to give you to-morrow thirty thousand francs a year in a government bond that is my wedding gift esther kissed the baron so sweetly that he turned pale without any pills oh cried she do not suppose that i am sweet to you only for your thirty thousand francs it is because now i love you my good fat frederic 
ach mein gott why have you kept me waiting i might have been so happy all these three months in three or in five per cents my pet said esther passing her fingers through nucingen's hair and arranging it in a fashion of her own in trees i had a quantity so next morning the baron brought the certificate of shares he came to breakfast with his dear little girl and to take her orders for the following evening the famous saturday the great day here my little wife my only wife said the banker gleefully his face radiant with happiness here is enough money to pay for your keep for the rest of your days esther took the paper without the slightest excitement folded it up and put it in her dressing-table drawer so now you are quite happy you monster of iniquity said she giving nucingen a little slap on the cheek now that i have at last accepted a present from you i can no longer tell you home truths for i share the fruit of what you call your labors this is not a gift my poor old boy it is restitution come do not put on your bourse face you know that i love you my lovely esther mine angel of love said the banker do not speak to me like that i tell you i should not care when all the world took me for a thief if you should think me an honest man i love you every day more and more that is my intention said esther and i will never again say anything to distress you my pet elephant for you are grown as artless as a baby bless me you old rascal you have never known any innocence the allowance bestowed on you when you came into the world was bound to come to the top some day but it was buried so deep that it is only now reappearing at the age of sixty-six fished up by love's barbed hook this phenomenon is seen in old men and this is why i have learned to love you you are young so young no one but i would ever have known this frederic i alone for you were a banker at fifteen even at college you must have lent your schoolfellows one marble on condition of their returning two seeing him laugh she sprang on to his knee well you must do as you please bless me plunder the men go ahead and i will help men are not worth loving napoleon killed them off like flies whether they pay taxes to you or to the government what difference does it make to them you don't make love over the budget and on my honor go ahead i have thought it over and you are right shear the sheep you will find it in the gospel according to beranger now kiss your esther i say you will give that poor val noble all the furniture in the rue Tebou? and to-morrow i wish you would give her fifty thousand francs it would look handsome my duck you see you killed fayex people are beginning to cry out upon you and this liberality will look babylonian all the women will talk about it oh there will be no one in paris so grand so noble as you and as the world is constituted fayex will be forgotten so after all it will be money deposited at interest you are right mein angel you know the world he replied you shall be mine adviser well you see said esther how i study my man's interest his position and honor go at once and bring those fifty thousand francs she wanted to get rid of m de nucingen so as to get a stockbroker to sell the bond that very afternoon but why this minute asked he bless me my sweetheart you must give it to her in a little satin box wrapped round a fan you must say here madame is a fan which i hope may be to your taste you are supposed to be a turcaret and you will become a beaujon charming charming cried the baron i shall be so clever henceforth yes i shall repeat your words 
just as esther had sat down tired with the effort of playing her part europe came in madame said she here is a messenger sent from the quai malaquais by celestin monsieur lucien's servant bring him in no i will go into the ante-room he has a letter for you madame from celestin esther rushed into the ante-room looked at the messenger and saw that he looked like the genuine thing tell him to come down said esther in a feeble voice and dropping into a chair after reading the letter lucien means to kill himself she added in a whisper to europe no take the letter up to him carlos herrera still in his disguise as a bagman came downstairs at once and keenly scrutinized the messenger on seeing a stranger in the ante-room you said there was no one here said he in a whisper to europe and with an excess of prudence after looking at the messenger he went straight into the drawing-room trompe la mort did not know that for some time past the famous constable of the detective force who had arrested him at the maison vauquer had a rival who it was supposed would replace him this rival was the messenger they are right said the sham messenger to contenson who was waiting for him in the street the man you describe is in the house but he is not a spaniard and i will burn my hand off if there is not a bird for our net under that priest's gown he is no more a priest than he is a spaniard said contenson i am sure of that said the detective oh if only we were right said contenson lucien had been away for two days and advantage had been taken of his absence to lay this snare but he returned this evening and the courtesan's anxieties were allayed next morning at the hour when esther having taken a bath was getting into bed again madame du val noble arrived i have the two pills said her friend let me see said esther raising herself with her pretty elbow buried in a pillow trimmed with lace madame du val noble held out to her what looked like two black currants the baron had given esther a pair of greyhounds of famous pedigree which will always be known by the name of the great contemporary poet who made them fashionable and esther proud of owning them had called them by the names of their parents romeo and juliet no need here to describe the whiteness and grace of these beasts trained for the drawing-room with manners suggestive of english propriety esther called romeo romeo ran up on legs so supple and thin so strong and sinewy that they seemed like steel springs and looked up at his mistress esther to attract his attention pretended to throw one of the pills he is doomed by his nature to die thus said she as she threw the pill which romeo crushed between his teeth the dog made no sound he rolled over and was stark dead it was all over while esther spoke these words of epitaph good god shrieked madame du val noble you have a cab waiting carry away the departed romeo said esther his death would make a commotion here i have given him to you and you have lost him advertise for him make haste you will have your fifty thousand francs this evening she spoke so calmly so entirely with the cold indifference of a courtesan that madame du val noble exclaimed you are the queen of us all come early and look very well at five o'clock esther dressed herself as a bride she put on her lace dress over white satin 
she had a white sash white satin shoes and a scarf of english point lace over her beautiful shoulders in her hair she placed white camellia flowers the simple ornament of an innocent girl on her bosom lay a pearl necklace worth thirty thousand francs a gift from nucingen though she was dressed by six she refused to see anybody even the banker Europe knew that lucien was to be admitted to her room lucien came at about seven and Europe managed to get him up to her mistress without anybody knowing of his arrival lucien as he looked at her said to himself why not go and live with her at rue bompre far from the world and never see paris again i have an earnest of five years of her life and the dear creature is one of those who never belie themselves where can i find such another perfect masterpiece my dear you whom i have made my god said esther kneeling down on a cushion in front of lucien give me your blessing lucien tried to raise her and kiss her saying what is this jest my dear love and he would have put his arm round her but she freed herself with a gesture as much of respect as of horror i am no longer worthy of you lucien said she letting the tears rise to her eyes i implore you give me your blessing and swear to me that you will found two beds at the hotel dieu for as to prayers in church god will never forgive me unless i pray myself i have loved you too well my dear tell me that i made you happy and that you will sometimes think of me tell me that lucien saw that esther was solemnly in earnest and he sat thinking you mean to kill yourself said he at last in a tone of voice that revealed deep reflection no said she but to-day my dear the woman dies the pure chaste and loving woman who once was yours and i am very much afraid that i shall die of grief poor child said lucien wait i have worked hard these two days i have succeeded in seeing clotilde always clotilde cried esther in a tone of concentrated rage yes said he we have written to each other on tuesday morning she is to set out for italy but i shall meet her on the road for an interview at fontainebleau bless me what is it that you men want for wives wooden laughs cried poor esther if i had seven or eight millions would you not marry me come now child i was going to say that if all is over for me i will have no wife but you esther bent her head to hide her sudden pallor and the tears she wiped away you love me said she looking at lucien with the deepest melancholy well that is my sufficient blessing do not compromise yourself go away by the side door and come into the drawing-room through the ante-room kiss me on the forehead she threw her arms round lucien clasped him to her heart with frenzy and said again go only go or i must live when the doomed woman appeared in the drawing-room there was a cry of admiration esther's eyes expressed infinitude in which the soul sank as it looked into them her blue-black and beautiful hair set off the camellias in short this exquisite creature achieved all the effects she had intended she had no rival she looked like the supreme expression of that unbridled luxury which surrounded her in every form then she was brilliantly witty she ruled the orgy with the cold calm power that habeneck displays when conducting at the conservatoire at those concerts where the first musicians in europe rise to the sublime in interpreting mozart and beethoven but she observed with terror 
that Nussingen ate little, drank nothing, and was quite the master of the house. By midnight everybody was crazy. The glasses were broken that they might never be used again. Two of the Chinese curtains were torn. Bichu was drunk for the second time in his life. No one could keep his feet. The women were asleep on the sofas, and the guests were incapable of carrying out the practical joke they had planned, of escorting Esther and Nussingen to the bedroom, standing in two lines with candles in their hands, and singing Buona Sera from the Barber of Seville. Nussingen simply gave Esther his hand. Bichu, who saw them, though tipsy, was still able to say, like Rivarol on the occasion of the Duc de Richelieu's last marriage, The police must be warned, there is mischief brewing here. Section 37 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. What Love Costs an Old Man. Chapter 17. Monsieur de Nucingen did not go home till Monday at about noon. But at one o'clock his broker informed him that Mademoiselle Esther van Bogseck had sold the bond bearing thirty thousand francs interest on friday last and had just received the money but monsieur le baron derville's head clerk called on me just as i was settling this transfer and after seeing mademoiselle esther's real names he told me she had come into a fortune of seven millions pooh yes she is the only heir to the old bill discounter gobseck derville will verify the facts if your mistress's mother was the handsome dutch woman la belle hollandaise as they called her she comes in for i know that she is cried the banker she told me all her life i shall write ein wort to derville the baron sat down at his desk wrote a line to derville and sent it by one of his servants then after going to the bourse he went back to esther's house at about three o'clock madame forbade our waking her on any pretence whatever she is in bed asleep ach der teufel said the baron but europe she shall not be angry to be told that she is very very rich she shall inherit seven millions old gobseck is dead and your missus is his sole heir for her mother was gobseck's own niece and besides he shall have left the ville i could never have thought that a millionaire like that man should have left esther in misery aha then your reign is over old pantaloon said Europe looking at the baron with an effrontery worthy of one of moliere's waiting-maids shoo you old alsatian crow she loves you as we love the plague heavens above us millions why she may marry her lover won't she be glad and prudence servien left the baron simply thunder-stricken to be the first to announce to her mistress this great stroke of luck the old man intoxicated with superhuman enjoyment and believing himself happy had just received a cold shower-bath on his passion at the moment when it had risen to the intensest white heat she was deceiving me cried he with tears in his eyes yes she was cheating me oh esther my life as a fool i have been can such flowers ever bloom for the old men i can buy all that i will except only youth ach gott ach gott what shall i do what shall become of me she is right that cruel europe esther if she is rich shall not be for me shall i go hank myself what is life made out the divine flame of joy that i have known 
mein gott mein gott the old man snatched off the false hair he had combed in with his gray hairs these three months past a piercing shriek from europe made nucingen quail to his very bowels the poor banker rose and walked upstairs on legs that were drunk with the bowl of disenchantment he had just swallowed to the dregs for nothing is more intoxicating than the wine of disaster at the door of her room he could see esther stiff on her bed blue with poison dead he went up to the bed and dropped on his knees you are right she told me so she is dead of me paccard asie every one hurried in it was a spectacle a shock but not despair every one had their doubts the baron was a banker again a suspicion crossed his mind and he was so imprudent as to ask what had become of the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs the price of the bond paccard asie and europe looked at each other so strangely that m de nucingen left the house at once believing that robbery and murder had been committed europe detecting a packet of soft consistency betraying the contents to be banknotes under her mistress's pillow proceeded at once to lay her out as she said go and tell monsieur asie oh to die before she knew that she had seven millions gobseck was poor madame's uncle said she europe's stratagem was understood by paccard as soon as asie's back was turned europe opened the packet on which the hapless courtesan had written to be delivered to monsieur lucien de rubempre seven hundred and fifty thousand franc notes shone in the eyes of prudence servien who exclaimed won't we be happy and honest for the rest of our lives paccard made no objection his instincts as a thief were stronger than his attachment to trompe la mort de rue is dead he said at length my shoulder is still a proof before letters let us be off together divide the money so as not to have all our eggs in one basket and then get married but where can we hide said prudence in paris replied paccard prudence and paccard went off at once with the promptitude of two honest folks transformed into robbers my child said carlos to asie as soon as she had said three words find some letter of esther's while i write a formal will and then take the copy and the letter to girard but he must be quick the will must be under esther's pillow before the lawyers affix the seals here and he wrote out the following will never having loved any one on earth but monsieur lucien chardon de rubempre and being resolved to end my life rather than relapse into vice and the life of infamy from which he rescued me i give and bequeath to the said lucien chardon de rubempre all i may possess at the time of my decease on condition of his founding a mass in perpetuity in the parish church of saint roch for the repose of her who gave him her all to her last thought esther gobseck that is quite in her style thought trompe la mort by seven in the evening this document written and sealed was placed by asie under esther's bolster jacques said she flying upstairs again just as i came out of the room justice marched in the justice of the peace you mean no my son the justice of the peace was there but he had gendarmes with him the public prosecutor and the examining judge are there too and the doors are guarded this death has made a stir very quickly remarked jacques collin i and paccard and europe have vanished i am afraid they may have scared away the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs said asie the low villains said collin 
they have done for us by their swindling game human justice and paris justice that is to say the most suspicious keenest cleverest and omniscient type of justice too clever indeed for it insists on interpreting the law at every turn was at last on the point of laying its hands on the agents of this horrible intrigue the baron of nucingen on recognizing the evidence of poison and failing to find his seven hundred and fifty thousand francs imagined that one of two persons whom he greatly disliked either paccard or europe was guilty of the crime in his first impulse of rage he flew to the prefecture of police this was a stroke of a bell that called up all corentin's men the officials of the prefecture the legal profession the chief of the police the justice of the peace the examining judge all were astir by nine in the evening three medical men were called in to perform an autopsy on poor esther and inquiries were set on foot trompe la mort warned by asie exclaimed no one knows that i am here i may take an airing he pulled himself up by the skylight of his garret and with marvellous agility was standing in an instant on the roof whence he surveyed the surroundings with the coolness of a tiler good said he discerning a garden five houses off in the rue de provence that will just do for me you are paid out trompe la mort said contenson suddenly emerging from behind a stack of chimneys you may explain to monsieur camusot what mass you were performing on the roof monsieur l'abbe and above all why you were escaping i have enemies in spain said carlos herrera we can go there by way of your attic said contenson the sham spaniard pretended to yield but having set his back and feet across the opening of the skylight he gripped contenson and flung him off with such violence that the spy fell in the gutter of the rue saint georges contenson was dead on his field of honor jacques collin quietly dropped into the room again and went to bed give me something that will make me very sick without killing me said he to asie for i must be at death's door to avoid answering inquisitive persons i have just got rid of a man in the most natural way who might have unmasked me at seven o'clock on the previous evening lucien had set out in his own chaise to post to fontainebleau with a passport he had procured in the morning he slept in the nearest inn on the nemours side at six in the morning he went alone and on foot through the forest as far as bouron this said he to himself as he sat down on one of the rocks that command the fine landscape of bouron is the fatal spot where napoleon dreamed of making a final tremendous effort on the eve of his abdication at daybreak he heard the approach of post-horses and saw a britzka drive past in which sat the servants of the duchesse de lenancourt chaulieu and clotilde de grandlieu's maid here they are thought lucien now to play the farce well and i shall be saved the duc de grandlieu's son-in-law in spite of him it was an hour later when he heard the peculiar sound made by a superior travelling carriage as the berline came near in which two ladies were sitting they had given orders that the drag should be put on for the hill down to bouron and the manservant behind the carriage had it stopped at this instant lucien came forward clotilde said he tapping on the window no said the young duchess to her friend he shall not get into the carriage and we will not be alone with him my dear speak to him for the last time to that i consent but on the road where we will walk on and where baptiste can escort us the morning is fine we are well wrapped up and have no fear of the cold 
the carriage can follow the two women got out baptiste said the duchess the postboy can follow slowly we want to walk a little way you must keep near us madeleine de morsauf took clotilde by the arm and allowed lucien to talk they thus walked as far as the village of gray it was now eight o'clock and there clotilde dismissed lucien well my friend said she closing this long interview with much dignity i shall never marry any one but you i would rather believe in you than in other men in my father and mother no woman ever gave greater proof of attachment surely now try to counteract the fatal prejudices which militate against you just then the tramp of galloping horses was heard and to the great amazement of the ladies a force of gendarmes surrounded the little party what do you want said lucien with the arrogance of a dandy are you monsieur lucien de rubempre asked the public prosecutor of fontainebleau yes monsieur you will spend to-night in la force said he i have a warrant for the detention of your person who are these ladies asked the sergeant to be sure excuse me ladies your passports for monsieur lucien as i am instructed had acquaintances among the fair sex who for him would do you take the duchesse de lenoncourt chaulieu for a prostitute said madeleine with a magnificent flash at the public prosecutor you are handsome enough to excuse the error the magistrate very cleverly retorted baptiste produce the passports said the young duchess with a smile and with what crime is monsieur de rubempre charged asked clotilde whom the duchess wished to see safe in the carriage of being accessory to a robbery and murder replied the sergeant of gendarmes baptiste lifted mademoiselle de grandlieu into the chaise in a dead faint by midnight lucien was entering la force a prison situated between the rue payenne and the rue des ballets where he was placed in solitary confinement Section thirty eight of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter one. At six o'clock next morning, two vehicles with postilions, prison vans, called in the vigorous language of the populace, panier à salade came out of la force to drive to the conciergerie by the palais de justice few loafers in paris can have failed to meet this prison cell on wheels still though most stories are written for parisian readers strangers will no doubt be satisfied to have a description of this formidable machine who knows a police of russia germany or austria the legal body of countries to whom the salad basket is an unknown machine may profit by it and in several foreign countries there can be no doubt that an imitation of this vehicle would be a boon to prisoners this ignominious conveyance yellow-bodied on high wheels and lined with sheet iron is divided into two compartments in front is a box seat with leather cushions and an apron this is the free seat of the van and accommodates a sheriff's officer and a gendarme a strong iron trellis reaching to the top separates this sort of cab front from the back division in which there are two wooden seats placed sideways as in an omnibus on which the prisoners sit they get in by a step behind and a door with no window the nickname of salad basket arose from the fact that the vehicle was originally made entirely of lattice and the prisoners were shaken in it just as a salad is shaken to dry it for further security in case of accident 
a mounted gendarme follows the machine especially when it conveys criminals condemned to death to the place of execution thus escape is impossible the vehicle lined with sheet iron is impervious to any tool the prisoners carefully searched when they are arrested or locked up can have nothing but watch springs perhaps to file through bars and useless on a smooth surface so the panier a salade improved by the genius of the paris police became the model for the prison omnibus known in london as black maria in which convicts are transported to the hulks instead of the horrible tumbrel which formerly disgraced civilization though manon lescaut had made it famous the accused are in the first instance dispatched in the prison van from the various prisons in paris to the palais de justice to be questioned by the examining judge this in prison slang is going up for examination then the accused are again conveyed from prison to the court to be sentenced when their case is only a misdemeanor or if in legal parlance the case is one for the upper court they are transferred from the house of detention to the conciergerie the new gate of the department of the seine finally the prison van carries the criminal condemned to death from bicetre to the barriere saint jacques where executions are carried out and have been ever since the revolution of july thanks to philanthropic interference the poor wretches no longer have to face the horrors of the drive from the conciergerie to the place de greve in a cart exactly like that used by wood merchants this cart is no longer used but to bring the body back from the scaffold without this explanation the words of a famous convict to his accomplice it is now the horse's business as he got into the van would be unintelligible it is impossible to be carried to execution more comfortably than in paris nowadays at this moment the two vans setting out at such an early hour were employed on the unwonted service of conveying two accused prisoners from the jail of la force to the conciergerie and each man had a salad basket to himself nine-tenths of my readers ay and nine-tenths of the remaining tenth are certainly ignorant of the vast difference of meaning in the words incriminated suspected accused and committed for trial jail house of detention and penitentiary and they may be surprised to learn here that it involves all our criminal procedure of which a clear and brief outline will presently be sketched as much for their information as for the elucidation of this history however when it is said that the first fan contained jacques collin and the second lucien who in a few hours had fallen from the summit of social splendor to the depths of a prison cell curiosity will for the moment be satisfied the conduct of the two accomplices was characteristic lucien de rubempre shrank back to avoid the gaze of the passers-by who looked at the grated window of the gloomy and fateful vehicle on its road along the rue saint antoine and the rue du martois to reach the quay and the arch of saint jean the way at that time across the place de l'hôtel de ville this archway now forms the entrance gate to the residence of the prefet de la seine in the huge municipal palace the daring convict on the contrary stuck his face against the barred grating between the officer and the gendarme who sure of their van were chatting together the great days of july eighteen thirty and the tremendous storm that then burst have so completely wiped out the memory of all previous events and politics so entirely absorbed the french during the last six months of that year that no one remembers or a few scarcely remember the various private judicial and financial catastrophes strange as they were which forming the annual flood of parisian curiosity were not lacking during the first six months of the year 
it is therefore needful to mention how paris was for the moment excited by the news of the arrest of a spanish priest discovered in a courtesan's house and that of the elegant lucien de rubempre who had been engaged to mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu taken on the high road to italy close to the little village of gray both were charged as being concerned in a murder of which the profits were stated at seven millions of francs and for some days the scandal of this trial preponderated over the absorbing importance of the last elections held under charles the tenth in the first place the charge had been based on an application by the baron de nucingen then lucien's apprehension just as he was about to be appointed private secretary to the prime minister made a stir in the very highest circles of society in every drawing-room in paris more than one young man could recollect having envied lucien when he was honoured by the notice of the beautiful duchesse de montfrigneuse and every woman knew that he was the favoured attache of madame de serizy the wife of one of the government bigwigs and finally his handsome person gave him a singular notoriety in the various worlds that make up paris the world of fashion the financial world the world of courtesans the young men's world the literary world so for two days past all paris had been talking of these two arrests the examining judge in whose hands the case was put regarded it as a chance for promotion and to proceed with the utmost rapidity he had given orders that both the accused should be transferred from la force to the conciergerie as soon as lucien de rubempre could be brought from fontainebleau as the abbe carlos had spent but twelve hours in la force and lucien only half a night it is useless to describe that prison which has since been entirely remodelled and as to the details of their consignment it would be only a repetition of the same story at the conciergerie but before setting forth the terrible drama of a criminal inquiry it is indispensable as i have said that an account should be given of the ordinary proceedings in a case of this kind to begin with its various phases will be better understood at home and abroad and besides those who are ignorant of the action of the criminal law as conceived of by the lawgivers under napoleon will appreciate it better this is all the more important as at this moment this great and noble institution is in danger of destruction by the system known as penitentiary a crime is committed if it is flagrant the persons incriminated inculpe are taken to the nearest lock-up and placed in the cell known to the vulgar as the violon perhaps because they make a noise there shrieking or crying from thence the suspected persons inculpe are taken before the police commissioner or magistrate who holds a preliminary inquiry and can dismiss the case if there is any mistake finally they are conveyed to the depot of the prefecture where the police detains them pending the convenience of the public prosecutor and the examining judge they being served with due notice more or less quickly according to the gravity of the case come and examine the prisoners who are still provisionally detained having due regard to the presumptive evidence the examining judge then issues a warrant for their imprisonment and sends the suspected persons to be confined in a jail there are three such jails maison d'arrêt in paris sainte pelagie la force and les madelonnettes observe the word inculpé incriminated or suspected of crime the french code has created three essential degrees of criminality inculpé first degree of suspicion prévenu under examination accusé fully committed for trial so long as the warrant for committal remains unsigned the supposed criminal is regarded as merely under suspicion 
inculpe of the crime or felony when the warrant has been issued he becomes the accused prevenu and is regarded as such so long as the inquiry is proceeding when the inquiry is closed and as soon as the court has decided that the accused is to be committed for trial he becomes the prisoner at the bar accusé as soon as the superior court at the instance of the public prosecutor has pronounced that the charge is so far proved as to be carried to the assizes thus persons suspected of crime go through three different stages three siftings before coming up for trial before the judges of the upper court the high justice of the realm at the first stage innocent persons have abundant means of exculpating themselves the public the town watch the police at the second state they appear before a magistrate face to face with the witnesses and are judged by a tribunal in paris or by the collective court of the departments at the third stage they are brought before a bench of twelve councillors and in case of any error or informality the prisoner committed for trial at the assizes may appeal for protection to the supreme court the jury do not know what a slap in the face they give to popular authority to administrative and judicial functionaries when they acquit a prisoner and so in my opinion it is hardly possible that an innocent man should ever find himself at the bar of an assize court in paris i say nothing of other seats of justice the detenu is the convict french criminal law recognizes imprisonment of three degrees corresponding in legal distinction to these three degrees of suspicion inquiry and conviction mere imprisonment is a light penalty for misdemeanor but detention is imprisonment with hard labor a severe and sometimes degrading punishment hence those persons who nowadays are in favor of the penitentiary system would upset an admirable scheme of criminal law in which the penalties are judiciously graduated and they will end by punishing the lightest peccadilloes as severely as the greatest crimes the reader may compare in the scenes of political life for instance in une ténébreuse affaire the curious differences subsisting between the criminal law of brumaire in the year four and that of the code napoleon which has taken its place in most trials as in this one the suspected persons are at once examined and from inculpe become prévenu justice immediately issues a warrant for their arrest and imprisonment in point of fact in most of such cases the criminals have either fled or have been instantly apprehended indeed as we have seen the police which is but an instrument and the officers of justice had descended on esther's house with the swiftness of a thunderbolt even if there had not been the reasons for revenge suggested to the superior police by corentin there was a robbery section thirty nine of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the end of evil ways chapter two just as the first prison van conveying jacques collin reached the archway of saint jean a narrow dark passage some block ahead compelled the postilion to stop under the vault the prisoner's eyes shone like carbuncles through the grating in spite of his aspect as of a dying man which the day before had led the governor of la force to believe that the doctor must be called in these flaming eyes free to rove at this moment for neither the officer nor the gendarme looked round at their customer spoke so plain a language that a clever examining judge m popinot for instance 
would have identified the man convicted for sacrilege in fact ever since the salad basket had turned out of the gate of la force jacques collin had studied everything on his way notwithstanding the pace they had made he took in the houses with an eager and comprehensive glance from the ground floor to the attics he saw and noted every passer-by god himself is not more clear-seeing as to the means and ends of his creatures than this man in observing the slightest differences in the medley of things and people armed with hope as the last of the horatii was armed with his sword he expected help to anybody but this machiavelli of the hulks this hope would have seemed so absolutely impossible to realize that he would have gone on mechanically as all guilty men do not one of them ever dreams of resistance when he finds himself in the position to which justice and the paris police bring suspected persons especially those who like collin and lucien are in solitary confinement it is impossible to conceive of the sudden isolation in which a suspected criminal is placed the gendarmes who apprehend him the commissioner who questions him those who take him to prison the warders who lead him to his cell which is actually called a cachot a dungeon or hiding-place those again who take him by the arms to put him into a prison van every being that comes near him from the moment of his arrest is either speechless or takes note of all he says to be repeated to the police or to the judge this total severance so simply affected between the prisoner and the world gives rise to a complete overthrow of his faculties and a terrible prostration of mind especially when the man has not been familiarized by his antecedents with the processes of justice the duel between the judge and the criminal is all the more appalling because justice has on its side the dumbness of blank walls and the incorruptible coldness of its agents but jacques collin or carlos herrera it will be necessary to speak of him by one or the other of these names according to the circumstances of the case had long been familiar with the methods of the police of the jail and of justice this colossus of cunning and corruption had employed all his powers of mind and all the resources of mimicry to affect the surprise and anility of an innocent man while giving the lawyers the spectacle of his sufferings as has been told asie that skilled locusta had given him a dose of poison so qualified as to produce the effects of a dreadful illness thus m camusot the police commissioner and the public prosecutor had been baffled in their proceedings and inquiries by the effects apparently of an apoplectic attack he has taken poison cried m camusot horrified by the sufferings of the self-styled priest when he had been carried down from the attic writhing in convulsions four constables had with great difficulty brought the abbe carlos downstairs to esther's room where the lawyers and the gendarmes were assembled that was the best thing he could do if he should be guilty replied the public prosecutor do you believe that he is ill the police commissioner asked the police is always incredulous the three lawyers had spoken as may be imagined in a whisper but jacques collin had guessed from their faces the subject under discussion and had taken advantage of it to make the first brief examination which is gone through on arrest absolutely impossible and useless he had stammered out sentences in which spanish and french were so mingled as to make nonsense at la force this farce had been all the more successful in the first instance because the head of the safety force an abbreviation of the title head of the brigade of the guardians of public safety bibi lupin who had long since taken jacques collin into custody at madame vauquer's boarding-house 
had been sent on special business into the country and his deputy was a man who hoped to succeed him but to whom the convict was unknown bibi lupin himself formerly a convict and a comrade of jacques collin's on the hulks was his personal enemy this hostility had its rise in quarrels in which jacques collin had always got the upper hand and in the supremacy over his fellow prisoners which trompe la mort had always assumed and then for ten years now jacques collin had been the ruling providence of released convicts in paris their head their adviser and their banker and consequently bibi lupin's antagonist thus though placed in solitary confinement he trusted to the intelligent and unreserved devotion of asie his right hand and perhaps too to paccard his left hand who as he flattered himself might return to his allegiance when once that thrifty subaltern had safely bestowed the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs that he had stolen this was the reason why his attention had been so superhumanly alert all along the road and strange to say his hopes were about to be amply fulfilled the two solid side walls of the archway were covered to a height of six feet with a permanent dado of mud formed of the splashes from the gutter for in those days the foot passenger had no protection from the constant traffic of vehicles and from what was called the kicking of the carts but curbstones placed upright at intervals and much ground away by the knaves of the wheels more than once a heavy truck had crushed a heedless foot passenger under that archway such indeed paris remained in many districts and till long after this circumstance may give some idea of the narrowness of the saint jean gate and the ease with which it could be blocked if a cab should be coming through from the place de greve while a costermonger woman was pushing her little truck of apples in from the rue de martois a third vehicle of any kind produced difficulties the foot passengers fled in alarm seeking a cornerstone to protect them from the old-fashioned axles which had attained such prominence that a law was passed at last to reduce their length when the prison van came in this passage was blocked by a market woman with a costermonger's vegetable cart one of a type which is all the more strange because specimens still exist in paris in spite of the increasing number of greengrocers shops she was so thoroughly a street hawker that a sergent de ville if that particular class of police had been then in existence would have allowed her to ply her trade without inspecting her permit in spite of a sinister countenance that reeked of crime her head wrapped in a cheap and ragged checked cotton kerchief was horrid with rebellious locks of hair like the bristles of a wild boar her red and wrinkled neck was disgusting and her little shawl failed entirely to conceal a chest tanned brown by the sun dust and mud her gown was patchwork her shoes gaped as though they were grinning at a face as full of holes as the gown and what an apron a plaster would have been less filthy this moving and fetid rag must have stunk in the nostrils of dainty folks ten yards away those hands had gleaned a hundred harvest fields either the woman had returned from a german witch's sabbath or she had come out of a mendicity asylum but what eyes what audacious intelligence what repressed vitality when the magnetic flash of her look and of jacques collin's met to exchange a thought get out of the way you old vermin trap cried the postilion in harsh tones mind you don't crush me you hangman's apprentice she retorted your cartful is not worth as much as mine 
and by trying to squeeze in between two cornerstones to make way the hawker managed to block the passage long enough to achieve her purpose oh asie said jacques collin to himself at once recognizing his accomplice then all is well the postboy was still exchanging amenities with asie and vehicles were collecting in the rue du martois look out there pecaré fermati suni la vedrem shrieked old asie with the red indian intonations peculiar to these female costermongers who disfigure their words in such a way that they are transformed into a sort of onomatopoeia incomprehensible to any but parisians in the confusion in the alley and among the outcries of all the waiting drivers no one paid any heed to this wild yell which might have been the woman's usual cry but this gibberish intelligible to jacques collin sent to his ear in a mongrel language of their own a mixture of bad italian and provencal this important news your poor boy is nabbed i am here to keep an eye on you we shall meet again in the midst of his joy at having thus triumphed over the police for he hoped to be able to keep up communications jacques collin had a blow which might have killed any other man lucien in custody said he to himself he almost fainted this news was to him more terrible than the rejection of his appeal could have been if he had been condemned to death now that both the prison vans are rolling along the quay the interest of this story requires that i should add a few words about the conciergerie while they are making their way thither the conciergerie a historical name a terrible name a still more terrible thing is inseparable from the revolutions of france and especially those of paris it has known most of our great criminals but if it is the most interesting of the buildings of paris it is also the least known least known to persons of the upper classes still in spite of the interest of this historical digression it should be as short as the journey of the prison vans what parisian what foreigner or what provincial can have failed to observe the gloomy and mysterious features of the quai des lunettes a structure of black walls flanked by three round towers with conical roofs two of them almost touching each other this quay beginning at the pont du change ends at the pont neuf a square tower the clock tower or tour de l'horloge whence the signal was given for the massacre of st bartholomew a tower almost as tall as that of saint jacques de la boucherie shows where the palais de justice stands and forms the corner of the quay these four towers and these walls are shrouded in the black winding-sheet which in paris falls on every facade to the north about halfway along the quay at a gloomy archway we see the beginning of the private houses which were built in consequence of the construction of the pont neuf in the reign of henry the fourth the place royale was a replica of the place dauphine the style of architecture is the same of brick with binding courses of hewn stone this archway and the rue de Harlay are the limit line of the palais de justice on the west formerly the prefecture de police once the residence of the presidents of parlement was a dependency of the palace the court of exchequer and court of subsidies completed the supreme court of justice the sovereign's court it will be seen that before the revolution the palace enjoyed that isolation which now again is aimed at this block this island of residences and official buildings in their midst the sainte chapelle that priceless jewel of saint louis chaplet is the sanctuary of paris its holy place its sacred ark for one thing this island was at first the whole of the city 
for the plot now forming the place dauphine was a meadow attached to the royal domain where stood a stamping mill for coining money hence the name of rue de la monnaie the street heading to the pont neuf hence too the name of one of the round towers the middle one called the tour d'argent which would seem to show that money was originally coined there the famous mill to be seen marked in old maps of paris may very likely be more recent than the time when money was coined in the palace itself and was erected no doubt for the practice of improved methods in the art of coining the first tower hardly detached from the tour d'argent is the tour de montgomery the third and smallest but the best preserved of the three for it still has its battlements is the tour bonbec the sainte chapelle and its four towers counting the clock tower as one clearly define the precincts or as a surveyor would say the perimeter of the palace as it was from the time of the merovingians till the accession of the first race of valois but to us as a result of certain alterations this palace is more especially representative of the period of st louis charles v was the first to give the palace up to the parlement then a new institution and went to reside in the famous hotel st paul under the protection of the bastille the palais de tournelle was subsequently erected backing on to the hotel st paul thus under the later valois the kings came back from the bastille to the louvre which had been their first stronghold the original residence of the french kings the palace of st louis which has preserved the designation of le palais to indicate the palace of palaces is entirely buried under the palais de justice it forms the cellars for it was built like the cathedral in the seine and with such care that the highest floods in the river scarcely cover the lowest steps the quai de l'horloge covers twenty feet below the surface its foundations of a thousand years old carriages run on the level of the capitals of the solid columns under these towers and formerly their appearance must have harmonized with the elegance of the palace and have had a picturesque effect over the water since to this day those towers vie in height with the loftiest buildings in paris as we look down on this vast capital from the lantern of the pantheon the palace with the sainte chapelle is still the most monumental of many monumental buildings the home of our kings over which you tread as you pace the immense hall known as the salle des pas perdus was a miracle of architecture and it is so still to the intelligent eye of the poet who happens to study it when inspecting the conciergerie alas for the conciergerie has invaded the home of kings one's heart bleeds to see the way in which cells cupboards corridors warders rooms and halls devoid of light or air have been hewn out of that beautiful structure in which byzantine gothic and romanesque the three phases of ancient art were harmonized in one building by the architecture of the twelfth century this palace is a monumental history of france in the earliest times just as blois is that of a later period as at blois you may admire in a single courtyard the chateau of the counts of blois that of louis the twelfth that of francis i that of gaston so at the conciergerie you will find within the same precincts the stamp of the early races and in the sainte chapelle the architecture of st louis municipal council to you i speak if you bestow millions get a poet or two to assist your architects if you wish to save the cradle of paris the cradle of kings while endeavouring to endow paris and the supreme court with a palace worthy of france it is a matter for study for some years before beginning the work another new prison or two like that of la roquette and the palace of st louis will be safe 
in these days many grievances afflict this vast mass of buildings buried under the palais de justice and the quay like some antediluvian creature in the soil of montmartre but the worst affliction is that it is the conciergerie this epigram is intelligible in the early days of the monarchy noble criminals for the villeins a word signifying the peasantry in french and english alike and the citizens came under the jurisdiction of the municipality or of their liege lord the lords of the greater or the lesser fiefs were brought before the king and guarded in the conciergerie and as these noble criminals were few the conciergerie was large enough for the king's prisoners it is difficult now to be quite certain of the exact site of the original conciergerie however the kitchens built by st louis still exist forming what is now called the mouse trap and it is probable that the original conciergerie was situated in the place where till eighteen twenty five the conciergerie prisons of the parlement were still in use under the archway to the right of the wide outside steps leading to the supreme court from thence until eighteen twenty five condemned criminals were taken to execution from that gate came forth all the great criminals all the victims of political feeling the marechal d'ancre and the queen of france semblance and malzerbe damiens and danton desrues and castin fouquier tinville's private room like that of the public prosecutor now was so placed that he could see the procession of carts containing the persons whom the revolutionary tribunal had sentenced to death thus this man who had become a sword could give a last glance at each batch after eighteen twenty five when m de peyronnet was minister a great change was made in the palais the old entrance to the conciergerie where the ceremonies of registering the criminal and of the last toilet were performed was closed and removed to where it now is between the tour de l'horloge and the tour de montgomery in an inner court entered through an arched passage to the left is the mouse trap to the right the prison gates the salad baskets can drive into this irregularly shaped courtyard can stand there and turn with ease and in case of a riot find some protection behind the strong grating of the gate under the arch whereas they formerly had no room to move in the narrow space dividing the outside steps from the right wing of the palace in our day the conciergerie hardly large enough for the prisoners committed for trial room being needed for about three hundred men and women no longer receives either suspected or remanded criminals excepting in rare cases as for instance in these of jacques collin and lucien all who are imprisoned there are committed for trial before the bench as an exception criminals of the higher ranks are allowed to sojourn there since being already disgraced by a sentence in open court their punishment would be too severe if they served their term of imprisonment at melun or at poissy ouvroir preferred to be imprisoned at the conciergerie rather than at sainte pelagie at this moment of writing le on the notary and the prince de berg are serving their time there by an exercise of leniency which though arbitrary is humane as a rule suspected criminals whether they are to be subjected to a preliminary examination to go up in the slang of the courts or to appear before the magistrate of the lower court are transferred in prison vans direct to the mouse traps the mouse traps opposite the gate consist of a certain number of old cells constructed in the old kitchens of st louis building whither prisoners not yet fully committed are brought to await the hour when the court sits or the arrival of the examining judge the mouse traps end on the north at the quay on the east at the headquarters of the municipal guard on the west at the courtyard of the conciergerie 
and on the south they adjoin a large vaulted hall formerly no doubt the banqueting-room but at present disused above the mouse-traps is an inner guard-room with a window commanding the court of the conciergerie this is used by the gendarmerie of the department and the stairs lead up to it when the hour of trial strikes the sheriffs call the roll of the prisoners the gendarmes go down one for each prisoner and each gendarme takes a criminal by the arm and thus in couples they mount the stairs cross the guard-room and are led along the passages to a room contiguous to the hall where sits the famous sixth chamber of the law whose functions are those of an english county court the same road is trodden by the prisoners committed for trial on their way to and from the conciergerie and the assize court in the salle des pas perdus between the door into the first court of the inferior class and the steps leading to the sixth the visitor must observe the first time he goes there a doorway without a door or any architectural adornment a square hole of the meanest type through this the judges and barristers find their way into the passages into the guard-house down into the prison cells and to the entrance to the conciergerie the private chambers of all the examining judges are on different floors in this part of the building they are reached by squalid staircases a maze in which those to whom the place is unfamiliar inevitably lose themselves the windows of some look out on the quay others on the yard of the conciergerie in eighteen thirty a few of these rooms commanded the rue de la barillerie thus when a prison van turns to the left in this yard it has brought prisoners to be examined to the mousetrap when it turns to the right it conveys prisoners committed for trial to the conciergerie now it was to the right that the vehicle turned which conveyed jacques collin to set him down at the prison gate nothing can be more sinister prisoners and visitors see two barred gates of wrought iron with a space between them of about six feet these are never both opened at once and through them everything is so cautiously scrutinized that persons who have a visiting ticket pass the permit through the bars before the key grinds in the lock the examining judges or even the supreme judges are not admitted without being identified imagine then the chances of communications or escape the governor of the conciergerie would smile with an expression on his lips that would freeze the mere suggestion in the most daring of romancers who defy probability in all the annals of the conciergerie no escape has been known but that of la valette but the certain fact of august connivance now amply proven if it does not detract from the wife's devotion certainly diminished the risk of failure the most ardent lover of the marvellous judging on the spot of the nature of the difficulties must admit that at all times the obstacles must have been as they still are insurmountable no words can do justice to the strength of the walls and vaulting they must be seen though the pavement of the yard is on a lower level than that of the quay in crossing this barbican you go down several steps to enter an immense vaulted hall with solid walls graced with magnificent columns this hall abuts on the tour de montgomery which is now part of the governor's residence and on the tour d'argent serving as a dormitory for the warders or porters or turnkeys as you may prefer to call them the number of the officials is less than might be supposed there are but twenty their sleeping quarters like their beds are in no respect different from those of the pistols or private cells the name pistol originated no doubt in the fact that the prisoners formerly paid a pistol about ten francs a week for this accommodation its bareness resembling that of the empty garrets in which great men in poverty begin their career in paris 
to the left in the vast entrance hall sits the governor of the conciergerie in a sort of office constructed of glass panes where he and his clerk keep the prison registers here the prisoners for examination or committed for trial have their names entered with a full description and are then searched the question of their lodging is also settled this depending on the prisoner's means opposite the entrance to this hall there is a glass door this opens into a parlor where the prisoner's relations and his counsel may speak with him across a double grating of wood the parlor window opens on to the prison yard the inner court where prisoners committed for trial take air and exercise at certain fixed hours this huge hall only lighted by the doubtful daylight that comes in through the gates for the single window to the front court is screened by the glass office built out in front of it has an atmosphere and a gloom that strike the eye in perfect harmony with the pictures that force themselves on the imagination its aspect is all the more sinister because parallel with the tour d'argent and de montgomery you discover those mysterious vaulted and overwhelming crypts which lead to the cells occupied by the queen and madame elizabeth and to those known as the secret cells this maze of masonry after being of old the scene of royal festivities is now the basement of the palais de justice between eighteen twenty five and eighteen thirty two the operation of the last toilet was performed in this enormous hall between a large stove which heats it and the inner gate it is impossible even now to tread without a shudder on the paved floor that has received the shock and the confidences of so many last glances Section 40 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 3. The apparently dying victim on this occasion could not get out of the horrible vehicle without the assistance of two gendarmes who took him under the arms to support him and led him half unconscious into the office thus dragged along the dying man raised his eyes to heaven in such a way as to suggest a resemblance to the saviour taken down from the cross and certainly in no picture does jesus present a more cadaverous or tortured countenance than this of the sham spaniard he looked ready to breathe his last sigh as soon as he was seated in the office he repeated in a weak voice the speech he had made to everybody since he was arrested i appeal to his excellency the spanish ambassador you can say that to the examining judge replied the governor oh lord said jacques collin with a sigh but cannot i have a breviary shall i never be allowed to see a doctor i have not two hours to live as carlos herrera was to be placed in close confinement in the secret cells it was needless to ask him whether he claimed the benefits of the pistol as above described that is to say the right of having one of the rooms where the prisoner enjoys such comfort as the law permits these rooms are on the other side of the prison yard of which mention will presently be made the sheriff and the clerk calmly carried out the formalities of the consignment to prison monsieur said jacques collin to the governor in broken french i am as you see a dying man pray if you can tell that examining judge as soon as possible that i crave as a favour what a criminal must most dread namely to be brought before him as soon as he arrives for my sufferings are really unbearable and as soon as i see him the mistake will be cleared up 
as an universal rule every criminal talks of a mistake go to the hulks and question the convicts they are almost all victims of a miscarriage of justice so this speech raises a faint smile in all who come into contact with the suspected accused or condemned criminal i will mention your request to the examining judge replied the governor and i shall bless you monsieur replied the false abbe raising his eyes to heaven as soon as his name was entered on the calendar carlos herrera supported under each arm by a man of the municipal guard and followed by a turnkey instructed by the governor as to the number of the cell in which the prisoner was to be placed was led through the subterranean maze of the conciergerie into a perfectly wholesome room whatever certain philanthropists may say to the contrary but cut off from all possible communication with the outer world as soon as he was removed the warders the governor and his clerk looked at each other as though asking each other's opinion and suspicion was legible on every face but at the appearance of the second man in custody the spectators relapsed into their usual doubting frame of mind concealed under the air of indifference only in very extraordinary cases do the functionaries of the conciergerie feel any curiosity the prisoners are no more to them than a barber's customers are to him hence all the formalities which appall the imagination are carried out with less fuss than a money transaction at a banker's and often with greater civility lucien's expression was that of a dejected criminal he submitted to everything and obeyed like a machine all the way from fontainebleau the poet had been facing his ruin and telling himself that the hour of expiation had told pale and exhausted knowing nothing of what had happened at esther's house during his absence he only knew that he was the intimate ally of an escaped convict a situation which enabled him to guess at disaster worse than death when his mind could command a thought it was that of suicide he must at any cost escape the ignominy that loomed before him like the phantasm of a dreadful dream jacques collin as the more dangerous of the two culprits was placed in a cell of solid masonry deriving its light from one of the narrow yards of which there are several in the interior of the palace in the wing where the public prosecutor's chambers are this little yard is the airing ground for the female prisoners lucien was taken to the same part of the building to a cell adjoining the rooms let to misdemeanants for by orders from the examining judge the governor treated him with some consideration persons who have never had anything to do with the action of the law usually have the darkest notions as to the meaning of solitary or secret confinement ideas as to the treatment of criminals have not yet become disentangled from the old pictures of torture chambers of the unhealthiness of a prison the chill of stone walls sweating tears the coarseness of the jailers and of the food inevitable accessories of the drama but it is not unnecessary to explain here that these exaggerations exist only on the stage and only make lawyers and judges smile as well as those who visit prisons out of curiosity or who come to study them for a long time no doubt they were terrible in the days of the old parlement of louis the thirteenth and louis the fourteenth the accused were no doubt flung pell-mell into a low room underneath the old gateway the prisons were among the crimes of seventeen eighty nine and it is enough only to see the cells where the queen and madame elizabeth were incarcerated to conceive a horror of old judicial proceedings in our day though philanthropy has brought incalculable mischief on society it has produced some good for the individual 
it is to napoleon that we owe our criminal code and this even more than the civil code which still urgently needs reform on some points will remain one of the greatest monuments of his short reign this new view of criminal law put an end to a perfect abyss of misery indeed it may be said that apart from the terrible moral torture which men of the better classes must suffer when they find themselves in the power of the law the action of that power is simple and mild to a degree that would hardly be expected suspected or accused criminals are certainly not lodged as if they were at home but every necessary is supplied to them in the prisons of paris besides the burden of feelings that weighs on them deprives the details of daily life of their customary value it is never the body that suffers the mind is in such a phase of violence that every form of discomfort or of brutal treatment if such there were would be easily endured in such a frame of mind and it must be admitted that an innocent man is quickly released especially in paris so lucien on entering his cell saw an exact reproduction of the first room he had occupied in paris at the hotel cluny a bed to compare with those in the worst furnished apartments of the quartier latin straw chairs with the bottoms out a table and a few utensils compose the furniture of such a room in which two accused prisoners are not unfrequently placed together when they are quiet in their ways and their misdeeds are not crimes of violence but such as forgery or bankruptcy this resemblance between his starting point in the days of his innocency and his goal the lowest depths of degradation and sham was so direct an appeal to his last chord of poetic feeling that the unhappy fellow melted into tears for four hours he wept as rigid in appearance as a figure of stone but enduring the subversion of all his hopes the crushing of all his social vanity and the utter overthrow of his pride smarting in each separate eye that exists in an ambitious man a lover a success a dandy a parisian a poet a libertine and a favorite everything in him was broken by this fall as of icarus carlos herrera on the other hand as soon as he was locked into his cell and found himself alone began pacing it to and fro like the polar bear in his cage he carefully examined the door and assured himself that with the exception of the peephole there was not a crack in it he sounded all the walls he looked up the funnel down which a dim light came and he said to himself i am safe enough he sat down in a corner where the eye of a prying warder at the grating of the peephole could not see him then he took off his wig and hastily ungummed a piece of paper that did duty as lining the side of the paper next his head was so greasy that it looked like the very texture of the wig if it had occurred to bibi lupin to snatch off the wig to establish the identity of the spaniard with jacques collin he would never have thought twice about the paper it looked so exactly like part of the wig-maker's work the other side was still fairly white and clean enough to have a few lines written on it the delicate and tiresome task of unsticking it had been begun in la force two hours would not have been long enough it had taken him half of the day before the prisoner began by tearing this precious scrap of paper so as to have a strip four or five lines wide which he divided into several bits he then replaced his store of paper in the same strange hiding-place after damping the gummed side so as to make it stick again he felt in a lock of his hair for one of those pencil leads as thin as a stout pin then recently invented by seuss and which he had put in with some gum 
he broke off a scrap long enough to write with and small enough to hide in his ear having made these preparations with the rapidity and certainty of hand peculiar to old convicts who are as light-fingered as monkeys jacques collin sat down on the edge of his bed to meditate on his instructions to asie in perfect confidence that he should come across her so entirely did he rely on the woman's genius during the preliminary examination he reflected i pretended to be a spaniard and spoke broken french appealed to my ambassador and alleged diplomatic privilege not understanding anything i was asked the whole performance varied by fainting pauses sighs in short all the vagaries of a dying man i must stick to that my papers are all regular as he and i can eat up monsieur camusot he is no great shakes now i must think of lucien he must be made to pull himself together i must get at the boy at whatever cost and show him some plan of conduct otherwise he will give himself up give me up lose all he must be taught his lesson before he is examined and besides i must find some witnesses to swear to my being a priest such was the position moral and physical of these two prisoners whose fate at the moment depended on monsieur camusot examining judge to the inferior court of the seine and sovereign master during the time granted to him by the code of the smallest details of their existence since he alone could grant leave for them to be visited by the chaplains the doctor or any one else in the world no human authority neither the king nor the keeper of the seals nor the prime minister can encroach on the power of an examining judge nothing can stop him no one can control him he is a monarch subject only to his conscience and the law at the present time when philosophers philanthropists and politicians are constantly endeavoring to reduce every social power the rights conferred on the examining judges have become the object of attacks that are all the more serious because they are almost justified by those rights which it must be owned are enormous and yet as every man of sense will own that power ought to remain unimpaired in certain cases its exercise can be mitigated by a strong infusion of caution but society is already threatened by the ineptitude and weakness of the jury which is in fact the really supreme bench and which ought to be composed only of choice and elected men and it would be in danger of ruin if this pillar were broken which now upholds our criminal procedure arrest on suspicion is one of the terrible but necessary powers of which the risk to society is counterbalanced by its immense importance and besides distrust of the magistracy in general is a beginning of social disillusion destroy that institution and reconstruct it on another basis insist as was the case before the revolution that judges should show a large guarantee of fortune but at any cost believe in it do not make it an image of society to be insulted in these days a judge paid as a functionary and generally a poor man has in the place of his dignity of old a haughtiness of demeanour that seems odious to the men raised to be his equals for haughtiness is dignity without a solid basis that is the vicious element in the present system if france were divided into ten circuits the magistracy might be reinstated by conferring its dignities on men of fortune but with six and twenty circuits this is impossible the only real improvement to be insisted on in the exercise of the power entrusted to the examining judge is an alteration in the conditions of preliminary imprisonment 
the mere fact of suspicion ought to make no difference in the habits of life of the suspected parties houses of detention for them ought to be constructed in paris furnished and arranged in such a way as greatly to modify the feeling of the public with regard to suspected persons the law is good and is necessary its application is in fault and public feeling judges the laws from the way in which they are carried out and public opinion in france condemns persons under suspicion while by an inexplicable reaction it justifies those committed for trial this perhaps is a result of the essentially refractory nature of the french this illogical temper of the parisian people was one of the factors which contributed to the climax of this drama nay as may be seen it was one of the most important to enter into the secret of the terrible scenes which are acted out in the examining judge's chambers to understand the respective positions of the two belligerent powers the law and the examinee the object of whose contest is a certain secret kept by the prisoner from the inquisition of the magistrate well named in prison slang the curious man it must always be remembered that persons imprisoned under suspicion know nothing of what is being said by the seven or eight publics that compose the public nothing of how much the police know or the authorities or the little that newspapers can publish as to the circumstances of the crime thus to give a man in custody such information as jacques collin had just received from asie as to lucien's arrest is throwing a rope to a drowning man as will be seen in consequence of this ignorance a stratagem which without this Section 41 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 4. Monsieur Camusot, the son-in-law of one of the clerks of the cabinet, too well known for any account of his position and connection to be necessary here, was at this moment almost as much perplexed as carlos herrera in view of the examination he was to conduct he had formerly been president of a court of the paris circuit he had been raised from that position and called to be a judge in paris one of the most coveted posts in the magistracy by the influence of the celebrated duchesse de Montfrigneuse, whose husband attached to the dauphin's person and colonel of a cavalry regiment of the guards was as much in favour with the king as she was with madame in return for a very small service which he had done the duchess an important matter to her on occasion of a charge of forgery brought against the young comte d'esquignon by a banker of alencon see la cabinet des antiques Seine de la vie de province he was promoted from being a provincial judge to be president of his court and from being president to being an examining judge in paris for eighteen months now he had sat on the most important bench in the kingdom and had once at the desire of the duchesse de montfrigneuse had an opportunity of forwarding the ends of a lady not less influential than the duchess namely the marquise d'espard but he had failed see the commission in lunacy lucien as was told at the beginning of the scene to be revenged on madame d'espard who aimed at depriving her husband of his liberty of action was able to put the true facts before the public prosecutor and the comte de serizy these two important authorities being thus won over to the marquis d'espard's party his wife had barely escaped the censure of the bench by her husband's generous intervention 
on hearing yesterday of lucien's arrest the marquise d'espard had sent her brother-in-law the chevalier d'espard to see madame camusot madame camusot had set off forthwith to call on the notorious marquise just before dinner on her return home she had called her husband aside in the bedroom if you can commit that little fop lucien de rubempre for trial and secure his condemnation said she in his ear you will be counsellor to the supreme court how madame d'espard longs to see that poor young man guillotined i shivered as i heard what a pretty woman's hatred can be do not meddle in questions of the law said camusot i meddle said she if a third person could have heard us he could not have guessed what we were talking about the marquise and i were as exquisitely hypocritical to each other as you are to me at this moment she began by thanking me for your good offices in her suit saying that she was grateful in spite of its having failed she spoke of the terrible functions devolved on you by the law it is fearful to have to send a man to the scaffold but as to that man it would be no more than justice and so forth then she lamented that such a handsome young fellow brought to paris by her cousin madame du chatelet should have turned out so badly that said she is what bad women like coralie and esther bring young men to when they are corrupt enough to share their disgraceful profits next came some fine speeches about charity and religion madame du chatelet had said that lucien deserved a thousand deaths for having half killed his mother and his sister then she spoke of a vacancy in the supreme court she knows the keeper of the seals your husband madame has a fine opportunity of distinguishing himself she said in conclusion and that is all we distinguish ourselves every day when we do our duty said camusot you will go far if you are always the lawyer even to your wife cried madame camusot well i used to think you a goose now i admire you the lawyer's lips wore one of those smiles which are as peculiar to them as dancers smiles are to dancers madame can i come in said the maid what is it said her mistress madame the head lady's maid came from the duchesse de maufrigneuse while you were out and she will be obliged if you would go at once to the hotel de cadignan keep dinner back said the lawyer's wife remembering that the driver of the hackney coach that had brought her home was waiting to be paid she put her bonnet on again got into the coach and in twenty minutes was at the hotel de cadignan madame camusot was led up the private stairs and sat alone for ten minutes in a boudoir adjoining the duchess's bedroom the duchess presently appeared splendidly dressed for she was starting for saint cloud in obedience to a royal invitation between you and me my dear a few words are enough yes madame la duchesse lucien de rubempre is in custody your husband is conducting the inquiry i will answer for the poor boy's innocence see that he is released within twenty-four hours this is not all some one will ask to-morrow to see lucien in private in his cell your husband may be present if he chooses so long as he is not discovered the king looks for high courage in his magistrates in the difficult position in which he will presently find himself i will bring your husband forward and recommend him as a man devoted to the king even at the risk of his head our friend camusot will be made first a councillor and then the president of court somewhere or other good-bye i am under orders you will excuse me i know you will not only oblige the public prosecutor who cannot give an opinion in this affair you will save the life of a dying woman madame de serizy 
so you will not lack support in short you see i put my trust in you i need not say you know she laid a finger to her lips and disappeared and i had not a chance of telling her that madame d'espard wants to see lucien on the scaffold thought the judge's wife as she returned to her hackney cab she got home in such a state of anxiety that her husband on seeing her asked what is the matter amelie we stand between two fires she told her husband of her interview with the duchess speaking in his ear for fear the maid should be listening at the door now which of them has the most power she said in conclusion the marquise was very near getting you into trouble in the silly business of the commission on her husband and we owe everything to the duchess one made vague promises while the other tells you you shall first be councillor and then president heaven forbid i should advise you i will never meddle in matters of business still i am bound to repeat exactly what is said at court and what goes on but amelie you do not know what the prefet of police sent me this morning and by whom by one of the most important agents of the superior police the bibi lupin of politics who told me that the government had a secret interest in this trial now let us dine and go to the varieté we will talk all this over to-night in my private room for i shall need your intelligence that of a judge may not perhaps be enough nine magistrates out of ten would deny the influence of the wife over her husband in such cases but though this may be a remarkable exception in society it may be insisted on as true even if improbable the magistrate is like the priest especially in paris where the best of the profession are to be found he rarely speaks of his business in the courts excepting of settled cases not only do magistrates wives affect to know nothing they have enough sense of propriety to understand that it would damage their husbands if when they are told some secret they allowed their knowledge to be suspected nevertheless on some great occasions when promotion depends on the decision made many a wife like amelie has helped the lawyer in his study of a case and after all these exceptions which of course are easily denied since they remain unknown depend entirely on the way in which the struggle between two natures has worked out in home life now madame camusot controlled her husband completely when all in the house were asleep the lawyer and his wife sat down to the desk where the magistrate had already laid out the documents in the case here are the notes forwarded to me at my request by the prefet of police said camusot the abbe carlos herrera this individual is undoubtedly the man named jacques collin known as trompe la mort who was last arrested in eighteen nineteen in the dwelling-house of a certain madame vauquer who kept a common boarding-house in the rue neuve sainte geneviève where he lived in concealment under the alias of vautrin a marginal note in the prefet's handwriting ran thus orders have been sent by telegraph to bibi lupin chief of the safety department to return forthwith to be confronted with the prisoner as he is personally acquainted with jacques collin whom he in fact arrested in eighteen nineteen with the connivance of a mademoiselle michonneau the boarders who then lived in the maison vauquer are still living and may be called to establish his identity the self-styled carlos herrera is monsieur lucien de rubempre's intimate friend and adviser and for three years past has furnished him with considerable sums evidently obtained by dishonest means this partnership if the identity of the spaniard with jacques collin can be proved must involve the condemnation of lucien de rubempre 
the sudden death of peyrade the police agent is attributable to poison administered at the instigation of jacques collin rubempre or their accomplices the reason for this murder is the fact that justice had for a long time been on the traces of these clever criminals and again on the margin the magistrate pointed to this note written by the prefet himself this is the fact to my personal knowledge and i also know that the sieur lucien de rubempre has disgracefully tricked the comte de serizy and the public prosecutor what do you say to this amelie it is frightful replied his wife go on the transformation of the convict jacques collin into a spanish priest is the result of some crime more clever than that by which coignard made himself comte de saint hélène lucien de rubempre lucien chardon son of an apothecary at angouleme his mother a demoiselle de rubempre bears the name of rubempre in virtue of a royal patent this was granted by the request of madame la duchesse de maufrigneuse and monsieur le comte de serizy this young man came to paris in eighteen twenty something without any means of subsistence following madame la comtesse sixte du chatelet then madame de bargeton a cousin of madame d'espard's he was ungrateful to madame de bargeton and cohabited with a girl named coralie an actress at the gymnase now dead who left m camusot a silk mercer in the rue des bourdonnais to live with rubempre ere long having sunk into poverty through the insufficiency of the money allowed him by this actress he seriously compromised his brother-in-law a highly respected printer of angouleme by giving forged bills for which david sechard was arrested during a short visit paid to angouleme by lucien in consequence of this affair rubempre fled but suddenly reappeared in paris with the abbe carlos herrera though having no visible means of subsistence the said lucien de rubempre spent on an average three hundred thousand francs during the three years of his second residence in paris and can only have obtained the money from the self-styled abbe carlos herrera but how did he come by it he has recently laid out above a million francs in repurchasing the rubempre estates to fulfil the conditions on which he was to be allowed to marry mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu this marriage has been broken off in consequence of inquiries made by the grandlieu family the said lucien having told them that he had obtained the money from his brother-in-law and his sister but the information obtained more especially by m derville attorney at law proves that not only were that worthy couple ignorant of his having made this purchase but that they believed the said lucien to be deeply in debt moreover the property inherited by the sechars consists of houses and the ready money by their affidavit amounted to about two hundred thousand francs lucien was secretly cohabiting with esther gobseck hence there can be no doubt that all the lavish gifts of the baron de nucingen the girl's protector were handed over to the said lucien lucien and his companion the convict have succeeded in keeping their footing in the face of the world longer than coignard did deriving their income from the prostitution of the said esther formerly on the register of the town though these notes are to a great extent a repetition of the story already told it was necessary to reproduce them to show the part played by the police in paris as has already been seen from the note on peyrade the police has summaries almost invariably correct concerning every family or individual whose life is under suspicion or whose actions are of a doubtful character it knows every circumstance of their delinquencies this universal register and account of consciences is as accurately kept as the register of the bank of france and its accounts of fortunes 
just as the bank notes the slightest delay in payment gauges every credit takes stock of every capitalist and watches their proceedings so does the police weigh and measure the honesty of each citizen with it as in a court of law innocence has nothing to fear it has no hold on anything but crime however high the rank of a family it cannot evade this social providence and its discretion is equal to the extent of its power this vast mass of written evidence compiled by the police reports notes and summaries an ocean of information sleeps undisturbed as deep and calm as the sea some accident occurs some crime or misdemeanor becomes aggressive then the law refers to the police and immediately if any documents bear on the suspected criminal the judge is informed these records an analysis of his antecedents are merely sidelights and unknown beyond the walls of the palais de justice no legal use can be made of them justice is informed by them and takes advantage of them but that is all these documents form as it were the inner lining of the tissue of crimes their first cause which is hardly ever made public no jury would accept it and the whole country would rise up in wrath if excerpts from those documents came out in the trial at the assizes in fact it is the truth which is doomed to remain in the well as it is everywhere and at all times there is not a magistrate who after twelve years experience in paris is not fully aware that the assize court and the police authorities keep the secret of half these squalid atrocities or who does not admit that half the crimes that are committed are never punished by the law if the public could know how reserved the employees of the police are who do not forget they would reverence these honest men as much as they do chevaru the police is supposed to be astute machiavellian it is in fact most benign but it hears every passion in its paroxysms it listens to every kind of treachery and keeps notes of all the police is terrible on one side only what it does for justice it does no less for political interests but in these it is as ruthless and as one-sided as the fires of the inquisition put this aside said the lawyer replacing the notes in their cover this is a secret between the police and the law the judge will estimate its value but monsieur and madame camusot must know nothing of it as if i needed telling that said his wife lucien is guilty he went on but of what a man who is the favorite of the duchesse de maufrigneuse of the comtesse de serizy and loved by clotilde de grandlieu is not guilty said amelie the other must be answerable for everything but lucien is his accomplice cried camusot take my advice said amelie restore this priest to the diplomatic career he so greatly adorns exculpate this little wretch and find some other criminal how you run on said the magistrate with a smile women go to the point plunging through the law as birds fly through the air and find nothing to stop them but said amelie whether he is a diplomat or a convict the abbe carlos will find someone to get him out of the scrape i am only a considering cap you are the brain said camusot well the sitting is closed give your melee a kiss it is one o'clock and madame camusot went to bed leaving her husband to arrange his papers and his ideas
Section forty two of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter five. And thus, while the prison vans were conveying Jacques Collin and Lucien to the Conciergerie, the examining judge, having breakfasted, was making his way across paris on foot after the unpretentious fashion of parisian magistrates to go to his chambers where all the documents in the case were laid ready for him this was the way of it every examining judge has a head clerk a sort of sworn legal secretary a race that perpetuates itself without any premiums or encouragement producing a number of excellent souls in whom secrecy is natural and incorruptible from the origin of the parlement to the present day no case has ever been known at the palais de justice of any gossip or indiscretion on the part of a clerk bound to the courts of inquiry Gentil sold the release given by louise de savoie to semblancet a war office clerk sold the plan of the russian campaign to chenicheff and these traitors were more or less rich the prospect of a post in the palais and professional conscientiousness are enough to make a judge's clerk a successful rival of the tomb for the tomb has betrayed many secrets since chemistry has made such progress this official is in fact the magistrate's pen it will be understood by many readers that a man may gladly be the shaft of a machine while they wonder why he is content to remain a bolt still a bolt is content perhaps the machinery terrifies him camusot's clerk a young man of two-and-twenty named coquart had come in the morning to fetch all the documents and the judge's notes and laid everything ready in his chambers while the lawyer himself was wandering along the quays looking at the curiosities in the shops and wondering within himself how on earth am i to set to work with such a clever rascal as this jacques collin supposing it is he the head of the safety will know him i must look as if i knew what i was about if only for the sake of the police i see so many insuperable difficulties that the best plan would be to enlighten the marquise and the duchess by showing them the notes of the police and i should avenge my father from whom lucien stole coralie if i can unveil these scoundrels my skill will be loudly proclaimed and lucien will soon be thrown over by his friends well well the examination will settle all that he turned into a curiosity shop tempted by a boule clock not to be false to my conscience and yet to oblige two great ladies that will be a triumph of skill thought he what do you collect coins too monsieur said camusot to the public prosecutor whom he found in the shop it is a taste dear to all dispensers of justice said the comte de granville laughing they look at the reverse side of every medal and after looking about the shop for some minutes as if continuing his search he accompanied camusot on his way down the quay without it ever occurring to camusot that anything but chance had brought them together you are examining monsieur de rubempre this morning said the public prosecutor poor fellow i liked him there are several charges against him said camusot yes i saw the police papers but some of the information came from an agent who is independent of the prefet the notorious corentin who had caused the death of more innocent men than you will ever send guilty men to the scaffold and but that rascal is out of your reach without trying to influence the conscience of such a magistrate as you are i may point out to you that if you could be perfectly sure that lucien was ignorant of the contents of that woman's will 
it would be self-evident that he had no interest in her death for she gave him enormous sums of money we can prove his absence at the time when this esther was poisoned said camusot he was at fontainebleau on the watch for mademoiselle de grandlieu and the duchesse de lunancourt and he still cherished such hopes of marrying mademoiselle de grandlieu said the public prosecutor i have it from the duchesse de grandlieu herself that it is inconceivable that such a clever young fellow should compromise his chances by a perfectly aimless crime yes said camusot especially if esther gave him all she got derville and nucingen both say that she died in ignorance of the inheritance she had long since come into added granville but then what do you suppose is the meaning of it all asked camusot for there is something at the bottom of it a crime committed by some servant said the public prosecutor unfortunately remarked camusot it would be quite like jacques collin for the spanish priest is certainly none other than that escaped convict to have taken possession of the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs derived from the sale of the certificate of shares given to esther by nucingen weigh everything with care my dear camusot be prudent the abbe carlos herrera has diplomatic connections still an envoy who had committed a crime would not be sheltered by his position is he or is he not the abbe carlos herrera that is the important question and m de granville bowed and turned away as requiring no answer so he too wants to save lucien thought camusot going on by the quai des lunettes while the public prosecutor entered the palais through the cour de Halley on reaching the courtyard of the conciergerie camusot went to the governor's room and led him into the middle of the pavement where no one could overhear them my dear sir do me the favour of going to la force and inquiring of your colleague there whether he happens at this moment to have there any convicts who were on the hulks at toulon between eighteen ten and eighteen fifteen or have you any imprisoned here we will transfer those of la force here for a few days and you will let me know whether this so-called spanish priest is known to them as jacques collin otherwise trompe la mort very good monsieur camusot but bibi lupin is come what already said the judge he was at melun he was told that trompe la mort had to be identified and he smiled with joy he awaits your orders send him to me the governor was then able to lay before m camusot jacques collin's request and he described the man's deplorable condition i intended to examine him first replied the magistrate but not on account of his health i received a note this morning from the governor of la force well this rascal who described himself to you as having been dying for twenty-four hours past slept so soundly that they went into his cell there with the doctor for whom the governor had sent without his hearing them the doctor did not even feel his pulse he left him to sleep which proves that his conscience is as tough as his health i shall accept this feigned illness only so far as it may enable me to study my man added m camusot smiling we live to learn every day with these various grades of prisoners said the governor of the prison the prefecture of police adjoins the conciergerie and the magistrates like the governor knowing all the subterranean passages can get to and fro with the greatest rapidity this explains the miraculous ease with which information can be conveyed during the sitting of the courts to the officials and the presidents of the assize courts 
and by the time m camusot had reached the top of the stairs leading to his chambers bibi lupin was there too having come by the salle des pas perdus what zeal said camusot with a smile ah well you see if it is he replied the man you will see great fun in the prison yard if by chance there are any old stagers here why trompe la mort sneaked their chips and i know that they have vowed to be the death of him they were the convicts whose money entrusted to trompe la mort had all been made away with by him for lucien as has been told could you lay your hand on the witnesses of his former arrest give me two summonses of witnesses and i will find you some to-day coquart said the lawyer as he took off his gloves and placed his hat and stick in a corner fill up two summonses by monsieur's directions he looked at himself in the glass over the chimney-shelf where stood in the place of a clock a basin and jug on one side was a bottle of water and a glass on the other a lamp he rang the bell his usher came in a few minutes after is anybody here for me yet he asked the man whose business it was to receive the witnesses to verify their summons and to set them in the order of their arrival yes sir take their names and bring me the list the examining judges to save time are often obliged to carry on several inquiries at once hence the long waiting inflicted on the witnesses who have seats in the usher's hall where the judge's bells are constantly ringing and then camusot went on bring up the abbe carlos herrera aha i was told that he was a priest in spanish pooh it is a new edition of collet monsieur camusot said the head of the safety department there is nothing new replied camusot and he signed the two formidable documents which alarm everybody even the most innocent witnesses whom section forty three of scenes from a courtesan's life by honore de balzac translated by james waring this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by bruce peary the end of evil ways chapter six by this time jacques collin had about half an hour since finished his deep meditations and was armed for the fray nothing is more perfectly characteristic of this type of the mob in rebellion against the law than the few words he had written on the greasy scraps of paper the sense of the first for it was written in the language the very slang of slang agreed upon by asie and himself a cipher of words was as follows go to the duchesse de maufrigneuse or madame de serizy one of them must see lucien before he is examined and give him the enclosed paper to read then find Europe and Paccard. those two thieves must be at my orders and ready to play any part i may set them go to rastignac tell him from the man he met at the opera ball to come and swear that the abbe carlos herrera has no resemblance to jacques collin who was apprehended at vauquer's do the same with dr bianchon and get lucien's two women to work to the same end on the enclosed fragment were these words in good french lucien confess nothing about me i am the abbe carlos herrera not only will this be your exculpation but if you do not lose your head you will have seven millions and your honor cleared these two bits of paper gummed on the side of the writing so as to look like one piece were then rolled tightly 
with a dexterity peculiar to men who have dreamed of getting free from the hulks the whole thing assumed the shape and consistency of a ball of dirty rubbish about as big as the sealing wax heads which thrifty women stick on the head of a large needle when the eye is broken if i am examined first we are saved if it is the boy all is lost said he to himself while he waited his plight was so sore that the strong man's face was wet with white sweat indeed this wonderful man saw as clearly in his sphere of crime as moliere did in his sphere of dramatic poetry or cuvier in that of extinct organisms genius of whatever kind is intuition below this highest manifestation other remarkable achievements may be due to talent this is what divides men of the first rank from those of the second crime has its men of genius jacques collin driven to bay had hit on the same notion as madame camusot's ambition and madame de serizy's passion suddenly revived by the shock of the dreadful disaster which was overwhelming lucien this was the supreme effort of human intellect directed against the steel armor of justice on hearing the rasping of the heavy locks and bolts of his door jacques collin resumed his mask of a dying man he was helped in this by the intoxicating joy that he felt at the sound of the warder's shoes in the passage he had no idea how Asie would get near him, but he relied on meeting her on the way, especially after her promise given in the St. Jean Gateway. After that fortunate achievement, she had gone on to the Place de Greve. Till 1830, the name of La Greve, the Strand, had a meaning that is now lost every part of the river shore from the pont d'arcole to the pont louis philippe was then as nature had made it excepting the paved way which was at the top of the bank when the river was in flood a boat could pass close under the houses and at the end of the streets running down to the river on the quay the footpath was for the most part raised with a few steps and when the river was up to the houses vehicles had to pass along the horrible rue de la mortellerie which has now been completely removed to make room for enlarging the hotel de ville so the sham costermonger could easily and quickly run her truck down to the bottom of the quay and hide it there till the real owner who was in fact drinking the price of her wares sold bodily to asie in one of the abominable taverns in the rue de la mortellerie should return to claim it at that time the quai pelletier was being extended the entrance to the works was guarded by a crippled soldier and the barrow would be quite safe in his keeping asie then jumped into a hackney cab on the place de l'hôtel de ville and said to the driver to the temple and look sharp i'll tip you well a woman dressed like asie could disappear without any questions being asked in the huge market-place where all the rags in paris are gathered together where a thousand costermongers wander round and two hundred old clothes sellers are chaffering the two prisoners had hardly been locked up when she was dressing herself in a low damp entresol over one of those foul shops where remnants are sold pieces stolen by tailors and dressmakers an establishment kept by an old maid known as la romette from her christian name Giromette. la romette was to the purchasers of wardrobes what these women are to the better class of so-called ladies in difficulties madame la ressource that is to say money-lenders at a hundred per cent now child said asie i have got to be figged out i must be a baroness of the faubourg saint germain at the very least and sharps the word for my feet are in hot oil you know what gowns suit me 
hand up the rouge pot find me some first-class bits of lace and the swaggerest jewellery you can pick out send the girl to call a coach and have it brought to the back door yes madame the woman replied very humbly and with the eagerness of a maid waiting on her mistress if there had been any one to witness the scene he would have understood that the woman known as Azie was at home here i have had some diamonds offered me said la romette as she dressed Azie's head stolen i should think so well then however cheap they may be we must do without em we must fight shy of the beak for a long time to come it will now be understood how Azie contrived to be in the salle des pas perdus of the palais de justice with a summons in her hand asking her way along the passages and stairs leading to the examining judge's chambers and inquiring for monsieur camusot about a quarter of an hour before that gentleman's arrival Azie was not recognizable after washing off her make-up as an old woman like an actress she applied rouge and pearl powder and covered her head with a well-made fair wig dressed exactly as a lady of the faubourg saint germain might be if in search of a dog she had lost she looked about forty for she shrouded her features under a splendid black lace veil a pair of stays severely laced disguised her cook's figure with very good gloves and a rather large bustle she exhaled the perfume of powder a la marechale playing with a bag mounted in gold she divided her attention between the walls of the building where she found herself evidently for the first time and the string by which she led a dainty little spaniel such a dowager could not fail to attract the notice of the black-robed natives of the salle des pas perdus besides the briefless lawyers who sweep this hall with their gowns and speak of the leading advocates by their christian names as fine gentlemen address each other to produce the impression that they are of the aristocracy of the law patient youths are often to be seen hangers-on of the attorneys waiting waiting in hope of a case put down for the end of the day which they may be so lucky as to be called to plead if the advocates retained for the earlier cases should not come out in time a very curious study would be that of the differences between these various black gowns pacing the immense hall in threes or sometimes in fours their persistent talk filling the place with a loud echoing hum a hall well named indeed for this slow walk exhausts the lawyers as much as the waste of words but such a study has its place in the volumes destined to reveal the life of paris pleaders as he had counted on the presence of these youths she laughed in her sleeve at some of the pleasantries she overheard and finally succeeded in attracting the attention of massal a young lawyer whose time was more taken up by the police gazette than by clients and who came up with a laugh to place himself at the service of a woman so elegantly scented and so handsomely dressed as he put on a little thin voice to explain to this obliging gentleman that she appeared in answer to a summons from a judge named camusot oh in the rubempre case so the affair had its name already oh it is not my affair it is my maid's a girl named Europe, who was with me twenty-four hours and who fled when she saw my servant bring in a piece of stamped paper then like any old woman who spends her life gossiping in the chimney-corner prompted by massal she poured out the story of her woes with her first husband one of the three directors of the land revenue she consulted the young lawyer as to whether she would do well to enter on a lawsuit with her son-in-law the comte de grosnap who made her daughter very miserable and whether the law allowed her to dispose of her fortune 
in spite of all his efforts massol could not be sure whether the summons were addressed to the mistress or the maid at the first moment he had only glanced at this legal document of the most familiar aspect for to save time it is printed and the magistrate's clerks have only to fill in the blanks left for the names and addresses of the witnesses the hour for which they are called and so forth as he made him tell her all about the palais which she knew more intimately than the lawyer did finally she inquired at what hour monsieur camusot would arrive well the examining judges generally are here by about ten o'clock it is now a quarter to ten said she looking at a pretty little watch a perfect gem of goldsmith's work which made massa say to himself where the devil will fortune make herself at home next at this moment as he had come to the dark hall looking out on the yard of the conciergerie where the ushers wait on seeing the gate through the window she exclaimed what are those high walls that is the conciergerie oh so that is the conciergerie where our poor queen oh i should so like to see her cell impossible madame la baronne replied the young lawyer on whose arm the dowager was now leaning a permit is indispensable and very difficult to procure i have been told she went on that louis the eighteenth himself composed the inscription that is to be seen in marie antoinette's cell yes madame la baronne how much i should like to know latin that i might study the words of that inscription said she do you think that monsieur camusot could give me a permit that is not in his power but he could take you there but his business objected she oh said massol prisoners under suspicion can wait to be sure said she artlessly they are under suspicion but i know monsieur de granville your public prosecutor this hint had a magical effect on the ushers and the young lawyer ah you know monsieur de granville said massol who was inclined to ask the client thus sent to him by chance her name and address i often see him at my friend monsieur de serizy's house madame de serizy is a connection of mine through the rancorolles well if madame wishes to go down to the conciergerie said an usher she yes said massol so the baroness and the lawyer were allowed to pass and they presently found themselves in the little guard-room at the top of the stairs leading to the mouse-trap a spot well known to asie forming as has been said a post of observation between those cells and the court of the sixth chamber through which everybody is obliged to pass will you ask if monsieur camusot is come yet said she seeing some gendarmes playing cards yes madame he has just come up from the mousetrap the mousetrap said she what is that oh how stupid of me not to have gone straight to the comte de granville but i have not time now pray take me to speak to monsieur camusot before he is otherwise engaged oh you have plenty of time for seeing monsieur camusot said massol if you send him in your card he will spare you the discomfort of waiting in the ante-room with the witnesses we can be civil here to ladies like you you have a card about you at this instant as he and her lawyer were exactly in front of the window of the guard-room whence the gendarmes could observe the gate of the conciergerie the gendarmes brought up to respect the defenders of the widow and the orphan were aware too of the prerogative of the gown and for a few minutes allowed the baroness to remain there escorted by a pleader as he listened to the terrible tales which a young lawyer is ready to tell about that prison gate 
she would not believe that those who were condemned to death were prepared for the scaffold behind those bars but the sergeant-at-arms assured her it was so how much i should like to see it done cried she and there she remained prattling to the lawyer and the sergeant till she saw jacques collin come out supported by two gendarmes and preceded by monsieur camusot's clerk ah there is a chaplain no doubt going to prepare a poor wretch not at all madame la baronne said the gendarme he is a prisoner coming to be examined what is he accused of he is concerned in this poisoning case oh i should like to see him you cannot stay here said the sergeant for he is under close arrest and he must pass through here you see madame that door leads to the stairs oh thank you cried the baroness making for the door to rush down the stairs where she at once shrieked out oh where am i this cry reached the ear of jacques collin who was thus prepared to see her the sergeant flew after madame la baronne seized her by the middle and lifted her back like a feather into the midst of a group of five gendarmes who started up as one man for in that guard-room everything is regarded as suspicious the proceeding was arbitrary but the arbitrariness was necessary the young lawyer himself had cried out twice madame madame in his horror so much did he fear finding himself in the wrong the abbe carlos herrera half fainting sank on a chair in the guard-room poor man said the baroness can he be a criminal the words though spoken low to the young advocate could be heard by all for the silence of death reigned in that terrible guard-room certain privileged persons are sometimes allowed to see famous criminals on their way through this room or through the passages so that the clerk and the gendarmes who had charge of the abbe carlos made no remark also in consequence of the devoted zeal of the sergeant who had snatched up the baroness to hinder any communication between the prisoner and the visitors there was a considerable space between them let us go on said jacques collin making an effort to rise at the same moment the little ball rolled out of his sleeve and the spot where it fell was noted by the baroness who could look about her freely from under her veil the little pellet being damp and sticky did not roll for such trivial details apparently unimportant had all been duly considered by jacques collin to ensure success when the prisoner had been led up the higher part of the stairs as he very unaffectedly dropped her bag and picked it up again but in stooping she seized the pellet which had escaped notice its colour being exactly like that of the dust and mud on the floor oh dear cried she it goes to my heart he is dying or seems to be replied the sergeant monsieur said asie to the lawyer take me at once to monsieur camusot i have come about this case and he might be very glad to see me before examining that poor priest the lawyer and the baroness left the guard-room with its greasy fuliginous walls but as soon as they reached the top of the stairs as he exclaimed oh and my dog my poor little dog and she rushed off like a mad creature down the salle des pas perdus asking every one where her dog was she got to the corridor beyond la galerie marchande or merchant's hall as it is called and flew to the staircase saying there he is these stairs lead to the cour de Allée, through which asie having played out the farce passed out and took a hackney cab on the quai des orfèvres where there is a stand thus she vanished with the summons requiring europe to appear her real name being unknown to the police
Section forty four of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter seven. As he could depend on the absolute secrecy of an old clothes purchaser known as Madame Nourrisson, who also called herself Madame de Saint Esteve, and who would lend as he not merely her personality but her shop at need, for it was there that Nucingen had bargained for the surrender of Esther. As he was quite at home there, for she had a bedroom in Madame Nourrisson's establishment she paid the driver and went up to her room nodding to madame nourrisson in a way to make her understand that she had not time to say two words to her as soon as she was safe from observation as he unwrapped the papers with the care of a savant unrolling a palimpsest after reading the instructions she thought it wise to copy the lines intended for lucien on a sheet of letter-paper then she went down to madame nourrisson to whom she talked while a little shop-girl went to fetch a cab from the boulevard des italiens she thus extracted the addresses of the duchesse de maufrigneuse and of madame de serizy which were known to madame nourrisson by her dealings with their maids all this running about and elaborate business took up more than two hours madame la duchesse de maufrigneuse who lived at the top of the faubourg st honore kept madame de saint esteve waiting an hour although the lady's maid after knocking at the boudoir door had handed in to her mistress a card with madame de saint esteve's name on which asie had written called about pressing business concerning lucien her first glance at the duchess's face showed her how ill-timed her visit must be she apologized for disturbing madame la duchesse when she was resting on the plea of the danger in which lucien stood who are you asked the duchess without any pretence at politeness as she looked at asie from head to foot for asie though she might be taken for a baroness by maitre massol in the salle des pas perdus when she stood on the carpet in the boudoir of the hotel de cadignan looked like a splash of mud on a white satin gown i am a dealer in cast-off clothes madame la duchesse for in such matters every lady applies to women whose business rests on a basis of perfect secrecy i have never betrayed anybody though god knows how many great ladies have entrusted their diamonds to me by the month while wearing false jewels made to imitate them exactly you have some other name said the duchess smiling at a reminiscence recalled to her by this reply yes madame la duchesse i am madame de saint esteve on great occasions but in the trade i am madame nourrisson well well said the duchess in an altered tone i am able to be of great service as he went on for we hear the husband's secrets as well as the wives i have done many little jobs for monsieur de marsay whom madame la duchesse that will do that will do cried the duchess what about lucien if you wish to save him madame you must have courage enough to lose no time in dressing but indeed madame la duchesse you could not look more charming than you do at this moment you are sweet enough to charm anybody take an old woman's word for it in short madame do not wait for your carriage but get into my hackney coach come to madame de serizy's if you hope to avert worse misfortunes than the death of that cherub go on i will follow you said the duchess after a moment's hesitation between us we may give leontine some courage notwithstanding the really demoniacal activity of this dorine of the hulks the clock was striking two when she and the duchesse de maufrigneuse went into the comtesse de serizy's house in the rue de la chaussee d'antin once there thanks to the duchess not an instant was lost 
the two women were at once shown up to the countess whom they found reclining on a couch in a miniature chalet surrounded by a garden fragrant with the rarest flowers that is well said asie looking about her no one can overhear us oh my dear i am half dead tell me diane what have you done cried the countess starting up like a fawn and seizing the duchess by the shoulders she melted into tears come come leontine there are occasions when women like us must not cry but act said the duchess forcing the countess to sit down on the sofa by her side as he studied the countess's face with the scrutiny peculiar to those old hands which pierces to the soul of a woman as certainly as a surgeon's instrument probes a wound jacques collin's ally at once discerned the stamp of one of the rarest feelings in a woman of the world real sorrow the sorrow that engraves ineradicable lines on the heart and on the features she was dressed without the least touch of vanity she was now forty-five and her printed muslin wrapper tumbled and untidy showed her bosom without any art or even stays her eyes were set in dark circles and her mottled cheeks showed the traces of bitter tears she wore no sash round her waist the embroidery on her petticoat and shift was all crumpled her hair knotted up under a lace cap had not been combed for four and twenty hours and showed as a thin short plate and ragged little curls leontine had forgotten to put on her false hair you are in love for the first time in your life said asie sententiously leontine then saw the woman and started with horror who is that my dear diane she asked of the duchesse de maufrigneuse whom should i bring with me but a woman who is devoted to lucien and willing to help us as he had hit the truth madame de serizy who was regarded as one of the most fickle of fashionable women had had an attachment of ten years standing for the marquis d'aglemont since the marquis's departure for the colonies she had gone wild about lucien and had won him from the duchesse de maufrigneuse knowing nothing like the paris world generally of lucien's passion for esther in the world of fashion a recognized attachment does more to ruin a woman's reputation than ten unconfessed liaisons how much more than two such attachments however as no one thought of madame de serizy as a responsible person the historian cannot undertake to speak for her virtue thus doubly dog's-eared she was fair of medium height and well preserved as a fair woman can be who is well preserved at all that is to say she did not look more than thirty being slender but not lean with a white skin and flaxen hair she had hands feet in the shape of aristocratic elegance and was as witty as all the ronquerolles spiteful therefore to women and good-natured to men her large fortune her husband's fine position and that of her brother the marquis de ronquerolles had protected her from the mortifications with which any other woman would have been overwhelmed she had this great merit that she was honest in her depravity and confessed her worship of the manners and customs of the regency now at forty-two this woman who had hitherto regarded men as no more than pleasing playthings to whom indeed she had strange to say granted much regarding love as merely a matter of sacrifice to gain the upper hand this woman on first seeing lucien had been seized with such a passion as the baron de nucingen's for esther she had loved as asie had just told her for the first time in her life this postponement of youth is more common with parisian women than might be supposed 
and causes the ruin of some virtuous souls just as they are reaching the haven of forty the duchesse de maufrigneuse was the only person in the secret of the vehement and absorbing passion of which the joys from the girlish suspicion of first love to the preposterous follies of fulfilment had made leontine half crazy and insatiable true love as we know is merciless the discovery of esther's existence had been followed by one of those outbursts of rage which in a woman rise even to the pitch of murder then came the phase of meanness to which a sincere affection humbles itself so gladly indeed for the last month the countess would have given ten years of her life to have lucien again for one week at last she had even resigned herself to accept esther as her rival just when the news of her lover's arrest had come like the last trump on this paroxysm of devotion the countess had nearly died of it her husband had himself nursed her in bed fearing the betrayal of delirium and for twenty-four hours she had been living with a knife in her heart she said to her husband in her fever save lucien and i will live henceforth for you alone indeed as madame la duchesse tells you it is of no use to make your eyes like boiled gooseberries cried the dreadful asie shaking the countess by the arm if you want to save him there is not a minute to lose he is innocent i swear it by my mother's bones yes yes of course he is cried the countess looking quite kindly at the dreadful old woman but as he went on if monsieur camusot questions him the wrong way he can make a guilty man of him with two sentences so if it is in your power to get the conciergerie opened to you and to say a few words to him go at once and give him this paper he will be released to-morrow i will answer for it now get him out of the scrape for you got him into it i yes you you fine ladies never have a sou even when you own millions when i allowed myself the luxury of keeping boys they always had their pockets full of gold their amusements amused me it is delightful to be mother and mistress in one now you you let the men you love die of hunger without asking any questions esther now made no speeches she gave at the cost of perdition soul and body the million your lucien was required to show and that is what has brought him to this pass poor girl did she do that i love her said leontine yes now said Essie, with freezing irony she was a real beauty but now my angel you are better looking than she is and lucien's marriage is so effectually broken off that nothing can mend it said the duchess in a whisper to leontine the effect of this revelation and forecast was so great on the countess that she was well again she passed her hand over her brow she was young once more now my lady hot foot and make haste said asie seeing the change and guessing what had caused it but said madame de maufrigneuse if the first thing is to prevent lucien's being examined by monsieur camusot we can do that by writing two words to the judge and sending your man with it to the palais Leon. Section forty five of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways, Chapter eight. 
this is what was taking place at the palais while lucien's protectresses were obeying the orders issued by jacques collin the gendarmes placed the moribund prisoner on a chair facing the window in monsieur camusot's room he was sitting in his place in front of his table coquart pen in hand had a little table to himself a few yards off the aspect of a magistrate's chambers is not a matter of indifference and if this room had not been chosen intentionally it must be owned that chance had favoured justice an examining judge like a painter requires the clear equable light of a north window for the criminal's face is a picture which he must constantly study hence most magistrates place their table as this of camusot's was arranged so as to sit with their back to the window and leave the face of the examinee in broad daylight not one of them all but by the end of six months has assumed an absent-minded and indifferent expression if he does not wear spectacles and maintains it throughout the examination it was a sudden change of expression in the prisoner's face detected by these means and caused by a sudden point-blank question that led to the discovery of the crime committed by castin at the very moment when after a long consultation with the public prosecutor the magistrate was about to let the criminal loose on society for lack of evidence this detail will show the least intelligent person how living interesting curious and dramatically terrible is the conflict of an examination a conflict without witnesses but always recorded god knows what remains on the paper of the scenes at white heat in which a look a tone a quiver of the features the faintest touch of colour lent by some emotion has been fraught with danger as though the adversaries were savages watching each other to plant a fatal stroke a report is no more than the ashes of the fire what is your real name camusot asked jacques collin don carlos herrera canon of the royal chapter of toledo and secret envoy of his majesty ferdinand the seventh it must here be observed that jacques collin spoke french like a spanish trollop blundering over it in such a way as to make his answers almost unintelligible and to require them to be repeated but monsieur de nucingen's german barbarisms have already waited this scene too much to allow of the introduction of other sentences no less difficult to read and hindering the rapid progress of the tale then you have papers to prove your right to the dignities of which you speak asked camusot yes monsieur my passport a letter from his catholic majesty authorizing my mission in short if you will but send at once to the spanish embassy two lines which i will write in your presence i shall be identified then if you wish for further evidence i will write to his eminence the high almoner of france and he will immediately send his private secretary and do you still pretend that you are dying asked the magistrate if you have really gone through all the sufferings you have complained of since your arrest you ought to be dead by this time said camusot ironically you are simply trying the courage of an innocent man and the strength of his constitution said the prisoner mildly coquart ring send for the prison doctor and an infirmary attendant we shall be obliged to remove your coat and proceed to verify the marks on your shoulder camusot went on i am in your hands monsieur the prisoner then inquired whether the magistrate would be kind enough to explain to him what he meant by the marks and why they should be sought on his shoulder the judge was prepared for this question you are suspected of being jacques collin an escaped convict whose daring shrinks at nothing not even at sacrilege said camusot promptly his eyes fixed on those of the prisoner jacques collin gave no sign and did not color 
he remained quite calm and assumed an air of guileless curiosity as he gazed at camusot i monsieur a convict may the order i belong to and god above forgive you for such an error tell me what i can do to prevent your continuing to offer such an insult to the rights of free men to the church and to the king my master the judge made no reply to this but explained to the abbe that if he had been branded a penalty at that time inflicted by law on all convicts sent to the hulks the letters could be made to show by giving him a slap on the shoulder oh monsieur said jacques collin it would indeed be unfortunate if my devotion to the royal cause should prove fatal to me explain yourself said the judge that is what you are here for well monsieur i must have a great many scars on my back for i was shot in the back as a traitor to my country while i was faithful to my king by constitutionalists who left me for dead you were shot and you are alive said camusot i had made friends with some of the soldiers to whom certain pious persons had sent money so they placed me so far off that only spent balls reached me and the men aimed at my back this is a fact that his excellency the ambassador can bear witness to this devil of a man has an answer for everything however so much the better thought camusot who assumed so much severity only to satisfy the demands of justice and of the police how is it that a man of your character he went on addressing the convict should have been found in the house of the baron de nucingen's mistress and such a mistress a girl who had been a common prostitute this is why i was found in a courtesan's house monsieur replied jacques collin but before telling you the reasons for my being there i ought to mention that at the moment when i was just going upstairs i was seized with the first attack of my illness and i had no time to speak to the girl i knew of mademoiselle esther's intention of killing herself and as young lucien de rubempre's interests were involved and i have a particular affection for him for sacredly secret reasons i was going to try to persuade the poor creature to give up the idea suggested to her by despair i meant to tell her that lucien must certainly fail in his last attempt to win mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu and i hoped that by telling her she had inherited seven millions of francs i might give her courage to live i am convinced monsieur le juge that i am a martyr to the secrets confided to me by the suddenness of my illness i believe that i had been poisoned that very morning but my strong constitution has saved me i know that a certain agent of the political police is dogging me and trying to entangle me in some discreditable business if at my request you had sent for a doctor on my arrival here you would have had ample proof of what i am telling you as to the state of my health believe me monsieur some persons far above our heads have some strong interest in getting me mistaken for some villain so as to have a right to get rid of me it is not all profit to serve a king they have their meannesses the church alone is faultless it is impossible to do justice to the play of jacques collin's countenance as he carefully spun out his speech sentence by sentence for ten minutes and it was all so plausible especially the mention of corentin that the lawyer was shaken will you confide to me the reasons of your affection for m lucien de rubempre can you not guess them i am sixty years of age monsieur i implore you do not write it it is because must i say it it will be to your own advantage and more particularly to monsieur lucien de rubempre's if you tell everything replied the judge 
because he is oh god he is my son he gasped out with an effort and he fainted away do not write that down cocar said camusot in an undertone cocar rose to fetch a little vial of four thieves vinegar if he is jacques collin he is a splendid actor thought camusot Gokar held the file under the convict's nose while the judge examined him with the keen eye of a lynx and the magistrate. "'Take his wig off,' said Camusot, after waiting till the man recovered consciousness. Jacques Collin heard and quaked with terror, for he knew how vile an expression his face would assume. "'If you have not strength enough to take your wig off yourself, yes, Gokar, remove it.' said camusot to his clerk jacques collin bent his head to the clerk with admirable resignation but then his head bereft of that adornment was hideous to behold in its natural aspect the sight of it left camusot in the greatest uncertainty while waiting for the doctor and the man from the infirmary he set to work to classify and examine the various papers and the objects seized in lucien's rooms after carrying out their functions in the rue saint georges at mademoiselle esther's house the police had searched the rooms at the quai malaquais you have your hand on some letters from the comtesse de serizy said carlos herrera but i cannot imagine why you should have almost all lucien's papers he added with a smile of overwhelming irony at the judge camusot as he saw the smile understood the bearing of the word almost lucien de rubempre is in custody under suspicion of being your accomplice said he watching to see the effect of this news on his examinee you have brought about a great misfortune for he is as innocent as i am replied the sham spaniard without betraying the smallest agitation we shall see we have not as yet established your identity camusot observed surprised at the prisoner's indifference if you are really don carlos herrera the position of lucien chardon will at once be completely altered to be sure she became madame chardon mademoiselle de rubempre murmured carlos ah that was one of the greatest sins of my life he raised his eyes to heaven and by the movement of his lips seemed to be uttering a fervent prayer but if you are jacques collin and if he was and knew that he was the companion of an escaped convict a sacrilegious wretch all the crimes of which he is suspected by the law are more than probably true carlos herrera sat like bronze as he heard this speech very cleverly delivered by the judge and his only reply to the words knew that he was and escaped convict was to lift his hands to heaven with a gesture of noble and dignified sorrow monsieur l'abbe camusot went on with the greatest politeness if you are don carlos herrera you will forgive us for what we are obliged to do in the interests of justice and truth jacques collin detected a snare in the lawyer's very voice as he spoke the words monsieur l'abbe the man's face never changed camusot had looked for a gleam of joy which might have been the first indication of his being a convict betraying the exquisite satisfaction of a criminal deceiving his judge but this hero of the hulks was strong in machiavellian dissimulation i am accustomed to diplomacy and i belong to an order of very austere discipline replied jacques collin with apostolic mildness i understand everything and am inured to suffering i should be free by this time if you had discovered in my room the hiding-place where i keep my papers for i see you have none but unimportant documents 
this was a finishing stroke to camusot jacques collin by his air of ease and simplicity had counteracted all the suspicions to which his appearance unwigged had given rise where are these papers i will tell you exactly if you will get a secretary from the spanish embassy to accompany your messenger he will take them and be answerable to you for the documents for it is to me a matter of confidential duty diplomatic secrets which would compromise his late majesty louis the eighteenth indeed monsieur it would be better however you are a magistrate and after all the ambassador to whom i refer the whole question must decide at this juncture the usher announced the arrival of the doctor and the infirmary attendant who came in good morning monsieur lebrun said camusot to the doctor i have sent for you to examine the state of health of this prisoner under suspicion he says he had been poisoned and at the point of death since the day before yesterday see if there is any risk in undressing him to look for the brand dr lebrun took jacques collin's hand felt his pulse asked to look at his tongue and scrutinized him steadily this inspection lasted about ten minutes the prisoner has been suffering severely said the medical officer but at this moment he is amazingly strong that spurious energy monsieur is due to nervous excitement caused by my strange position said jacques collin with the dignity of a bishop that is possible said monsieur lebrun at a sign from camusot the prisoner was stripped of everything but his trousers even of his shirt and the spectators might admire the hairy torso of a cyclops it was that of the farnese hercules at naples in its colossal exaggeration for what does nature intend a man of this build said lebrun to the judge the usher brought in the ebony staff which from time immemorial has been the insignia of his office and is called his rod he struck it several times over the place where the executioner had branded the fatal letters seventeen spots appeared irregularly distributed but the most careful scrutiny could not recognize the shape of any letters the usher indeed pointed out that the top bar of the letter t was shown by two spots with an interval between of the length of that bar between the two points at each end of it and there was another spot where the bottom of the t should be still that is quite uncertain said camusot seeing doubt in the expression of the prison doctor's countenance carlos begged them to make the same experiment on the other shoulder and the middle of his back about fifteen more such scars appeared which at the spaniard's request the doctor made a note of and he pronounced that the man's back had been so extensively seamed by wounds that the brand would not show even if it had been made by the executioner an office clerk now came in from the prefecture and handed a note to monsieur camusot requesting an answer after reading it the lawyer went to speak to coquart but in such a low voice that no one could catch a word only by a glance from camusot jacques collin could guess that some information concerning him had been sent by the prefet of police that friend of peyrade's is still at my heels thought jacques collin if only i knew him i would get rid of him as i did of contenson if only i could see asie once more after signing a paper written by coquart the judge put it into an envelope and handed it to the clerk of the delegate's office this is an indispensable auxiliary to justice it is under the direction of a police commissioner and consists of peace officers who with the assistance of the police commissioners of each district carry into effect orders for searching the houses or apprehending the persons of those who are suspected of complicity in crimes and felonies these functionaries in authority save the examining magistrates a great deal of very precious time at a sign from the judge 
the prisoner was dressed by monsieur le brun and the attendant who then withdrew with the usher camusot sat down at his table and played with his pen you have an aunt he suddenly said to jacques collin an aunt echoed don carlos herrera with amazement why monsieur i have no relations i am the unacknowledged son of the late duke of osuna but to himself he said they are burning an allusion to the game of hot cockles which is indeed a childlike symbol of the dreadful struggle between justice and the criminal pooh said camusot you still have an aunt living mademoiselle jacqueline collin whom you placed in esther's service under the eccentric name of asie jacques collin shrugged his shoulders with an indifference that was in perfect harmony with the cool curiosity he gave throughout to the judge's words while camusot studied him with cunning attention take care said camusot listen to me i am listening sir your aunt is a wardrobe dealer at the temple her business is managed by a demoiselle Pacard, the sister of a convict, herself a very good girl, known as La Romette. Justice is on the traces of your aunt, and in a few hours we shall have decisive evidence. The woman is wholly devoted to you. Pray go on, monsieur le juge, said Colin coolly, in answer to a pause. I am listening to you your aunt who is about five years older than you are was formerly marat's mistress of odious memory from that blood-stained source she derived the little fortune she possesses from information i have received she must be a very clever receiver of stolen goods for no proofs have yet been found to commit her on after marat's death she seems from the notes i have here to have lived with a chemist who was condemned to death in the year twelve for issuing false coin she was called as witness in the case it was from this intimacy that she derived her knowledge of poisons in eighteen twelve and in eighteen sixteen she spent two years in prison for placing girls under age upon the streets you were already convicted of forgery you had left the banking-house where your aunt had been able to place you as a clerk thanks to the education you had had and the favor enjoyed by your aunt with certain persons for whose debaucheries she supplied victims all this prisoner is not much like the dignity of the duke's dasuna do you persist in your denial Jacques Collin sat listening to M. Camusot, and thinking of his happy childhood at the College of the Oratorians, where he had been brought up, a meditation which lent him a truly amazed look. And in spite of his skill as a practised examiner, Camusot could bring no sort of expression to those placid features. "'If you have accurately recorded the account of myself I gave you at first, said jacques collin you can read it through again i cannot alter the facts i never went to the woman's house how should i know who her cook was the persons of whom you speak are utterly unknown to me notwithstanding your denial we shall proceed to confront you with persons who may succeed in diminishing your assurance a man who has been three times shot is used to anything replied jacques collin meekly camusot proceeded to examine the seized papers while awaiting the return of the famous bibi lupin whose expedition was amazing for at half past eleven the inquiry having begun at ten o'clock the usher came in to inform the judge in an undertone of bibi lupin's arrival show him in replied m camusot bibi lupin who had been expected to exclaim it is he as he came in stood puzzled he did not recognize his man in a face pitted with smallpox this hesitancy startled the magistrate 
it is his build his height said the agent oh yes it is you jacques collin he went on as he examined his eyes forehead and ears there are some things which no disguise can alter certainly it is he monsieur camusot jacques has the scar of a cut on his left arm take off his coat and you will see jacques collin was again obliged to take off his coat bibi lupin turned up his sleeve and showed the scar he had spoken of it is the scar of a bullet replied don carlos herrera here are several more ah it is certainly his voice cried bibi lupin your certainty said camusot is merely an opinion it is not proof i know that said bibi lupin with deference but i will bring witnesses one of the boarders from the maison Fouquier is here already said he with an eye on collin but the prisoner's set calm face did not move a muscle show the person in said camusot roughly his dissatisfaction betraying itself in spite of his seeming indifference this irritation was not lost on jacques collin who had not counted on the judge's sympathy and sat lost in apathy produced by his deep Section forty six of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways, Chapter Nine. The usher now showed in Madame Poiret. At this unexpected appearance, the prisoner had a slight shiver, but his trepidation was not remarked by Camusot who seemed to have made up his mind what is your name asked he proceeding to carry out the formalities introductory to all depositions and examinations madame poiret a little old woman as white and wrinkled as a sweetbread dressed in a dark blue silk gown gave her name as christine michel michonneau wife of one poiret and her age as fifty-one years said that she was born in paris lived in the rue des poules at the corner of the rue des postes and that her business was that of lodging-house keeper in eighteen eighteen and eighteen nineteen said the judge you lived madame in a boarding-house kept by a madame vauquer yes monsieur it was there that i met monsieur poiret a retired official who became my husband and whom i have nursed in his bed this twelve month past poor man he is very bad and i cannot be long away from him there was a certain vautrin in the house at the time asked camusot oh monsieur that is quite a long story he was a horrible man from the galleys you helped to get him arrested that is not true sir you are in the presence of the law be careful said monsieur camusot severely madame poiret was silent try to remember camusot went on do you recollect the man would you know him again i think so is this the man madame poiret put on her eye preservers and looked at the abbe carlos herrera it is his build his height and yet no if monsieur le juge she said if i could see his chest i should recognize him at once the magistrate and his clerk could not help laughing notwithstanding the gravity of their office jacques collin joined in their hilarity but discreetly the prisoner had not put on his coat after bibi lupin had removed it and at a sign from the judge he obligingly opened his shirt yes that is his fur trimming sure enough but it has worn gray monsieur vautrin cried madame poiret what have you to say to that asked the judge of the prisoner 
that she is mad replied jacques collin bless me if i had a doubt for his face is altered that voice would be enough he is the man who threatened me ah and those are his eyes the police agent and this woman said camusot speaking to jacques collin cannot possibly have conspired to say the same thing for neither of them had seen you till now how do you account for that justice has blundered more conspicuously even than it does now in accepting the evidence of a woman who recognizes a man by the hair on his chest and the suspicions of a police agent replied jacques collin i am said to resemble a great criminal in voice eyes and build that seems a little vague as to the memory which would prove certain relations between madame and my soci which she does not blush to own you yourself laughed at allow me monsieur in the interests of truth which i am far more anxious to establish for my own sake than you can be for the sake of justice to ask this lady madame foire poiret Poire, excuse me i am a spaniard whether she remembers the other persons who lived in this what did you call the house a boarding-house said madame poire i do not know what that is a house where you can dine and breakfast by subscription you are right said camusot with a favorable nod to jacques collin whose apparent good faith in suggesting means to arrive at some conclusion struck him greatly try to remember the boarders who were in the house when jacques collin was apprehended there were monsieur de rastignac dr bianchon pere goriot mademoiselle taillefer that will do said camusot steadily watching jacques collin whose expression did not change well about this pere goriot he is dead said madame poire monsieur said jacques collin i have several times met monsieur de rastignac a friend i believe of madame de nucingen's and if it is the same he certainly never supposed me to be the convict with whom these persons try to identify me monsieur de rastignac and dr bianchon said the magistrate both hold such a social position that their evidence if it is in your favor will be enough to procure your release coquart fill up a summons for each of them the formalities attending madame poiret's examination were over in a few minutes coquart read aloud to her the notes he had made of the little scene and she signed the paper but the prisoner refused to sign alleging his ignorance of the forms of french law that is enough for to-day said monsieur camusot you must be wanting food i will have you taken back to the conciergerie alas i am suffering too much to be able to eat said jacques collin camusot was anxious to time jacques collin's return to coincide with the prisoner's hour of exercise in the prison yard but he needed a reply from the governor of the conciergerie to the order he had given him in the morning and he rang for the usher the usher appeared and told him that the porter's wife from the house on the quai malaquais had an important document to communicate with reference to monsieur lucien de Rubempre. this was so serious a matter that it put camusot's intentions out of his head show her in said he beg your pardon pray excuse me gentlemen all said the woman curtsying to the judge and the abbe carlos by turns we were so worried by the law my husband and me the twice when it has marched into our house that we had forgotten a letter that was lying for monsieur lucien in our chest of drawers which we paid ten sous for it though it was posted in paris for it is very heavy sir would you please to pay me back the postage for god knows when we shall see our lodgers again was this letter handed to you by the postman 
asked camusot after carefully examining the envelope yes monsieur coquart write full notes of this deposition go on my good woman tell us your name and your business camusot made the woman take the oath and then he dictated the document while these formalities were being carried out he was scrutinizing the postmark which showed the hours of posting and delivery as well as the date of the day and this letter left for lucien the day after esther's death had beyond a doubt been written and posted on the day of the catastrophe m camusot's amazement may therefore be imagined when he read this letter written and signed by her whom the law believed to have been the victim of a crime esther to lucien monday may thirteenth eighteen thirty my last day ten in the morning my lucien i have not an hour to live at eleven o'clock i shall be dead and i shall die without a pang i have paid fifty thousand francs for a neat little black current containing a poison that will kill me with the swiftness of lightning and so my darling you may tell yourself my little esther had no suffering and yet i shall suffer in writing these pages the monster who has paid so dear for me knowing that the day when i should know myself to be his would have no morrow nucingen has just left me as drunk as a bear with his skin full of wind for the first and last time in my life i have had the opportunity of comparing my old trade as a street hussy with the life of true love of placing the tenderness which unfolds in the infinite above the horrors of a duty which longs to destroy itself and leave no room even for a kiss only such loathing could make death delightful i have taken a bath i should have liked to send for the father confessor of the convent where i was baptized to have confessed and washed my soul but i have had enough of prostitution it would be profaning a sacrament and besides i feel myself cleansed in the waters of sincere repentance god must do what he will with me but enough of all this maudlin for you i want to be your esther to the last moment not to bore you with my death or the future or god who is good and who would not be good if he were to torture me in the next world when i have endured so much misery in this i have before me your beautiful portrait painted by madame de mirbel that sheet of ivory used to comfort me in your absence i look at it with rapture as i write you my last thoughts and tell you of the last throbbing of my heart i shall enclose the miniature in this letter for i cannot bear that it should be stolen or sold the mere thought that what has been my great joy may lie behind a shop window mixed up with the ladies and officers of the empire or a parcel of chinese absurdities is a small death to me destroy that picture my sweetheart wipe it out never give it to any one unless indeed the gift might win back the heart of that walking well-dressed maypole that clotilde de grandlieu who will make you black and blue in her sleep her bones are so sharp yes to that i consent and then i shall still be of some use to you as when i was alive oh to give you pleasure or only to make you laugh i would have stood over a brazier with an apple in my mouth to cook it for you so my death even will be of service to you i should have marred your home oh that clotilde i cannot understand her she might have been your wife have borne your name have never left you day or night have belonged to you and she could make difficulties only the faubourg saint-germain can do that and yet she has not ten pounds of flesh on her bones poor lucien dear ambitious failure i am thinking of your future life well well 
you will more than once regret your poor faithful dog the good girl who would fly to serve you who would have been dragged into a police court to secure your happiness whose only occupation was to think of your pleasures and invent new ones and who is so full of love for you in her hair her feet her ears your ballerina in short whose every look was a benediction who for six years has thought of nothing but you who was so entirely your chattel that i have never been anything but an effluence of your soul as light is that of the sun however for lack of money and of honour i can never be your wife i have at any rate provided for your future by giving you all i have come as soon as you get this letter and take what you find under my pillow for i do not trust the people about me understand that i mean to look beautiful when i am dead i shall go to bed and lay myself flat in an attitude why not then i shall break the little pill against the roof of my mouth and shall not be disfigured by any convulsion or by a ridiculous position madame de serizy has quarrelled with you i know because of me but when she hears that i am dead you see dear pet she will forgive make it up with her and she will find you a suitable wife if the grandlieus persist in their refusal my dear i do not want you to grieve too much when you hear of my death to begin with i must tell you that the hour of eleven on monday morning the thirteenth of may is only the end of a long illness which began on the day when on the terrace of st germain you threw me back on my former line of life the soul may be sick as the body is but the soul cannot submit stupidly to suffering like the body the body does not uphold the soul as the soul upholds the body and the soul sees a means of cure in the reflection which leads to the needlewoman's resource the bushel of charcoal you gave me a whole life the day before yesterday when you said that if clotilde still refused you you would marry me it would have been a great misfortune for us both i should have been still more dead so to speak for there are more and less bitter deaths the world would never have recognized us for two months past i have been thinking of many things i can tell you a poor girl is in the mire as i was before i went into the convent men think her handsome they make her serve their pleasure without thinking any consideration necessary they pack her off on foot after fetching her in a carriage if they do not spit in her face it is only because her beauty preserves her from such indignity but morally speaking they do worse well and if this despised creature were to inherit five or six millions of francs she would be courted by princes bowed to with respect as she went past in her carriage and might choose among the oldest names in france and navarre the world which would have cried raca to us on seeing two handsome creatures united and happy always did honour to madame de stahl in spite of her romances in real life because she had two hundred thousand francs a year the world which grovels before money or glory will not bow down before happiness or virtue for i could have done good oh how many tears i would have dried as many as i have shed i believe yes i would have lived only for you and for charity these are the thoughts that make death beautiful so do not lament my dear say often to yourself there were two good creatures two beautiful creatures who both died for me ungrudgingly and who adored me keep a memory in your heart of coralie and esther and go your way and prosper 
do you recollect the day when you pointed out to me a shrivelled old woman in a melon green bonnet and a puce wrapper all over black grease spots the mistress of a poet before the revolution hardly thawed by the sun though she was sitting against the wall of the tuileries and fussing over a pug the vilest of pugs she had had footmen and carriages you know and a fine house and i said to you then how much better to be dead at thirty well you thought i was melancholy and you played all sorts of pranks to amuse me and between two kisses i said every day some pretty woman leaves the play before it is over and i do not want to see the last piece that is all you must think me a great chatterbox but this is my last effusion i write as if i were talking to you and i like to talk cheerfully i have always had a horror of a dressmaker pitying herself you know i knew how to die decently once before on my return from that fatal opera ball where the men said i had been a prostitute no no my dear love never give this portrait to any one if you could know with what a gush of love i have sat losing myself in your eyes looking at them with rapture during a pause i allowed myself you would feel as you gathered up the affection with which i have tried to overlay the ivory that the soul of your little pet is indeed there a dead woman craving alms that is a funny idea come i must learn to lie quiet in my grave you have no idea how heroic my death would seem to some fools if they could know nussingen last night offered me two millions of francs if i would love him as i love you he will be handsomely robbed when he hears that i have kept my word and died of him i tried all i could still to breathe the air you breathe i said to the fat scoundrel do you want me to love you as you wish to promise even that i will never see lucien again what must i do he asked give me the two millions for him you should have seen his face i could have laughed if it had not been so tragical for me spare yourself the trouble of refusing said i i see you care more for your two millions than for me a woman is always glad to know at what she is valued and i turned my back on him in a few hours the old rascal will know that i was not in jest who will part your hair as nicely as i do Pooh, i will think no more of anything in life i have but five minutes i give them to god do not be jealous of him dear heart i shall speak to him of you beseeching him for your happiness as the price of my death and my punishment in the next world i am vexed enough at having to go to hell i should have liked to see the angels to know if they are like you good-bye my darling good-bye i give you all the blessing of my woes even in the grave i am your esther it is striking eleven i have said my last prayers i am going to bed to die once more farewell i wish that the warmth of my hand could leave my soul there where i press a last kiss and once more i must call you my dearest love Section 47 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 10. A vague feeling of jealousy tightened on the magistrate's heart as he read this letter, 
the only letter from a suicide he had ever found written with such lightness though it was a feverish lightness and the last effort of a blind affection what is there in the man that he should be loved so well thought he saying what every man says who has not the gift of attracting women if you can prove not only that you are not jacques collin and an escaped convict but that you are in fact don carlos herrera canon of toledo and secret envoy of his majesty ferdinand the seventh said he addressing the prisoner you will be released for the impartiality demanded by my office requires me to tell you that i have this moment received a letter written by mademoiselle esther gobseck in which she declares her intention of killing herself and expresses suspicions as to her servants which would seem to point to them as the thieves who have made off with the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs as he spoke m camusot was comparing the writing of the letter with that of the will and it seemed to him self-evident that the same person had written both monsieur you were in too great a hurry to believe in a murder do not be too hasty in believing in a theft hein said camusot scrutinizing the prisoner with a piercing eye do not suppose that i am compromising myself by telling you that the sum may possibly be recovered said jacques collin making the judge understand that he saw his suspicions that poor girl was much loved by those about her and if i were free i would undertake to search for this money which no doubt belongs to the being i love best in the world to lucien will you allow me to read that letter it will not take long it is evidence of my dear boy's innocence you cannot fear that i shall destroy it nor that i shall talk about it i am in solitary confinement in confinement you will be so no longer cried the magistrate it is i who must beg you to get well as soon as possible refer to your ambassador if you choose and he handed the letter to jacques collin camusot was glad to be out of a difficulty to be able to satisfy the public prosecutor mesdames de maufrigneuse and de serizy nevertheless he studied his prisoner's face with cold curiosity while collin read esther's letter in spite of the apparent genuineness of the feelings it expressed he said to himself but it is a face worthy of the hulks all the same that is the way to love said jacques collin returning the letter and he showed camusot a face bathed in tears if only you knew him he went on so youthful so innocent a soul so splendidly handsome a child a poet the impulse to sacrifice oneself to him is irresistible to satisfy his lightest wish that dear boy is so fascinating when he chooses and so said the magistrate making a final effort to discover the truth you cannot possibly be jacques collin no monsieur replied the convict and jacques collin was more entirely don carlos herrera than ever in his anxiety to complete his work he went up to the judge led him to the window and gave himself the airs of a prince of the church assuming a confidential tone i am so fond of that boy monsieur that if it were needful to spare that idol of my heart a mere discomfort even that i should be the criminal you take me for i would surrender said he in an undertone i would follow the example of the poor girl who has killed herself for his benefit and i beg you monsieur to grant me a favour namely to set lucien at liberty forthwith my duty forbids it said camusot very good-naturedly but if a sinner may make a compromise with heaven justice too has its softer side and if you can give me sufficient reasons speak your words will not be taken down well then 
jacques collin went on taken in by camusot's apparent goodwill i know what that poor boy is suffering at this moment he is capable of trying to kill himself when he finds himself a prisoner oh as to that said camusot with a shrug you do not know whom you will oblige by obliging me added jacques collin trying to harp on another string you will be doing a service to others more powerful than any comtesse de serizy or duchesse de maufrigneuse who will never forgive you for having had their letters in your chambers and he pointed to two packets of perfumed papers my order has a good memory monsieur said camusot that is enough you must find better reasons to give me i am as much interested in the prisoner as in public vengeance believe me then i know lucien he has a soul of a woman of a poet and a southerner without persistency or will said jacques collin who fancied that he saw that he had won the judge over you are convinced of the young man's innocence do not torture him do not question him give him that letter tell him that he is esther's heir and restore him to freedom if you act otherwise you will bring despair on yourself whereas if you simply release him i will explain to you keep me still in solitary confinement to-morrow or this evening everything that may strike you as mysterious in the case and the reasons for the persecution of which i am the object but it will be at the risk of my life a price has been set on my head these six years past lucien free rich and married to clotilde de grandlieu and my task on earth will be done i shall no longer try to save my skin my persecutor was a spy under your late king what corentin ah is his name corentin thank you monsieur well will you promise to do as i ask you a magistrate can make no promises coquart tell the usher and the gendarmes to take the prisoner back to the conciergerie i will give orders that you are to have a private room he added pleasantly with a slight nod to the convict struck by jacques collin's request and remembering how he had insisted that he wished to be examined first as a privilege to his state of health camusot's suspicions were aroused once more allowing his vague doubts to make themselves heard he noticed that the self-styled dying man was walking off with the strength of a hercules having abandoned all the tricks he had aped so well on appearing before the magistrate monsieur jacques collin turned round notwithstanding your refusal to sign the document my clerk will read you the minutes of your examination the prisoner was evidently in excellent health the readiness with which he came back and sat down by the clerk was a fresh light to the magistrate's mind you have got well very suddenly said camusot caught thought jacques collin and he replied joy monsieur is the only panacea that letter the proof of innocence of which i had no doubt these are the grand remedy the judge kept a meditative eye on the prisoner when the usher and the gendarmes again took him in charge then with a start like a waking man he tossed esther's letter across to the table where his clerk sat saying coquart copy that letter if it is natural to man to be suspicious as to some favor required of him when it is antagonistic to his interests or his duty and sometimes even when it is a matter of indifference this feeling is law to an examining magistrate the more this prisoner whose identity was not yet ascertained pointed to clouds on the horizon in the event of lucien's being examined the more necessary did the interrogatory seem to camusot 
even if this formality had not been required by the code and by common practice it was indispensable as bearing on the identification of the abbe carlos there is in every walk of life the business conscience in default of curiosity camusot would have examined lucien as he had examined jacques collin with all the cunning which the most honest magistrate allows himself to use in such cases the services he might render and his own promotion were secondary in camusot's mind to his anxiety to know or guess the truth even if he should never tell it he stood drumming on the window-pane while following the river-like current of his conjectures for in these moods thought is like a stream flowing through many countries magistrates in love with truth are like jealous women they give way to a thousand hypotheses and probe them with the dagger point of suspicion as the sacrificing priest of old eviscerated his victims thus they arrive not perhaps at truth but at probability and at last see the truth beyond a woman cross-questions the man she loves as the judge cross-questions a criminal in such a frame of mind a glance a word a tone of voice the slightest hesitation is enough to certify the hidden fact treason or crime the style in which he depicted his devotion to his son if he is his son is enough to make me think that he was in the girl's house to keep an eye on the plunder and never suspecting that the dead woman's pillow covered a will he no doubt annexed for his son the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs as a precaution that is why he can promise to recover the money Monsieur de rubempre owes it to himself and to justice to account for his father's position in the world and he offers me the protection of his order his order if i do not examine lucien as has been seen a magistrate conducts an examination exactly as he thinks proper he is at liberty to display his acumen or be absolutely blunt an examination may be everything or nothing therein lies the favor camusot rang the usher had returned he was sent to fetch m lucien de rubempre with an injunction to prohibit his speaking to anybody on his way up it was by this time two in the afternoon there is some secret said the judge to himself and that secret must be very important my amphibious friend since he is neither priest nor secular nor convict nor spaniard though he wants to hinder his protege from letting out something dreadful argues thus the poet is weak and effeminate he is not like me a hercules in diplomacy and you will easily wring our secret from him well we will get everything out of this innocent and he sat tapping the edge of his table with the ivory paper-knife while coquart copied esther's letter how whimsical is the action of our faculties camusot conceived of every crime as possible and overlooked the only one that the prisoner had now committed the forgery of the will for lucien's advantage let those whose envy vents itself on magistrates think for a moment of their life spent in perpetual suspicion of the torments these men must inflict on their minds for civil cases are not less tortuous than criminal examinations and it will occur to them perhaps that the priest and the lawyer wear an equally heavy coat of mail equally furnished with spikes in the lining Section 48 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter 11. It was about two o'clock when Monsieur Camusot saw Lucien de Rubempre come in, pale, worn, his eyes red and swollen, in short, in a state of dejection, which enabled the magistrate to compare nature with art, the really dying man with the stage performance. His walk from the conciergerie to the judge's chambers between two gendarmes and preceded by the usher had put the crowning touch to Lucien's despair. It is the poet's nature to prefer execution to condemnation. As he saw this being so completely bereft of the moral courage which is the essence of a judge and which the last prisoner had so strongly manifested, M. Camusot disdained the easy victory, and this scorn enabled him to strike a decisive blow, since it left him on the ground that horrible clearness of mind which the marksman feels when he is firing at a puppet. Collect yourself, M. de Rubempre. You are in the presence of a magistrate who is eager to repair the mischief done involuntarily by the law when a man is taken into custody on suspicion that has no foundation. I believe you to be innocent, and you will soon be at liberty. Here is the evidence of your innocence. It is a letter kept for you during your absence by your porter's wife. She has just brought it here. In the commotion caused by the visitation of justice and the news of your arrest at Fontainebleau, the woman forgot the letter, which was written by Mademoiselle Esther Gobseck. Read it. Lucien took the letter, read it, and melted into tears. He sobbed and could not say a single word. At the end of a quarter of an hour, during which Lucien with great difficulty recovered his self-command, the clerk laid before him the copy of the letter and begged him to sign a footnote certifying that the copy was faithful to the original and might be used in its stead on all occasions in the course of this preliminary inquiry giving him the option of comparing the two but lucien of course took coquart's word for its accuracy monsieur said the lawyer with friendly good nature it is nevertheless impossible that i should release you without carrying out the legal formalities and asking you some questions it is almost as a witness that i require you to answer to such a man as you i think it is almost unnecessary to point out that the oath to tell the whole truth is not in this case a mere appeal to your conscience but a necessity for your own sake your position having been for a time somewhat ambiguous. The truth can do you no harm, be what it may. Falsehood will send you to trial, and compel me to send you back to the conciergerie, whereas if you answer fully to my questions, you will sleep to-night in your own house, and be rehabilitated by this paragraph in the papers. Monsieur de Rubempre, who was arrested yesterday at Fontainebleau, was set at liberty after a very brief examination this speech made a deep impression on lucien and the judge seeing the temper of his prisoner added i may repeat to you that you were suspected of being accessory to the murder by poison of this demoiselle esther her suicide is clearly proved and there is an end of that but a sum of seven hundred and fifty thousand francs has been stolen which she had disposed of by will and you are the legatee this is a felony the crime was perpetrated before the discovery of the will now there is reason to suppose that a person who loves you as much as you loved mademoiselle esther committed the theft for your benefit do not interrupt me Camusot went on, seeing that Lucien was about to speak, and commanding silence by a gesture. I am asking you nothing so far. I am anxious to make you understand how deeply your honor is concerned in this question. 
give up the false and contemptible notion of the honour binding two accomplices and tell the whole truth the reader must already have observed the extreme disproportion of the weapons in this conflict between the prisoner under suspicion and the examining judge absolute denial when skilfully used has in its favour its positive simplicity and sufficiently defends the criminal but it is in a way a coat of mail which becomes crushing as soon as the stiletto of cross-examination finds a joint to it as soon as mere denial is ineffectual in face of certain proven facts the examinee is entirely at the judge's mercy now supposing that a sort of half criminal like lucien might if he were saved from the first shipwreck of his honesty amend his ways and become a useful member of society he will be lost in the pitfalls of his examination the judge has the driest possible record drawn up of the proceedings a faithful analysis of the questions and answers but no trace remains of his insidiously paternal addresses or his captious remonstrances such as this speech the judges of the superior courts see the results but see nothing of the means hence as some experienced persons have thought it would be a good plan that as in england a jury should hear the examination for a short while france enjoyed the benefit of this system under the code of brumaire of the year four this body was known as the examining jury as distinguished from the trying jury as to the final trial if we should restore the examining jury it would have to be the function of the superior courts without the aid of a jury and now said camusot after a pause what is your name attention monsieur coquart said he to the clerk lucien chardon de rubempre and you were born at angouleme and lucien named the day month and year you inherited no fortune none whatever and yet during your first residence in paris you spent a great deal as compared with your small income yes monsieur but at that time i had a most devoted friend in mademoiselle coralie and i was so unhappy as to lose her it was my grief at her death that made me return to my country home that is right monsieur said camusot i commend your frankness it will be thoroughly appreciated lucien it will be seen was prepared to make a clean breast of it on your return to paris you lived even more expensively than before camusot went on you lived like a man who might have about sixty thousand francs a year yes monsieur who supplied you with the money my protector the abbe carlos herrera where did you meet him we met when travelling just as i was about to be quit of life by committing suicide you never heard him spoken of by your family by your mother never can you remember the year and the month when you first became connected with mademoiselle esther towards the end of eighteen twenty three at a small theatre on the boulevard at first she was an expense to you yes monsieur lately in the hope of marrying mademoiselle de grandlieu you purchased the ruins of the chateau de rubempre you added land to the value of a million francs and you told the family of grandlieu that your sister and your brother-in-law had just come into a considerable fortune and that their liberality had supplied you with the money did you tell the grandlieus this monsieur yes monsieur you do not know the reason why the marriage was broken off not in the least monsieur 
well the grandlieus sent one of the most respectable attorneys in paris to see your brother-in-law and inquire into the facts at angouleme this lawyer from the statements of your sister and brother-in-law learned that they not only had hardly lent you any money but also that their inheritance consisted of land of some extent no doubt but that the whole amount of invested capital was not more than about two hundred thousand francs now you cannot wonder that such people as the grandlieus should reject a fortune of which the source is more than doubtful this monsieur is what a lie has led to lucien was petrified by this revelation and the little presence of mind he had preserved deserted him remember said camusot that the police and the law know all they want to know and now he went on recollecting jacques collin's assumed paternity do you know who this pretended carlo serrera is yes monsieur but i knew it too late too late how explain yourself he is not a priest not a spaniard he is an escaped convict said the judge eagerly yes replied lucien when he told me the fatal secret i was already under obligations to him i had fancied i was befriended by a respectable priest jacques collin said m camusot beginning a sentence yes said lucien his name is jacques collin very good jacques collin has just now been identified by another person and though he denies it he does so i believe in your interest but i asked whether you knew who the man is in order to prove another of jacques collin's impostures lucien felt as though he had hot iron in his inside as he heard this alarming statement do you not know camusot went on that in order to give color to the extraordinary affection he has for you he declares that he is your father he my father oh monsieur did he tell you that have you any suspicion of where the money came from that he used to give you for if i am to believe the evidence of the letter you have in your hand that poor girl mademoiselle esther must have done you lately the same services as coralie formerly rendered you still for some years as you have just admitted you lived very handsomely without receiving anything from her it is i who should ask you monsieur whence convicts get their money jacques collin my father oh my poor mother and lucien burst into tears coquart read out to the prisoner that part of carlos herrera's examination in which he said that lucien de rubempre was his son the poet listened in silence and with a look that was terrible to behold i am done for he cried a man is not done for who is faithful to the path of honor and truth said the judge but you will commit jacques collin for trial said lucien undoubtedly said camusot who aimed at making lucien talk speak out but in spite of all his persuasion and remonstrances lucien would say no more reflection had come too late as it does to all men who are the slaves of impulse there lies the difference between the poet and the man of action one gives way to feeling to reproduce it in living images his judgment comes in after the other feels and judges both at once lucien remained pale and gloomy he saw himself at the bottom of the precipice down which the examining judge had rolled him by the apparent candor which had entrapped his poet's soul he had betrayed not his benefactor but an accomplice who had defended their position with the courage of a lion and a skill that showed no flaw where jacques collin had saved everything by his daring lucien the man of brains 
had lost all by his lack of intelligence and reflection this infamous lie against which he revolted had screened a yet more infamous truth utterly confounded by the judge's skill overpowered by his cruel dexterity by the swiftness of the blows he had dealt him while making use of the errors of a life laid bare as probes to search his conscience lucien sat like an animal which the butcher's pole-axe had failed to kill free and innocent when he came before the judge in a moment his own avowal had made him feel criminal to crown all as a final grave irony camusot cold and calm pointed out to lucien that his self-betrayal was the result of a misapprehension camusot was thinking of jacques collin's announcing himself as lucien's father while lucien wholly absorbed by his fear of seeing his confederacy with an escaped convict made public had imitated the famous inadvertency of the murderers of ibicus one of royer collard's most famous achievements was proclaiming the constant triumph of natural feeling over engrafted sentiments and defending the cause of anterior oaths by asserting that the law of hospitality for instance ought to be regarded as binding to the point of negativing the obligation of a judicial oath he promulgated this theory in the face of the world from the french tribune he boldly upheld conspirators showing that it was human to be true to friendship rather than to the tyrannical laws brought out of the social arsenal to be adjusted to circumstances and indeed natural rights have laws which have never been codified but which are more effectual and better known than those laid down by society lucien had misapprehended to his cost the law of cohesion which required him to be silent and leave jacques collin to protect himself nay more he had accused him in his own interests the man ought always to be to him carlos herrera monsieur camusot was rejoicing in his triumph he had secured two criminals he had crushed with the hand of justice one of the favorites of fashion and he had found the undiscoverable jacques collin he would be regarded as one of the cleverest of examining judges so he left his prisoner in peace but he was studying this speechless consternation and he saw drops of sweat collect on the miserable face swell and fall mingled with two streams of tears why should you weep monsieur de rubempre you are as i have told you mademoiselle esther's legatee she having no heirs nor near relations and her property amounts to nearly eight millions of francs if the lost seven hundred and fifty thousand francs are recovered this was the last blow to the poor wretch if you do not lose your head for ten minutes jacques collin had said in his note and lucien by keeping cool would have gained all his desire he might have paid his debt to jacques collin and have cut him adrift have been rich and have married mademoiselle de grandlieu nothing could more eloquently demonstrate the power with which the examining judge is armed as a consequence of the isolation or separation of persons under suspicion or the value of such a communication as asie had conveyed to jacques collin ah monsieur replied lucien with the satirical bitterness of a man who makes a pedestal of his utter overthrow how appropriate is the phrase in legal slang to undergo examination for my part if i had to choose between the physical torture of past ages and the moral torture of our day i would not hesitate to prefer the sufferings inflicted of old by the executioner what more do you want of me he added haughtily in this place monsieur said the magistrate answering the poet's pride with mocking arrogance i alone have a right to ask questions 
i had the right to refuse to answer them muttered the hapless lucien whose wits had come back to him with perfect lucidity coquart read the minutes to the prisoner i am the prisoner once more said lucien to himself while the clerk was reading lucien came to a determination which compelled him to smooth down m camusot when coquart's drone ceased the poet started like a man who has slept through a noise to which his ears are accustomed and who is roused by its cessation you have to sign the report of your examination said the judge and am i at liberty asked lucien ironical in his turn not yet said camusot but to-morrow after being confronted with jacques collin you will no doubt be free justice must now ascertain whether or no you are accessory to the crimes this man may have committed since his escape so long ago as eighteen twenty however you are no longer in the secret cells i will write to the governor to give you a better room shall i find writing materials you can have anything supplied to you that you ask for i will give orders to that effect by the usher who will take you back lucien mechanically signed the minutes and initialed the notes in obedience to coquart's indications with the meekness of a resigned victim a single fact will show what a state he was in better than the minutest description the announcement that he would be confronted with jacques collin had at once dried the drops of sweat from his brow and his dry eyes glittered with a terrible light in short he became in an instant as brief as a lightning flash what jacques collin was a man of iron in men whose nature is like lucien's a nature which jacques collin had so thoroughly fathomed these sudden transitions from a state of absolute demoralization to one that is so to speak metallic so extreme is the tension of every vital force are the most startling phenomena of mental vitality the will surges up like the lost waters of a spring it diffuses itself throughout the machinery that lies ready for the action of the unknown matter that constitutes it and then the corpse is a man again and the man rushes on full of energy for a supreme struggle lucien laid esther's letter next his heart with the miniature she had returned to him then he haughtily bowed to m camusot and went off with a firm step down the corridors between two gendarmes that is a deep scoundrel said the judge to his clerk to avenge himself for the crushing scorn the poet had displayed he thought he might save himself by betraying his accomplice of the two said coquart timidly the convict is the most thorough paced you are free for the rest of the day coquart said the lawyer we have done enough send away any case that is waiting to be called to-morrow ah and you must go at once to the public prosecutor's chambers and ask if he is still there if so ask him if he can give me a few minutes yes he will not be gone he added looking at a common clock in a wooden Section forty nine of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways, Chapter Twelve. These examinations, which are so quickly read, being written down at full length, questions and answers alike, take up an enormous amount of time this is one of the reasons of the slowness of these preliminaries to a trial and of these imprisonments on suspicion to the poor this is ruin to the rich it is disgrace 
to them only immediate release can in any degree repair so far as possible the disaster of an arrest this is why the two scenes here related had taken up the whole of the time spent by asie in deciphering her master's orders in getting a duchess out of her boudoir and putting some energy into madame de serizy at this moment camusot who was anxious to get the full benefit of his cleverness took the two documents read them through and promised himself that he would show them to the public prosecutor and take his opinion on them during this meditation the usher came back to tell him that madame la comtesse de serizy's manservant insisted on speaking with him at a nod from camusot a servant out of livery came in looked first at the usher and then at the magistrate and said i have the honor of speaking to monsieur camusot yes replied the lawyer and his clerk camusot took the note which the servant offered him and read as follows for the sake of many interests which will be obvious to you my dear camusot do not examine monsieur de rubempre we have brought ample proofs of his innocence that he may be released forthwith d de maufrigneuse l de serizy p s burn this note camusot understood at once that he had blundered preposterously in laying snares for lucien and he began by obeying the two fine ladies he lighted a taper and burned the letter written by the duchess the man bowed respectfully then madame de serizy is coming here asked camusot the carriage is being brought round at this moment coquart came in to tell monsieur camusot that the public prosecutor expected him oppressed by the blunder he had committed in view of his ambitions though to the better ends of justice the lawyer in whom seven years experience had perfected the sharpness that comes to a man who in his practice has had to measure his wits against the grisettes of paris was anxious to have some shield against the resentment of two women of fashion the taper in which he had burned the note was still alight and he used it to seal up the duchesse de maufrigneuse's notes to lucien about thirty in all and madame de serizy's somewhat voluminous correspondence then he waited on the public prosecutor the palais de justice is a perplexing maze of buildings piled one above another some fine and dignified others very mean the whole disfigured by its lack of unity the salle des pas perdus is the largest known hall but its nakedness is hideous and distresses the eye this vast cathedral of the law crushes the supreme court the galerie marchande ends in two drain-like passages from this corridor there is a double staircase a little larger than that of the criminal courts and under it a large double door the stairs lead down to one of the assize courts and the doors open into another in some years the number of crimes committed in the circuit of the seine is great enough to necessitate the sitting of two benches close by are the public prosecutor's offices the attorney's room and library the chambers of the attorney-general and those of the public prosecutor's deputies all these purlieus to use a generic term communicate by narrow spiral stairs and the dark passages which are a disgrace to the architecture not of paris only but of all france the interior arrangement of the sovereign court of justice outdoes our prisons in all that is most hideous the writer describing our manners and customs would shrink from the necessity of depicting the squalid corridor of about a metre in width in which the witnesses wait in the superior criminal court as to the stove which warms the court itself it would disgrace a cafe on the boulevard montparnasse the public prosecutor's private room forms part of an octagon wing flanking the galerie marchande built out recently in regard to the age of the structure over the prison yard outside the women's quarters 
all this part of the palais is overshadowed by the lofty and noble edifice of the sainte chapelle and all is solemn and silent m de granville a worthy successor of the great magistrates of the ancient parlement would not leave paris without coming to some conclusion in the matter of lucien he expected to hear from camusot and the judge's message had plunged him into the involuntary suspense which waiting produces on even the strongest minds he had been sitting in the window-bay of his private room he rose and walked up and down for having lingered in the morning to intercept camusot he had found him dull of apprehension he was vaguely uneasy and worried and this was why the dignity of his high functions forbade his attempting to fetter the perfect independence of the inferior judge and yet this trial nearly touched the honor and good name of his best friend and warmest supporter the comte de serizy minister of state member of the privy council vice-president of the state council and prospective chancellor of the realm in the event of the death of the noble old man who held that august office it was m de serizy's misfortune to adore his wife through fire and water and he always shielded her with his protection now the public prosecutor fully understood the terrible fuss that would be made in the world and at court if a crime should be proved against a man whose name had been so often and so malignantly linked with that of the countess ah he sighed folding his arms formerly the supreme authority could take refuge in an appeal nowadays our mania for equality he dared not say for legality as a poetic orator in the chamber courageously admitted a short while since is the death of us this noble magistrate knew all the fascination and the miseries of an illicit attachment esther and lucien as we have seen had taken the rooms where the comte de granville had lived secretly on connubial terms with mademoiselle de bellefeuille and whence she had fled one day lured away by a villain see a double marriage at the very moment when the public prosecutor was saying to himself camusot is sure to have done something silly the examining magistrate knocked twice at the door of his room well my dear camusot how is that case going on that i spoke of this morning badly monsieur le comte read and judge for yourself he held out the minutes of the two examinations to monsieur de granville who took up his eyeglass and went to the window to read them he had soon run through them you have done your duty said the count in an agitated voice it is all over the law must take its course you have shown so much skill that you need never fear being deprived of your appointment as examining judge if m de granville had said to camusot you will remain an examining judge to your dying day he could not have been more explicit than in making this polite speech camusot was cold in the very marrow madame la duchesse de maufrigneuse to whom i owe much had desired me oh yes the duchesse de maufrigneuse is madame de serizy's friend said granville interrupting him to be sure you have allowed nothing to influence you i perceive and you did well sir you will be a great magistrate at this instant the comte octave de bauvin opened the door without knocking and said to the comte de granville i have brought you a fair lady my dear fellow who did not know which way to turn she was on the point of losing herself in our labyrinth and comte octave led in by the hand the comtesse de serizy who had been wandering about the place for the last quarter of an hour what you here madame exclaimed the public prosecutor pushing forward his own armchair and at this moment this madame is monsieur camusot he added introducing the judge bauvin 
said he to the distinguished ministerial orator of the restoration wait for me in the president's chambers he is still there and i will join you comte octave de bauvan understood that not merely was he in the way but that monsieur de granville wanted an excuse for leaving his room madame de serizy had not made the mistake of coming to the palais de justice in her handsome carriage with a blue hammer-cloth and coats of arms her coachman in gold lace and two footmen in breeches and silk stockings just as they were starting asie impressed on the two great ladies the need for taking the hackney coach in which she and the duchess had arrived and she had likewise insisted on lucien's mistress adopting the costume which is to women what a grey cloak was of yore to men the countess wore a plain brown dress an old black shawl and a velvet bonnet from which the flowers had been removed and the whole covered up under a thick lace veil you received our note said she to camusot whose dismay she mistook for respectful admiration alas but too late madame la comtesse replied the lawyer whose tact and wit failed him excepting in his chambers and in presence of the prisoner too late how she looked at monsieur de granville and saw consternation written in his face it cannot be it must not be too late she added in the tone of a despot women pretty women in the position of madame de serizy are the spoiled children of french civilization if the women of other countries knew what a woman of fashion is in paris a woman of wealth and rank they would all want to come and enjoy that splendid royalty the women who recognize no bonds but those of propriety no law but the petty charter which has been more than once alluded to in this comedie humaine as the ladies code laugh at the statutes framed by men they say everything they do not shrink from any blunder or hesitate at any folly for they all accept the fact that they are irresponsible beings answerable for nothing on earth but their good repute and their children they say the most preposterous things with a laugh and are ready on every occasion to repeat the speech made in the early days of her married life by pretty madame de bauvan to her husband whom she came to fetch away from the palais make haste and pass sentence and come away madame said the public prosecutor monsieur lucien de rubempre is not guilty either of robbery or of poisoning but monsieur camusot has led him to confess a still greater crime what is that she asked he acknowledged said monsieur camusot in her ear that he is the friend and pupil of an escaped convict the abbe carlos herrera the spaniard with whom he has been living for the last seven years is the notorious jacques collin madame de serizy felt as if it were a blow from an iron rod at each word spoken by the judge but this name was the finishing stroke and the upshot of all this she said in a voice that was no more than a breath is monsieur de granville went on finishing the countess's sentence in an undertone that the convict will be committed for trial and that if lucien is not committed with him as having profited as an accessory to the man's crimes he must appear as a witness very seriously compromised oh never never she cried aloud with amazing firmness for my part i should not hesitate between death and the disaster of seeing a man whom the world has known to be my dearest friend declared by the bench to be the accomplice of a convict the king has a great regard for my husband madame said the public prosecutor also aloud and with a smile the king has not the smallest power over the humblest examining judge in his kingdom nor over the proceedings in any court of justice 
that is the grand feature of our new code of laws i myself have just congratulated m camusot on his skill on his clumsiness said the countess sharply though lucien's intimacy with a scoundrel really disturbed her far less than his attachment to esther if you will read the minutes of the examination of the two prisoners by m camusot you will see that everything is in his hands after this speech the only thing the public prosecutor could venture to say and a flash of feminine or if you will lawyer-like cunning he went to the door then turning round on the threshold he added excuse me madame i have two words to say to bovin which translated by the worldly wise conveyed to the countess i do not want to witness the scene between you and camusot what is this examination business said leontine very blandly to camusot who stood downcast in the presence of the wife of one of the most important personages in the realm madame said camusot a clerk writes down all the magistrates questions and the prisoners replies this document is signed by the clerk by the judge and by the prisoner this evidence is the raw material of the subsequent proceedings on it the accused are committed for trial and remanded to appear before the criminal court well then said she if the evidence were suppressed oh madame that is a crime which no magistrate could possibly commit a crime against society it is a far worse crime against me to have ever allowed it to be recorded still at this moment it is the only evidence against lucien come read me the minutes of his examination that i may see if there is still a way of salvation for us all monsieur i do not speak for myself alone i should quite calmly kill myself but monsieur de serizy's happiness is also at stake pray madame do not suppose that i have forgotten the respect due you said camusot if m popinot for instance had undertaken this case you would have had worse luck than you have found with me for he would not have come to consult m de granville no one would have heard anything about it i tell you madame everything has been seized in m lucien's lodging even your letters what my letters here they are madame in a sealed packet the countess in her agitation rang as if she had been at home and the office-boy came in a light said she the boy lighted a taper and placed it on the chimney-piece while the countess looked through the letters counted them crushed them in her hand and flung them on the hearth in a few minutes she set the whole mass in a blaze twisting up the last note to serve as a torch camusot stood looking rather foolish as he watched the papers burn holding the legal documents in his hand the countess who seemed absorbed in the work of destroying the proofs of her passion studied him out of the corner of her eye she took her time she calculated her distance with the spring of a cat she seized the two documents and threw them on the flames but camusot saved them the countess rushed on him and snatched back the burning papers a struggle ensued camusot calling out madame but madame this is contempt madame a man hurried into the room and the countess could not repress a scream as she beheld the comte de serizy followed by m de granville and the comte de bauvin leontine however determined to save lucien at any cost would not let go of the terrible stamped documents which she clutched with the tenacity of a vice though the flame had already burnt her delicate skin like a moxa at last camusot whose fingers also were smarting from the fire seemed to be ashamed of the position he let the papers go there was nothing left of them but the portions so tightly held by the antagonists that the flame could not touch them the whole scene had taken less time than is needed to read this account of it what discussion can have arisen between you and madame de serizy 
the husband asked of Camusot. Before the lawyer could reply, the countess held the fragments in the candle and threw them on the remains of her letters, which were not entirely consumed. "'I shall be compelled,' said Camusot, "'to lay a complaint against Madame la Comtesse.' "'Eh, what has she done?' asked the public prosecutor, looking alternately at the lady and the magistrate. "'I have burned the record of the examinations.' said the lady of fashion with a laugh so pleased at her high-handed conduct that she did not yet feel the pain of the burns if that is a crime well monsieur must get his odious scrawl written out again very true said camusot trying to recover his dignity well well all's well that ends well said monsieur de Grandville but my dear countess you must not often take such liberties with the law it might fail to discern who and what you are monsieur camusot valiantly resisted a woman whom none can resist the honour of the robe is safe said the comte de bauvin laughing indeed monsieur camusot was resisting said the public prosecutor laughing too he is a brave man indeed i should not dare resist the countess and thus for the moment this serious affair was no more than a pretty woman's jest at which camusot himself must laugh but monsieur de granville saw one man who was not amused not a little alarmed by the comte de serizy's attitude and expression his friend led him aside my dear fellow said he in a whisper your distress persuades me for the first and only time in my life to compromise with my duty the public prosecutor rang and the office boy appeared desire monsieur de chargeboeuf to come here monsieur de chargeboeuf a sucking barrister was his private secretary my good friend said the comte de granville to camusot whom he took to the window go back to your chambers get your clerk to reconstruct the report of the abbe carlos herrera's depositions as he had not signed the first copy there will be no difficulty about that to-morrow you must confront your spanish diplomat with rastignac and bianchon who will not recognize him as jacques collin then being sure of his release the man will sign the document as to lucien de rubempre set him free this evening he is not likely to talk about an examination of which the evidence is destroyed especially after such a lecture as i shall give him now you will see how little justice suffers by these proceedings if the spaniard really is the convict we have fifty ways of recapturing him and committing him for trial for we will have his conduct in spain thoroughly investigated corentin the police agent will take care of him for us and we ourselves will keep an eye on him so treat him decently do not send him down to the cells again can we be the death of the comte and comtesse de serizy as well as of lucien for the theft of seven hundred and fifty thousand francs as yet unproven and to lucien's personal loss will it not be better for him to lose the money than to lose his character above all if he is to drag with him in his fall a minister of state and his wife and the duchesse de maufrigneuse this young man is a speckled orange do not leave it to rot all this will take you about half an hour go and get it done we will wait for you it is half past three you will find some judges about let me know if you can get a rule of insufficient evidence or lucien must wait till to-morrow morning camusot bowed to the company and went but madame de serizy who was suffering a good deal from her burns did not return his bow Monsieur de Serizy, who had suddenly rushed away while the public prosecutor and the magistrate were talking together, presently returned, having fetched a small jar of virgin wax. With this he dressed his wife's fingers, saying in an undertone, Leontine, why did you come here without letting me know? 
my dear replied she in a whisper forgive me i seem mad but indeed your interests were as much involved as mine love this young fellow if fatality requires it but do not display your passion to all the world said the luckless husband well my dear countess said monsieur de granville who had been engaged in conversation with comte octave i hope you may take monsieur de rubempre home to dine with you this evening this half promise produced a reaction madame de serizy melted into tears i thought i had no tears left said she with a smile but could you not bring monsieur de rubempre to wait here i will try if i can find the ushers to fetch him so that he may not be seen under the escort of the gendarmes said monsieur de granville you are as good as god cried she with a gush of feeling that made her voice sound like heavenly music these are the women said comte octave who are fascinating irresistible and he became melancholy as he thought of his own wife see honorine as he left the room monsieur de granville was stopped by young chargeboeuf to whom he spoke to give him instructions as to what he was Section fifty of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways, Chapter Thirteen. While beauties, ministers, and magistrates were conspiring to save Lucien, this was what he was doing at the Conciergerie. As he passed the gate, the poet told the keeper that Monsieur Camusot had granted him leave to write, and he begged to have pens, ink, and paper. At a whispered word to the governor from Camusot's usher, a warder was instructed to take them to him at once. During the short time that it took for the warder to fetch these things and carry them up to Lucien, the hapless young man, to whom the idea of facing Jacques Collin had become intolerable, sank into one of those fatal moods in which the idea of suicide to which he had yielded before now but without succeeding in carrying it out rises to the pitch of mania according to certain mad doctors suicide is in some temperaments the closing phase of mental aberration and since his arrest lucien had been possessed by that single idea esther's letter read and re-read many times increased the vehemence of his desire to die by reminding him of the catastrophe of romeo dying to be with juliet this is what he wrote this is my last will and testament at the conciergerie may fifteenth eighteen thirty i the undersigned give and bequeath to the children of my sister madame eve chardon wife of david sechard formerly a printer at angouleme and of monsieur david sechard all the property real and personal of which i may be possessed at the time of my decease due deduction being made for the payments and legacies which i desire my executor to provide for and i earnestly beg monsieur de serizy to undertake the charge of being the executor of this my will first to monsieur l'abbe carlos herrera i direct the payment of the sum of three hundred thousand francs secondly to monsieur le baron de nucingen the sum of fourteen hundred thousand francs less seven hundred and fifty thousand if the sum stolen from mademoiselle esther should be recovered as universal legatee to mademoiselle esther gobseck i give and bequeath the sum of seven hundred and sixty thousand francs to the board of asylums of paris for the foundation of a refuge especially dedicated to the use of public prostitutes who may wish to forsake their life of vice and ruin 
i also bequeath to the asylums of paris the sum of money necessary for the purchase of a certificate for dividends to the amount of thirty thousand francs per annum in five per cents the annual income to be devoted every six months to the release of prisoners for debts not exceeding two thousand francs the board of asylums to select the most respectable of such persons imprisoned for debt i beg m de serizy to devote the sum of forty thousand francs to erecting a monument to mademoiselle esther in the eastern cemetery and i desire to be buried by her side the tomb is to be like an antique tomb square our two effigies lying thereon in white marble the heads on pillows the hands folded and raised to heaven there is to be no inscription whatever i beg m de serizy to give to m de rastignac a gold toilet set that is in my room as a remembrance and as a remembrance i beg my executor to accept my library of books as a gift from me lucien chardon de rubempre this will was enclosed in a letter addressed to m le comte de granville public prosecutor in the supreme court at paris as follows m le comte i place my will in your hands when you open this letter i shall be no more in my desire to be free i made such cowardly replies to m camusot's insidious questions that in spite of my innocence i may find myself entangled in a disgraceful trial even if i were acquitted a blameless life would henceforth be impossible to me in view of the opinions of the world i beg you to transmit the enclosed letter to the abbe carlos herrera without opening it and deliver to m camusot the formal retraction i also enclose i suppose no one will dare to break the seal of the packet addressed to you in this belief i bid you adieu offering you my best respects for the last time and begging you to believe that in writing to you i am giving you a token of my gratitude for all the kindness you have shown to your deceased humble servant lucien de r to the abbe carlos herrera my dear abbe i have had only benefits from you and i have betrayed you this involuntary ingratitude is killing me and when you read these lines i shall have ceased to exist you are not here now to save me you had given me full liberty if i should find it advantageous to destroy you by flinging you on the ground like a cigar end but i have ruined you by a blunder to escape from a difficulty deluded by a clever question from the examining judge your son by adoption and grace went over to the side of those who aim at killing you at any cost and insist on proving an identity which i know to be impossible between you and a french villain all is said between a man of your caliber and me me of whom you tried to make a greater man than i am capable of being no foolish sentiment can come at the moment of final parting you hoped to make me powerful and famous and you have thrown me into the gulf of suicide that is all i have long heard the broad pinions of that vertigo beating over my head as you have sometimes said there is the posterity of cain and the posterity of abel in the great human drama cain is in opposition you are descended from adam through that line in which the devil still fans the fire of which the first spark was flung on eve among the demons of that pedigree from time to time we see one of stupendous power summing up every form of human energy and resembling the fevered beasts of the desert whose vitality demands the vast spaces they find there such men are as dangerous as lions would be in the heart of normandy they must have their prey and they devour common men and crop the money of fools 
their sport is so dangerous that at last they kill the humble dog whom they have taken for a companion and made an idol of when it is god's will these mysterious beings may be a moses an attila charlemagne mahomet or napoleon but when he leaves a generation of these stupendous tools to rust at the bottom of the ocean they are no more than a pugatchev a fouché a Louvel, or the abbe carlos herrera gifted with immense power over tenderer souls they entrap them and mangle them it is grand it is fine in its way it is the poisonous plant with gorgeous coloring that fascinates children in the woods it is the poetry of evil men like you ought to dwell in caves and never come out of them you have made me live that vast life and i have had all my share of existence so i may very well take my head out of the gordian knot of your policy and slip it into the running knot of my cravat to repair the mischief i have done i am forwarding to the public prosecutor a retraction of my deposition you will know how to take advantage of this document in virtue of a will formally drawn up restitution will be made monsieur l'abbe of the monies belonging to your order which you so imprudently devoted to my use as a result of your paternal affection for me and so farewell farewell colossal image of evil and corruption farewell to you who if i started on the right road might have been greater than chemenes greater than richelieu you have kept your promises i find myself once more just as i was on the banks of the charente after enjoying by your help the enchantments of a dream but unfortunately it is not now in the waters of my native place that i shall drown the errors of a boy but in the seine and my hole is a cell in the conciergerie do not regret me my contempt for you is as great as my admiration lucien recantation i the undersigned hereby declare that i retract without reservation all that i deposed at my examination to-day before monsieur camusot the abbe carlos herrera always called himself my spiritual father and i was misled by the word father used in another sense by the judge no doubt under a misapprehension i am aware that for political ends and to quash certain secrets concerning the cabinets of spain and of the tuileries some obscure diplomatic agents tried to show that the abbe carlos herrera was a forger named jacques collin but the abbe carlos herrera never told me anything about the matter excepting that he was doing his best to obtain evidence of the death or of the continued existence of jacques collin lucien de rubempre at the conciergerie may fifteenth eighteen thirty the fever for suicide had given lucien immense clearness of mind and the swiftness of hand familiar to authors in the fever of composition the impetus was so strong within him that these four documents were all written within half an hour he folded them in a wrapper fastened with wafers on which he impressed with the strength of delirium the coat of arms engraved on a seal ring he wore and he then laid the packet very conspicuously in the middle of the floor certainly it would have been impossible to conduct himself with greater dignity in the false position to which all this infamy had led him he was rescuing his memory from opprobrium and repairing the injury done to his accomplice so far as the wit of a man of the world could nullify the result of the poet's trustfulness if lucien had been taken back to one of the lower cells he would have been wrecked on the impossibility of carrying out his intentions for those boxes of masonry have no furniture but a sort of camp bed and a pail for necessary uses 
there is not a nail not a chair not even a stool the camp bed is so firmly fixed that it is impossible to move it without an amount of labor that the warder would not fail to detect for the iron-barred peephole is always open indeed if a prisoner under suspicion gives reason for uneasiness he is watched by a gendarme or a constable in the private rooms for which prisoners pay and in that whither lucien had been conveyed by the judge's courtesy to a young man belonging to the upper ranks of society the movable bed table and chair might serve to carry out his purpose of suicide though they hardly made it easy lucien wore a long blue silk necktie and on his way back from examination he was already meditating on the means by which pichegru more or less voluntarily ended his days still to hang himself a man must find a purchase and have a sufficient space between it and the ground for his feet to find no support now the window of his room looking out on the prison-yard had no handle to the fastening and the bars being fixed outside were divided from his reach by the thickness of the wall and could not be used for a support this then was the plan hit upon by lucien to put himself out of the world the boarding of the lower part of the opening which prevented his seeing out into the yard also hindered the warders outside from seeing what was done in the room but while the lower portion of the window was replaced by two thick planks the upper part of both halves still was filled with small panes held in place by the cross pieces in which they were set by standing on his table lucien could reach the glazed part of the window and take or break out two panes so as to have a firm point of attachment in the angle of the lower bar round this he would tie his cravat turn round once to tighten it round his neck after securing it firmly and kick the table from under his feet he drew the table up under the window without making any noise took off his coat and waistcoat and got on the table unhesitatingly to break a pane above and one below the iron crossbar standing on the table he could look out across the yard on a magical view which he then beheld for the first time the governor of the prison in deference to monsieur camusot's request that he should deal as leniently as possible with lucien had led him as we have seen through the dark passages of the conciergerie entered from the dark vault opposite the tour d'argent thus avoiding the exhibition of a young man of fashion to the crowd of prisoners airing themselves in the yard it will be for the reader to judge whether the aspect of the promenade was not such as to appeal deeply to a poet's soul the yard of the conciergerie ends at the quay between the tour d'argent and the tour bonbec thus the distance between them exactly shows from the outside the width of the plot of ground the corridor called the galerie de saint louis which extends from the galerie marchande to the courts of appeals and the tour bonbec in which it is said saint louis room still exists may enable the curious to estimate the depths of the yard as it is of the same length thus the dark cells and the private rooms are under the galerie marchande and queen marie antoinette whose dungeon was under the present cells was conducted to the presence of the revolutionary tribunal which held its sittings in the place where the court of appeals now performs its solemn functions up a horrible flight of steps now never used in the very thickness of the wall on which the galerie marchande is built one side of the prison yard that on which the hall of saint louis forms the first floor displays a long row of gothic columns between which the architects of i know not what period have built up two floors of cells to accommodate as many prisoners as possible by choking the capitals the arches and the vaults of this magnificent cloister with plaster barred loopholes and partitions 
under the room known as the cabinet de saint louis in the tour bonbec there is a spiral stair leading to these dens this degradation of one of the immemorial buildings of france is hideous to behold from the height at which lucien was standing he saw this cloister and the details of the building that joins the two towers in sharp perspective before him were the pointed caps of the towers he stood amazed his suicide was postponed to his admiration the phenomena of hallucination are in these days so fully recognized by the medical faculty that this mirage of the senses this strange illusion of the mind is beyond dispute a man under the stress of a feeling which by its intensity has become a monomania often finds himself in the frame of mind to which opium hashish or the protoxide of azote might have brought him spectres appear phantoms and dreams take shape things of the past live again as they once were what was but an image of the brain becomes a moving or a living object science is now beginning to believe that under the action of a paroxysm of passion the blood rushes to the brain and that such congestion has the terrible effects of a dream in a waking state so averse are we to regard thought as a physical and generative force see louis lambert lucien saw the building in all its pristine beauty the columns were new slender and bright st louis palace rose before him as it had once appeared he admired its babylonian proportions and oriental fancy he took this exquisite vision as a poetic farewell from civilized creation while making his arrangements to die he wondered how this marvel of architecture could exist in paris so utterly unknown he was two luciens one lucien the poet wandering through the middle ages under the vaults and the tour Section fifty one of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. The End of Evil Ways. Chapter fourteen. Just as Monsieur de Granville had ended giving his instructions to the young secretary, the governor of the conciergerie came in and the expression of his face was such as to give the public prosecutor a presentiment of disaster have you met monsieur camusot he asked no monsieur said the governor his clerk coquart instructed me to give the abbe carlos a private room and to liberate monsieur de rubempre but it is too late good god what has happened here monsieur is a letter for you which will explain the catastrophe the warder on duty in the prison yard heard a noise of breaking glass in the upper room and monsieur lucien's next neighbor shrieking wildly for he heard the young man's dying struggles the warder came to me pale from the sight that met his eyes he found the prisoner hanged from the window bar by his necktie though the governor spoke in a low voice a fearful scream from madame de serizy showed that under stress of feeling our faculties are incalculably keen the countess heard or guessed before monsieur de granville could turn round or monsieur de bauvin or her husband could stop her she fled like a flash out of the door and reached the galerie marchande where she ran on to the stairs leading out to the rue de la Berillerie a pleader was taking off his gown at the door of one of the shops which from time immemorial have choked up this arcade where shoes are sold and gowns and caps kept for hire the countess asked the way to the conciergerie go down the steps and turn to the left the entrance is from the quai d'horloge the first archway 
that woman is crazy said the shop woman some one ought to follow her but no one could have kept up with leontine she flew a physician may explain how it is that these ladies of fashion whose strength never finds employment reveal such powers in the critical moments of life the countess rushed so swiftly through the archway to the wicket gate that the gendarme on sentry did not see her pass she flew at the barred gate like a feather driven by the wind and shook the iron bars with such fury that she broke the one she grasped the bent ends were thrust into her breast making the blood flow and she dropped on the ground shrieking open it open it in a tone that struck terror into the warders the gatekeepers hurried out open the gate the public prosecutor sent me to save the dead man while the countess was going round by the rue de la barillerie and the quai de l'horloge m de granville and m de serizy went down to the conciergerie through the inner passages suspecting leontine's purpose but notwithstanding their haste they only arrived in time to see her fall fainting at the outer gate where she was picked up by two gendarmes who had come down from the guard-room on seeing the governor of the prison the gate was opened and the countess was carried into the office but she stood up and fell on her knees clasping her hands only to see him to see him oh i will do no wrong but if you do not want to see me die on the spot let me look at lucien dead or living ah my dear are you here choose between my death and she sank in a heap you are kind she said i will always love you carry her away said m de Beauvin no we will go to lucien's cell said m de granville reading a purpose in m de serizy's wild looks and he lifted up the countess and took her under one arm while m de Beauvin supported her on the other side monsieur said the comte de serizy to the governor silence as of the grave about all this be easy replied the governor you have done the wisest thing if this lady she is my wife oh i beg your pardon well she will certainly faint away when she sees the poor man and while she is unconscious she can be taken home in a carriage that is what i thought replied the count pray send one of your men to tell my servants in the cour de Arles to come round to the gate mine is the only carriage there we can save him yet said the countess walking on with a degree of strength and spirit that surprised her friends there are ways of restoring life and she dragged the gentleman along crying to the warder come on come faster one second may cost three lives when the cell door was opened and the countess saw lucien hanging as though his clothes had been hung on a peg she made a spring towards him as if to embrace him and cling to him but she fell on her face on the floor with smothered shrieks and a sort of rattle in her throat five minutes later she was being taken home stretched on the seat in the count's carriage her husband kneeling by her side m de Beauvin went off to fetch a doctor to give her the care she needed the governor of the conciergerie meanwhile was examining the outer gate and saying to his clerk no expense was spared the bars are of wrought iron they were properly tested and cost a large sum and yet there was a flaw in that bar m de granville on returning to his room had other instructions to give to his private secretary massol happily had not yet arrived soon after m de granville had left anxious to go to see m de serizy massol came and found his ally chargeboeuf in the public prosecutor's court my dear fellow said the young secretary if you will do me a great favor you will put what i dictate to you in your gazette to-morrow under the heading of law reports you can compose the heading 
right now and he dictated as follows it has been ascertained that the demoiselle esther gobseck killed herself of her own free will monsieur lucien de rubempre satisfactorily proved an alibi and his innocence leaves his arrest to be regretted all the more because just as the examining judge had given the order for his release the young gentleman died suddenly i need not point out to you said the young lawyer to masson how necessary it is to preserve absolute silence as to the little service requested of you since it is you who do me the honor of so much confidence replied massal allow me to make one observation this paragraph will give rise to odious comments on the course of justice justice is strong enough to bear them said the young attache to the courts with the pride of a coming magistrate trained by monsieur de granville allow me my dear sir with two sentences this difficulty may be avoided and the journalist lawyer wrote as follows the forms of the law have nothing to do with this sad event the post-mortem examination which was at once made proved that sudden death was due to the rupture of an aneurysm in its last stage if m lucien de rubempre had been upset by his arrest death must have ensued sooner but we are in the position to state that far from being distressed at being taken into custody the young man whom all must lament only laughed at it and told those who escorted him from fontainebleau to paris that as soon as he was brought before a magistrate his innocence would be acknowledged that saves it i think said massal you are perfectly right the public prosecutor will thank you for it to-morrow said massal slyly now to the great majority as to the more choice reader it will perhaps seem that this study is not completed by the death of esther and of lucien jacques collin and asie europe and Pecard, in spite of their villainous lives may have been interesting enough to make their fate a matter of curiosity the last act of the drama will also complete the picture of life which this study is intended to present and give the issue of various interests which lucien's career had strangely tangled by bringing some ignoble personages from the hulks into contact with those of the highest rank thus as may be seen the greatest events of life find their expression in the more or less voracious gossip of the paris papers and the Section fifty two of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter one. What is it, Madeleine? asked Madame Camusot, seeing her maid come into the room with the particular air that servants assume in critical moments madame said madeleine monsieur has just come in from court but he looks so upset and is in such a state that i think perhaps it would be well for you to go to his room did he say anything asked madame camusot no madame but we never have seen monsieur look like that he looks as if he were going to be ill his face is yellow he seems all to pieces madame camusot waited for no more she rushed out of her room and flew to her husband's study she found the lawyer sitting in an armchair pale and dazed his legs stretched out his head against the back of it his arms hanging limp exactly as if he were sinking into idiocy what is the matter my dear said the young woman in alarm oh my poor amelie the most dreadful thing has happened i am still trembling 
imagine the public prosecutor no madame de serisy that is i do not know where to begin begin at the end said madame camusot well just as monsieur popinot in the council room of the first court had put the last signature to the ruling of insufficient cause for the apprehension of lucien de rubempre on the ground of my report setting him at liberty in fact the whole thing was done the clerk was going off with the minute-book and i was quit of the whole business the president of the court came in and took up the papers you are releasing a dead man said he with chilly irony the young man is gone as m de bonal says to appear before his natural judge he died of apoplexy i breathed again thinking it was sudden illness as i understand you monsieur le president said m popinot it is a case of apoplexy like pichegru's gentlemen said the president then very gravely you must please to understand that for the outside world lucien de rubempre died of an aneurysm we all looked at each other very great people are concerned in this deplorable business said the president god grant for your sake monsieur camusot though you did no less than your duty that madame de serizy may not go mad from the shock she has had she was carried away almost dead i have just met our public prosecutor in a painful state of despair you have made a mess of it my dear camusot he added in my ear i assure you my dear as i came away i could hardly stand my legs shook so that i dared not venture into the street i went back to my room to rest then coquart who was putting away the papers of this wretched case told me that a very handsome woman had taken the conciergerie by storm wanting to save lucien whom she was quite crazy about and that she fainted away on seeing him hanging by his necktie to the window-bar of his room the idea that the way in which i questioned that unhappy young fellow who between ourselves was guilty in many ways can have led to his committing suicide has haunted me ever since i left the palais and i feel constantly on the point of fainting what next are you going to think yourself a murderer because a suspected criminal hangs himself in prison just as you were about to release him cried madame camusot why an examining judge in such a case is like a general whose horse is killed under him that is all such a comparison my dear is at best but a jest and jesting is out of place now in this case the dead man clutches the living all our hopes are buried in lucien's coffin indeed said madame camusot with deep irony yes my career is closed i shall be no more than an examining judge all my life before this fatal termination monsieur de granville was annoyed at the turn the preliminaries had taken his speech to our president makes me quite certain that so long as monsieur de granville is public prosecutor i shall get no promotion promotion the terrible thought which in these days makes a judge a mere functionary formerly a magistrate was made at once what he was to remain the three or four president's caps satisfied the ambitions of lawyers in each parlement an appointment as councillor was enough for a de brosse or a molle at dijon as much as in paris this office in itself a fortune required a fortune brought to it to keep it up in paris outside the parlement men of the long robe could hope only for three supreme appointments those of comptroller general keeper of the seals or chancellor below the parlement in the lower grades the president of a lower court thought himself quite of sufficient importance to be content to fill his chair to the end of his days compare the position of a councillor in the high court of justice in paris in eighteen twenty nine who has nothing but his salary with that of a councillor to the parlement in seventeen twenty nine how great is the difference 
in these days when money is the universal social guarantee magistrates are not required to have as they used to have fine private fortunes hence we see deputies and peers of france heaping office on office at once magistrates and legislators borrowing dignity from other positions than those which ought to give them all their importance in short a magistrate tries to distinguish himself for promotion as men do in the army or in a government office this prevailing thought even if it does not affect his independence is so well known and so natural and its effects are so evident that the law inevitably loses some of its majesty in the eyes of the public and in fact the salaries paid by the state makes priests and magistrates mere employees steps to be gained foster ambition ambition engenders subservience to power and modern equality places the judge and the person to be judged in the same category at the bar of society and so the two pillars of social order religion and justice are lowered in this nineteenth century which asserts itself as progressive in all things and why should you never be promoted said amelie camusot she looked half jestingly at her husband feeling the necessity of reviving the energies of the man who embodied her ambitions and on whom she could play as on an instrument why despair she went on with a shrug that sufficiently expressed her indifference as to the prisoner's end this suicide will delight lucien's two enemies madame d'espard and her cousin the comtesse du chatelet madame d'espard is on the best terms with the keeper of the seals through her you can get an audience of his excellency and tell him all the secrets of this business then if the head of the law is on your side what have you to fear from the president of your court or the public prosecutor but monsieur and madame de serizy cried the poor man madame de serizy is gone mad i tell you and her madness is my doing they say well if she is out of her mind o oh judge devoid of judgment said madame camusot laughing she can do you no harm come tell me all the incidents of the day bless me said camusot just as i had cross-examined the unhappy youth and he had deposed that the self-styled spanish priest is really jacques collin the duchesse de maufrigneuse and madame de serizy sent me a note by a servant begging me not to examine him it was all over but you must have lost your head said amelie what was to prevent you being so sure as you are of your clerk's fidelity from calling lucien back reassuring him cleverly and revising the examination why you are as bad as madame de serizy you laugh justice to scorn said camusot who was incapable of flouting his profession madame de serizy seized the minutes and threw them into the fire that is the right sort of woman bravo cried madame camusot madame de serizy declared she would sooner see the palais blown up than leave a young man who had enjoyed the favours of the duchesse de maufrigneuse and her own to stand at the bar of a criminal court by the side of a convict but camusot said amelie unable to suppress a superior smile your position is splendid ah oh, yes splendid you did your duty but all wrong and in spite of the jesuitical advice of m de granville who met me on the quai malaquais this morning this morning at what hour at nine o'clock oh camusot cried amelie clasping and wringing her hands and i am always imploring you to be constantly on the alert good heavens it is not a man but a barrow-load of stones that i have to drag on 
why camusot your public prosecutor was waiting for you he must have given you some warning yes indeed and you failed to understand him if you are so deaf you will indeed be an examining judge all your life without any knowledge whatever of the question at any rate have sense enough to listen to me she went on silencing her husband who was about to speak you think the matter is done for she asked camusot looked at his wife as a country bumpkin looks at a conjurer if the duchesse de maufrigneuse and madame de serizy are compromised you will find them both ready to patronize you said amelie madame de serizy will get you admission to the keeper of the seals and you will tell him the secret history of the affair then he will amuse the king with the story for sovereigns always wish to see the wrong side of the tapestry and to know the real meaning of the events the public stare at open-mouthed henceforth there will be no cause to fear either the public prosecutor or monsieur de serizy what a treasure such a wife is cried the lawyer plucking up courage after all i have unearthed jacques collin i shall send him to his account at the assize court and unmask his crimes such a trial is a triumph in the career of an examining judge camusot amelie began pleased to see her husband rally from the moral and physical prostration into which he had been thrown by lucien's suicide the president told you that you had blundered to the wrong side now you are blundering as much to the other you are losing your way again my dear the magistrate stood up looking at his wife with a stupid stare the king and the keeper of the seals will be glad no doubt to know the truth of this business and at the same time much annoyed at seeing the lawyers on the liberal side dragging important persons to the bar of opinion and of the assize court by their special pleading such people as the maufrigneuses the serizies and the grandlieus in short all who are directly or indirectly mixed up with this case they are all in it i have them all cried camusot and camusot walked up and down the room like sganarelle on the stage when he is trying to get out of the scrape listen amelie said he standing in front of his wife an incident recurs to my mind a trifle in itself but in my position of vital importance realize my dear that this jacques collin is a giant of cunning of dissimulation of deceit he is what shall i say the cromwell of the hulks i never met such a scoundrel he almost took me in but in examining a criminal a little end of thread leads you to find a ball is a clue to the investigation of the darkest consciences and obscurest facts when jacques collin saw me turning over the letters seized in lucien de rubempre's lodgings the villain glanced at them with the evident intention of seeing whether some particular packet were among them and he allowed himself to give a visible expression of satisfaction this look as of a thief valuing his booty this movement as of a man in danger saying to himself my weapons are safe betrayed a world of things only you women besides us and our examinees can in a single flash epitomize a whole scene revealing trickery as complicated as safety locks volumes of suspicion may thus be communicated in a second it is terrifying life or death lies in a wink said i to myself the rascal has more letters in his hands than these then the other details of the case filled my mind i overlooked the incident for i thought i should have my man face to face and clear up this point afterwards but it may be considered as quite certain that jacques collin after the fashion of such wretches has hidden in some safe place 
the most compromising of the young fellow's letters adored as he was by and yet you are afraid camusot why you will be president of the supreme court much sooner than i expected cried madame camusot her face beaming now then you must proceed so as to give satisfaction to everybody for the matter is looking so serious that it might quite possibly be snatched from us do they not take the proceedings out of popinot's hands to place them in yours when madame d'espard tried to get a commission in lunacy to incapacitate her husband she added in reply to her husband's gesture of astonishment well then might not the public prosecutor who takes such keen interest in the honour of monsieur and madame de serizy carry the case to the upper court and get a counsellor in his interest to open a fresh inquiry bless me my dear where did you study criminal law cried camusot you know everything you can give me points why do you believe that by to-morrow morning monsieur de granville will not have taken fright at the possible line of defence that might be adopted by some liberal advocate whom jacques collin would manage to secure for lawyers will be ready to pay him to place the case in their hands and those ladies know their danger quite as well as you do not to say better they will put themselves under the protection of the public prosecutor who already sees their families unpleasantly close to the prisoner's bench as a consequence of the coalition between this convict and lucien de rubempre betrothed to mademoiselle de grandlieu lucien esther's lover madame de maufrigneuse's former lover madame de serizy's darling so you must conduct the affair in such a way as to conciliate the favor of your public prosecutor the gratitude of monsieur de serizy and that of the marquise d'espard and the comtesse du chatelet to reinforce madame de maufrigneuse's influence by that of the grandlieus and to gain the complimentary approval of your president i will undertake to deal with the ladies d'espard de maufrigneuse and de grandlieu you must go to-morrow morning to see the public prosecutor monsieur de granville is a man who does not live with his wife for ten years he had for his mistress a mademoiselle de bellefeuille who bore him illegitimate children didn't she well such a magistrate is no saint he is a man like any other he can be won over he must give a hold somewhere you must discover the weak spot and flatter him ask his advice point out the dangers of attending the case in short try to get him into the same boat and you will be i ought to kiss your footprints exclaimed camusot interrupting his wife putting his arm round her and pressing her to his heart amelie you have saved me i brought you in tow from alencon to mantes and from mantes to the metropolitan court replied amelie well well be quite easy i intend to be called madame la présidente within five years time but my dear pray always think over everything a long time before you come to any determination a judge's business is not that of a fireman your papers are never in a blaze you have plenty of time to think so in your place blunders are inexcusable the whole strength of my position lies in identifying the sham spanish priest with jacques collin the judge said after a long pause when once that identity is established even if the bench should take the credit of the whole affair that will still be an ascertained fact which no magistrate judge or counsellor can get rid of i shall do like the boys who tie a tin kettle to a cat's tail the inquiry whoever carries it on will make jacques collin's tin kettle clank bravo said amelie and the public prosecutor would rather come to an understanding with me than with any one else since i am the only man who can remove the damocles sword that hangs over the heart of the faubourg saint-germain 
only you have no idea how hard it will be to achieve that magnificent result just now when i was with monsieur de granville in his private office we agreed he and i to take jacques collin at his own valuation a canon of the chapter of toledo carlo serrera we consented to recognize his position as a diplomatic envoy and allow him to be claimed by the spanish embassy it was in consequence of this plan that i made out the papers by which lucien de rubempre was released and revised the minutes of the examinations washing the prisoners as white as snow to-morrow rastignac bianchon and some others are to be confronted with the self-styled canon of toledo they will not recognize him as jacques collin who was arrested in their presence ten years ago in a cheap boarding-house where they knew him under the name of vautrin there was a short silence while madame camusot sat thinking are you sure your man is jacques collin she asked positive said the lawyer and so is the public prosecutor well then try to make some exposure at the palais de justice without showing your claws too much under your furred cat's paws if your man is still in the secret cells go straight to the governor of the conciergerie and contrive to have the convict publicly identified instead of behaving like a child act like the ministers of police under despotic governments who invent conspiracies against the monarch to have the credit of discovering them and making themselves indispensable put three families in danger to have the glory of rescuing them that luckily reminds me cried camusot my brain is so bewildered that i had quite forgotten an important point the instructions to place jacques collin in a private room were taken by coquart to monsieur gault the governor of the prison now bibi lupin jacques collin's great enemy has taken steps to have three criminals who know the man transferred from la force to the conciergerie if he appears in the prison yard to-morrow a terrific scene is expected why jacques collin my dear was treasurer of the money owned by the prisoners in the hulks amounting to considerable sums now he is supposed to have spent it all to maintain the deceased lucien in luxury and he will be called to account there will be such a battle bibi lupin tells me as will require the intervention of the warders and the secret will be out jacques collin's life is in danger now if i get to the palais early enough i may record the evidence of identity oh if only his creditors should take him off your hands you would be thought such a clever fellow do not go to monsieur de granville's room wait for him in his court with that formidable great gun it is a loaded cannon turned on the three most important families of the court and peerage be bold propose to monsieur de granville that he should relieve you of jacques collin by transferring him to la force where the convicts know how to deal with those who betray them i will go to the duchesse de maufrigneuse who will take me to the grandieuse possibly i may see monsieur de serizy trust me to sound the alarm everywhere above all send me a word we will agree upon to let me know if the spanish priest is officially recognized as jacques collin get your business at the palais over by two o'clock and i will have arranged for you to have an interview with the keeper of the seals perhaps i may find him with the marquise d'espard camusot stood squarely with a look of admiration that made his knowing wife smile now come to dinner and be cheerful said she in conclusion why you see we have been only two years in paris and here you are on the high road to be made councillor before the end of the year from that to the presidency of a court my dear there is no gulf but what some political service may bridge 
this conjugal sitting shows how greatly the deeds and the lightest words of jacques collin the lowest personage in this drama involved the honor of the families Section 53 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar, Chapter 2. At the Conciergerie, Lucien's death and Madame de Serizy's incursion had produced such a block in the wheels of the machinery that the governor had forgotten to remove the sham priest from his dungeon cell. Though more than one instance is on record of the death of a prisoner during his preliminary examination, it was a sufficiently rare event to disturb the warders the clerk and the governor and hinder their working with their usual serenity at the same time to them the important fact was not the handsome young fellow so suddenly become a corpse but the breakage of the wrought-iron bar of the outer prison gate by the frail hands of a fine lady and indeed as soon as the public prosecutor and comte octave de bauvin had gone off with monsieur de serizy and his unconscious wife the governor clerk and turnkeys gathered round the gate after letting out monsieur lebrun the prison doctor who had been called in to certify to lucien's death in concert with the death doctor of the district in which the unfortunate youth had been lodging in paris the death doctor is the medical officer whose duty it is in each district to register deaths and certify to their causes with the rapid insight for which he was known monsieur de granville had judged it necessary for the honor of the families concerned to have the certificate of lucien's death deposited at the mairie of the district in which the quai malaquais lies as the deceased had resided there and to have the body carried from his lodgings to the church of saint germain des prés where the service was to be held m de chargeboeuf m de granville's private secretary had orders to this effect the body was to be transferred from the prison during the night the secretary was desired to go at once and settle matters at the mairie with the parish authorities and with the official undertakers thus to the world in general lucien would have died at liberty in his own lodgings the funeral would start from thence and his friends would be invited there for the ceremony so when camusot his mind at ease was sitting down to dinner with his ambitious better half the governor of the conciergerie and m lebrun the prison doctor were standing outside the gate bewailing the fragility of iron bars and the strength of ladies in love no one knows said the doctor to m gault what an amount of nervous force there is in a man wound up to the highest pitch of passion dynamics and mathematics have no formulas or symbols to express that power why only yesterday i witnessed an experiment which gave me a shudder and which accounts for the terrible strength put forth just now by that little woman tell me about it said m gault for i am so foolish as to take an interest in magnetism i do not believe in it but it mystifies me a physician who magnetizes for there are men among us who believe in magnetism lebrun went on offered to experiment on me in proof of a phenomenon that he described and i doubted curious to see with my own eyes one of the strange states of nervous tension by which the existence of magnetism is demonstrated i consented these are the facts i should very much like to know what our college of medicine would say if each of its members in turn were subjected to this influence which leaves no loophole for incredulity my old friend 
this doctor said dr lebrun parenthetically is an old man persecuted for his opinions since mesmer's time by all the faculty he is seventy or seventy-two years of age and his name is bouvard at the present day he is the patriarchal representative of the theory of animal magnetism this good man regards me as a son i owe my training to him well this worthy old bouvard it was who proposed to prove to me that nerve force put in motion by the magnetizer was not indeed infinite for man is under immutable laws but a power acting like other powers of nature whose elemental essence escapes our observation for instance said he if you place your hand in that of a somnambulist who when awake can press it only up to a certain average of tightness you will see that in the somnambulistic state as it is stupidly termed his fingers can clutch like a vice screwed up by a blacksmith well monsieur i placed my hand in that of a woman not asleep for bouvard rejects the word but isolated and when the old man bid her squeeze my wrist as long and as tightly as she could i begged him to stop when the blood was almost bursting from my finger-tips look you can see the marks of her clutch which i shall not lose for these three months the deuce exclaimed m gault as he saw a band of bruised flesh looking like the scar of a burn my dear gault the doctor went on if my wrist had been gripped in an iron manacle screwed tight by a locksmith i should not have felt the bracelet of metal so hard as that woman's fingers her hand was of unyielding steel and i am convinced that she could have crushed my bones and broken my hand from the wrist the pressure beginning almost insensibly increased without relaxing fresh force being constantly added to the former grip a tourniquet could not have been more effectual than that hand used as an instrument of torture to me therefore it seems proven that under the influence of passion which is the will concentrated on one point and raised to an incalculable power of animal force as the different varieties of electric force are also man may direct his whole vitality whether for attack or resistance to one of his organs now this little lady under the stress of her despair had concentrated her vital force in her hands she must have a good deal too to break a wrought iron bar said the chief warder with a shake of the head there was a flaw in it monsieur gault observed for my part said the doctor i dare assign no limits to nervous force and indeed it is by this that mothers to save their children can magnetize lions climb in a fire along a parapet where a cat would not venture and endure the torments that sometimes attend childbirth in this lies the secret of the attempts made by convicts and prisoners to regain their liberty the extent of our vital energies is as yet unknown they are part of the energy of nature itself and we draw them from unknown reservoirs monsieur said the warder in an undertone to the governor coming close to him as he was escorting dr lebrun as far as the outer gates of the conciergerie number two in the secret cells says he is ill and needs the doctor he declares he is dying added the turnkey indeed said the governor his breath rattles in his throat replied the man it is five o'clock said the doctor i have had no dinner but after all i am at hand come let us see number two as it happens is the spanish priest suspected of being jacques collin said monsieur gault to the doctor and one of the persons suspected of the crime in which that poor young man was implicated i saw him this morning replied the doctor m camusot sent for me to give evidence as to the state of the rascal's health and i may assure you that he is perfectly well 
and could make a fortune by playing the part of hercules in a troop of athletes perhaps he wants to kill himself too said monsieur go let us both go down to the cells together for i ought to go there if only to transfer him to an upper room monsieur camusot has given orders to mitigate this anonymous gentleman's confinement jacques collin known as trompe la mort in the world of the hulks who must henceforth be called only by his real name had gone through terrible distress of mind since after hearing camusot's order he had been taken back to the underground cell an anguish such as he had never before known in the course of a life diversified by many crimes by three escapes and two sentences at the assizes and is there not something monstrously fine in the dog-like attachment shown to the man he had made his friend by this wretch in whom were concentrated all the life the powers the spirit and the passions of the hulks who was so to speak their highest expression wicked infamous and in so many ways horrible this absolute worship of his idol makes him so truly interesting that this study long as it is already would seem incomplete and cut short if the close of this criminal career did not come as a sequel to lucien de rubempre's end the little spaniel being dead we want to know whether his terrible playfellow the lion will live on in real life in society every event is so inevitably linked to other events that one cannot occur without the rest the water of the great river forms a sort of fluid floor not a wave however rebellious however high it may toss itself but its powerful crest must sink to the level of the mass of waters stronger by the momentum of its course than the revolt of the surges it bears with it and just as you watch the current flow seeing in it a confused sheet of images so perhaps you would like to measure the pressure exerted by social energy on the vortex called vautrin to see how far away the rebellious eddy will be carried ere it is lost and what the end will be of this really diabolical man human still by the power of loving so hardly can that heavenly grace perish even in the most cankered heart this wretched convict embodying the poem that has smiled on many a poet's fancy on moore on lord byron on maturin on canalis the demon who has drawn an angel down to hell to refresh him with dews stolen from heaven this jacques collin will be seen by the reader who has understood that iron soul to have sacrificed his own life for seven years past his vast powers absorbed in lucien acted solely for lucien he lived for his progress his loves his ambitions to him lucien was his own soul made visible it was trompe la mort who dined with the grand lieus stole into ladies boudoirs and loved esther by proxy in fact in lucien he saw jacques collin young handsome noble and rising to the dignity of an ambassador trompe la mort had realized the german superstition of a doppelganger by means of a spiritual paternity a phenomenon which will be quite intelligible to those women who have ever truly loved who have felt their soul merge in that of the man they adore who have lived his life whether noble or infamous happy or unhappy obscure or brilliant who in defiance of distance have felt a pain in their leg if he were wounded in his who if he fought a duel would have been aware of it and who to put the matter in a nutshell did not need to be told he was unfaithful to know it as he went back to his cell jacques collin said to himself the boy is being examined and he shivered 
he who thought no more of killing a man than a laborer does of drinking has he been able to see his mistresses he wondered has my aunt succeeded in catching those damned females have the duchesses and countesses bestirred themselves and prevented his being examined has lucien had my instructions and if ill-luck will have it that he is cross-examined how will he carry it off poor boy and i have brought him to this it is that rascal paccard and that sneak Europe who have caused all this rumpus by collaring the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs for the certificate nucingen gave us there that precious pair tripped us up at the last step but i will make them pay dear for their pranks one day more and lucien would have been a rich man he might have married his clotilde de grandlieu then the boy would have been all my own and to think that our fate depends on a look on a blush of lucien's under camusot's eye who sees everything and has all a judge's wits about him for when he showed me the letters we tipped each other a wink in which we took each other's measure and he guessed that i can make lucien's lady loves fork out this soliloquy lasted for three hours his torments were so great that they were too much for that frame of iron and vitriol jacques collin whose brain felt on fire with insanity suffered such fearful thirst that he unconsciously drank up all the water contained in one of the pails with which the cell was supplied forming with the bed all its furniture if he loses his head what will become of him for the poor child has not theodore's tenacity Section 54 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 3. A word must here be said about this Theodore, remembered by Jacques Collin at such a critical moment. Theodore Calvi, a young Corsican, imprisoned for life at the age of eighteen for eleven murders thanks to the influential interference paid for with vast sums had been made the fellow convict of jacques collin to whom he was chained in eighteen nineteen and eighteen twenty jacques collin's last escape one of his finest inventions for he had got out disguised as a gendarme leading theodore calvi as he was a convict called before the commissary of police had been effected in the seaport of rochefort where the convicts die by dozens and where it was hoped these two dangerous rascals would have ended their days though they escaped together the difficulties of their flight had forced them to separate theodore was caught and restored to the hulks indeed a life with lucien a youth innocent of all crime who had only minor sins on his conscience dawned on him as bright and glorious as a summer sun while with theodore jacques collin could look forward to no end but the scaffold after a career of indispensable crimes the thought of disaster as a result of lucien's weakness for his experience of an underground cell would certainly have turned his brain took vast proportions in jacques collin's mind and contemplating the probabilities of such a misfortune the unhappy man felt his eyes fill with tears a phenomenon that had been utterly unknown to him since his earliest childhood i must be in a furious fever said he to himself and perhaps if i send for the doctor and offer him a handsome sum he will put me in communication with lucien at this moment the turnkey brought in his dinner it is quite useless my boy i cannot eat 
tell the governor of this prison to send the doctor to see me i am very bad and i believe my last hour has come hearing the guttural rattle that accompanied these words the warder bowed and went jacques collin clung wildly to this hope but when he saw the doctor and the governor come in together he perceived that the attempt was abortive and coolly awaited the upshot of the visit holding out his wrist for the doctor to feel his pulse the abbe is feverish said the doctor to m gault but it is the type of fever we always find in inculpated prisoners and to me he added in the governor's ear it is always a sign of some degree of guilt just then the governor to whom the public prosecutor had entrusted lucien's letter to be given to jacques collin left the doctor and the prisoner together under the guard of the warder and went to fetch the letter monsieur said jacques collin seeing the warder outside the door and not understanding why the governor had left them i should think nothing of thirty thousand francs if i might send five lines to lucien de rubempre i will not rob you of your money said dr lebrun no one in this world can ever communicate with him again no one said the prisoner in amazement why he has hanged himself no tigress robbed of her whelps ever startled an indian jungle with a yell so fearful as that of jacques collin who rose to his feet as a tiger rears to spring and fired a glance at the doctor as scorching as the flash of a falling thunderbolt then he fell back on the bed exclaiming oh my son poor man said the doctor moved by this terrific convulsion of nature in fact the first explosion gave way to such utter collapse that the words oh my son were but a murmur is this one going to die in our hands too said the turnkey no it is impossible jacques collin went on raising himself and looking at the two witnesses of the scene with a dead cold eye you are mistaken it is not lucien you did not see a man cannot hang himself in one of these cells look how could i hang myself here all paris shall answer to me for that boy's life god owes it to me the warder and the doctor were amazed in their turn they whom nothing had astonished for many a long day on seeing the governor jacques collin crushed by the very violence of this outburst of grief seemed somewhat calmer here is a letter which the public prosecutor placed in my hands for you with permission to give it to you sealed said m gault from lucien said jacques collin yes monsieur is not that young man he is dead said the governor even if the doctor had been on the spot he would unfortunately have been too late the young man died there in one of the rooms may i see him with my own eyes asked jacques collin timidly will you allow a father to weep over the body of his son you can if you like take his room for i have orders to remove you from these cells you are no longer in such close confinement monsieur the prisoner's eyes from which all light and warmth had fled turned slowly from the governor to the doctor jacques collin was examining them fearing some trap and he was afraid to go out of the cell if you wish to see the body said lebrun you have no time to lose it is to be carried away to-night if you have children gentlemen said jacques collin you will understand my state of mind i hardly know what i am doing this blow is worse to me than death but you cannot know what i am saying even if you are fathers it is only after a fashion i am a mother too i i am going mad i feel it 
by going through certain passages which open only to the governor it is possible to get very quickly from the cells to the private rooms the two sets of rooms are divided by an underground corridor formed of two massive walls supporting the vault over which the galerie marchande as it is called is built so jacques collin escorted by the warder who took his arm preceded by the governor and followed by the doctor in a few minutes reached the cell where lucien was lying stretched on the bed on seeing the body he threw himself upon it seizing it in a desperate embrace with a passion and impulse that made these spectators shudder there said the doctor to monsieur go that is an instance of what i was telling you you see that man clutching the body and you do not know what a corpse is it is stone leave me alone said jacques collin in a smothered voice i have not long to look at him they will take him away to he paused at the word bury him you will allow me to have some relic of my dear boy will you be so kind as to cut off a lock of his hair for me monsieur he said to the doctor for i cannot he was certainly his son said lebrun do you think so replied the governor in a meaning tone which made the doctor thoughtful for a few minutes the governor gave orders that the prisoner should be left in this cell and that some locks of hair should be cut for the self-styled father before the body should be removed at half-past five in the month of may it is easy to read a letter in the conciergerie in spite of the iron bars and the close wire trellis that guard the windows so jacques collin read the dreadful letter while he still held lucien's hand the man is not known who can hold a lump of ice for ten minutes tightly clutched in the hollow of his hand the cold penetrates to the very life-springs with mortal rapidity but the effect of that cruel chill acting like a poison is as nothing to that which strikes to the soul from the cold rigid hand of the dead thus held thus death speaks to life it tells many dark secrets which kill many feelings for in matters of feeling is not change death as we read through once more with jacques collin lucien's last letter it will strike us as being what it was to this man a cup of poison to the abbe carlos herrera my dear abbe i have had only benefits from you and i have betrayed you this involuntary ingratitude is killing me and when you read these lines i shall have ceased to exist you are not here now to save me you had given me full liberty if i should find it advantageous to destroy you by flinging you on the ground like a cigar end but i have ruined you by a blunder to escape from a difficulty deluded by a clever question from the examining judge your son by adoption and grace went over to the side of those who aim at killing you at any cost and insist on proving an identity which i know to be impossible between you and a french villain all is said between a man of your calibre and me me of whom you tried to make a greater man than i am capable of being no foolish sentiment can come at the moment of final parting you hoped to make me powerful and famous and you have thrown me into the gulf of suicide that is all i have long heard the broad pinions of that vertigo beating over my head as you have sometimes said there is the posterity of cain and the posterity of abel in the great human drama cain is in opposition you are descended from adam through that line in which the devil still fans the fire of which the first spark was flung on eve among the demons of that pedigree from time to time we see one of stupendous power summing up every form of human energy and resembling the fevered beasts of the desert 
whose vitality demands the vast spaces they find there such men are as dangerous as lions would be in the heart of normandy they must have their prey and they devour common men and crop the money of fools their sport is so dangerous that at last they kill the humble dog whom they have taken for a companion and made an idol of when it is god's will these mysterious beings may be a moses an attila charlemagne mahomet or napoleon but when he leaves a generation of these stupendous tools to rust at the bottom of the ocean they are no more than a pugatchev a fouché a Louvel, or the abbe carlo serrera gifted with immense power over tenderer souls they entrap them and mangle them it is grand it is fine in its way it is the poisonous plant with gorgeous colouring that fascinates children in the woods it is the poetry of evil men like you ought to dwell in caves and never come out of them you have made me live that vast life and i have had all my share of existence so i may very well take my head out of the gordian knot of your policy and slip it into the running knot of my cravat to repair the mischief i have done i am forwarding to the public prosecutor a retraction of my deposition you will know how to take advantage of this document in virtue of a will formally drawn up restitution will be made monsieur l'abbe of the monies belonging to your order which you so imprudently devoted to my use as a result of your paternal affection for me and so farewell farewell colossal image of evil and corruption farewell to you who if started on the right road might have been greater than chimenes greater than richelieu you have kept your promises i find myself once more just as i was on the banks of the charente after enjoying by your help the enchantments of a dream but unfortunately it is not now in the waters of my native place that i shall drown the errors of a boy but in the seine and my hole is a cell in the conciergerie do not regret me my contempt for you is as great as my admiration lucien a little before one in the morning when the men came to fetch away the body they found jacques collin kneeling by the bed the letter on the floor dropped no doubt as a suicide drops the pistol that has shot him but the unhappy man still held lucien's hand between his own and was praying to god on seeing this man the porters paused for a moment for he looked like one of those stone images kneeling to all eternity on a medieval tomb the work of some stone carver's genius the sham priest with eyes as bright as a tiger's but stiffened into supernatural rigidity so impressed the men that they gently bid him rise why he asked mildly the audacious trompe la mort was as meek as a child the governor pointed him out to m de chargeboeuf and he respecting such grief and believing that jacques collin was indeed the priest he called himself explained the orders given by m de granville with regard to the funeral service and arrangements showing that it was absolutely necessary that the body should be transferred to lucien's lodgings quai malaquais where the priests were waiting to watch by it for the rest of the night it is worthy of that gentleman's well-known magnanimity said jacques collin sadly tell him monsieur that he may rely on my gratitude yes i am in a position to do him great service do not forget these words they are of the utmost importance to him oh monsieur strange changes come over a man's spirit when for seven hours he has wept over such a son as he 
and i shall see him no more after gazing once more at lucien with an expression of a mother bereft of her child's remains jacques collin sank in a heap as he saw lucien's body carried away he uttered a groan that made the men hurry off the public prosecutor's private secretary and the governor of the prison had already made their escape from the scene what had become of that iron spirit of the decision which was a match in swiftness for the eye of the nature in which thought and action flashed forth together like one flame of the sinews hardened by three spells of labor on the hulks and by three escapes the muscles which had acquired the metallic temper of a savage's limbs iron will yield to a certain amount of hammering or persistent pressure its impenetrable molecules purified and made homogeneous by man may become disintegrated and without being in a state of fusion the metal has lost its power of resistance blacksmiths locksmiths tool-makers sometimes express this state by saying the iron is retting appropriating a word applied exclusively to hemp which is reduced to pulp and fibre by maceration well the human soul or if you will the threefold powers of body heart and intellect under certain repeated shocks get into such a condition as fibrous iron they too are disintegrated science and law and the public seek a thousand causes for the terrible catastrophes on railways caused by the rupture of an iron rail that of bellevue being a famous instance but no one has asked the evidence of real experts in such matters the blacksmiths who all say the same thing the iron was stringy the danger cannot be foreseen metal that has gone soft and metal that has preserved its tenacity both look exactly alike priests and examining judges often find great criminals in this state the awful experiences of the assize court and the last toilet commonly produce this dissolution of the nervous system even in the strongest natures then confessions are blurted by the most firmly set lips then the toughest hearts break and strange to say always at the moment when these confessions are useless when this weakness as of death snatches from the man the mask of innocence which made justice uneasy for it always is uneasy when the criminal dies without confessing his crime napoleon Section fifty five of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter four. At eight in the morning, when the warder of the better cells entered the room where Jacques Collin was confined, he found him pale and calm like a man who has collected all his strength by sheer determination it is the hour for airing in the prison-yard said the turnkey you have not been out for three days if you choose to take air and exercise you may jacques collin lost in his absorbing thoughts and taking no interest in himself regarding himself as a garment with no body in it a perfect rag never suspected the trap laid for him by bibi lupin nor the importance attaching to his walk in the prison-yard the unhappy man went out mechanically along the corridor by the cells built into the magnificent cloisters of the palace of the kings over which is the corridor saint louis as it is called leading to the various purlieus of the court of appeals this passage joins that of the better cells and it is worth noting that the cell in which louvel was imprisoned one of the most famous of the regicides 
is the room at the right angle formed by the junction of the two corridors under the pretty room in the tour bonbec there is a spiral staircase leading from the dark passage and serving the prisoners who are lodged in these cells to go up and down on their way from or to the yard every prisoner whether committed for trial or already sentenced and the prisoners under suspicion who have been reprieved from the closest cells in short every one in confinement in the conciergerie takes exercise in this narrow paved courtyard for some hours every day especially the early hours of summer mornings this recreation ground the ante-room to the scaffold or the hulks on one side on the other still clings to the world through the gendarme the examining judge and the assize court it strikes a greater chill perhaps than even the scaffold the scaffold may be a pedestal to soar to heaven from but the prison yard is every infamy on earth concentrated and unavoidable whether at la force or at poissy at melun or at saint pelagie a prison yard is a prison yard the same details are exactly repeated all but the color of the walls their height and the space enclosed so this study of manners would be false to its name if it did not include an exact description of this pandemonium of paris under the mighty vaulting which supports the lower courts and the court of appeals there is close to the fourth arch a stone slab used by saint louis it is said for the distribution of alms and doing duty in our day as a counter for the sale of eatables to the prisoners so as soon as the prison yard is open to the prisoners they gather round this stone table which displays such dainties as jailbirds desire brandy rum and the like the first two archways on that side of the yard facing the fine byzantine corridor the only vestige now of saint louis elegant palace form a parlor where the prisoners and their counsel may meet to which the prisoners have access through a formidable gateway a double passage railed off by enormous bars within the width of the third archway this double way is like the temporary passages arranged at the door of a theatre to keep a line on occasions when a great success brings a crowd this parlor at the very end of the vast entrance hall of the conciergerie and lighted by loopholes on the yard side has lately been opened out towards the back and the opening filled with glass so that the interviews of the lawyers with their clients are under supervision this innovation was made necessary by the two great fascinations brought to bear by pretty women on their counsel where will morality stop short such precautions are like the ready-made sets of questions for self-examination where pure imaginations are defiled by meditating on unknown and monstrous depravity in this parlor too parents and friends may be allowed by the authorities to meet the prisoners whether on remand or awaiting their sentence the reader may now understand what the prison yard is to the two hundred prisoners in the conciergerie their garden a garden without trees beds or flowers in short a prison yard the parlor and the stone of saint louis where such food and liquor as are allowed are dispensed are the only possible means of communication with the outer world the hour spent in the yard is the only time when the prisoner is in the open air or the society of his kind in other prisons those who are sentenced for a term are brought together in workshops but in the conciergerie no occupation is allowed excepting in the privileged cells there the absorbing idea in every mind is the drama of the assize court since the culprit comes only to be examined or to be sentenced this yard is indeed terrible to behold it cannot be imagined it must be seen 
in the first place the assemblage in a space forty meters long by thirty wide of a hundred condemned or suspected criminals does not constitute the cream of society these creatures belonging for the most part to the lowest ranks are poorly clad their countenances are base or horrible for a criminal from the upper sphere of society is happily a rare exception peculation forgery or fraudulent bankruptcy the only crimes that can bring decent folks so low enjoy the privilege of the better cells and then the prisoner scarcely ever quits it this promenade bounded by fine but formidable blackened walls by a cloister divided up into cells by fortifications on the side towards the quay by the barred cells of the better class on the north watched by vigilant warders and filled with a herd of criminals all meanly suspicious of each other is depressing enough in itself and it becomes terrifying when you find yourself the centre of all those eyes full of hatred curiosity and despair face to face with that degraded crew not a gleam of gladness all is gloom the place and the men all is speechless the walls and men's consciences to these hapless creatures danger lies everywhere excepting in the case of an alliance as ominous as the prison where it was formed they dare not trust each other the police all pervading poisons the atmosphere and taints everything even the hand-grasp of two criminals who have been intimate a convict who meets his most familiar comrade does not know that he may not have repented and have made a confession to save his life this absence of confidence this dread of the narc marks the liberty already so illusory of the prison yard the narc in french le mouton or le coquer is a spy who affects to be sentenced for some serious offence and whose skill consists in pretending to be a chum the chum in thieves slang is a skilled thief a professional who has cut himself adrift from society and means to remain a thief all his days and continues faithful through thick and thin to the laws of the swell mob crime and madness have a certain resemblance to see the prisoners of the conciergerie in the yard or the madman in the garden of an asylum is much the same thing prisoners and lunatics walk to and fro avoiding each other looking up with more or less strange or vicious glances according to the mood of the moment but never cheerful never grave they know each other or they dread each other the anticipation of their sentence remorse and apprehension give all these men exercising the anxious furtive look of the insane only the most consummate criminals have the audacity that apes the quietude of respectability the sincerity of a clear conscience as men of the better class are few and shame keeps the few whose crimes have brought them within doors the frequenters of the prison yard are for the most part dressed as workmen blouses long and short and velveteen jackets preponderate these coarse or dirty garments harmonizing with the coarse and sinister faces and brutal manner somewhat subdued indeed by the gloomy reflections that weigh on men in prison everything to the silence that reigns contributes to strike terror or disgust into the rare visitor who by high influence has obtained the privilege seldom granted of going over the conciergerie just as the sight of an anatomical museum where foul diseases are represented by wax models makes the youth who may be taken there more chaste and apt for nobler and purer love 
so the sight of the conciergerie and of the prison-yard filled with men marked for the hulks or the scaffold or some disgraceful punishment inspires many who might not fear that divine justice whose voice speaks so loudly to the conscience with a fear of human Section fifty six of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter five. As the men who were exercising in the prison yard when Trompe la Mort appeared there, were to be the actors in a scene of crowning importance in the life of jacques collin it will be well to depict a few of the principal personages of this sinister crowd here as everywhere when men are thrown together here as at school even force physical and moral wins the day here then as on the hulks crime stamps the man's rank those whose head is doomed are the aristocracy the prison yard as may be supposed is a school of criminal law which is far better learned there than at the hall on the place du panthéon a never-failing pleasantry is to rehearse the drama of the assize court to elect a president a jury a public prosecutor a counsel and to go through the whole trial this hideous farce is played before almost every great trial at this time a famous case was proceeding in the criminal court that of the dreadful murder committed on the persons of monsieur and madame crottat the notary's father and mother retired farmers who as this horrible business showed kept eight hundred thousand francs in gold in their house one of the men concerned in this double murder was the notorious Danepont, known as la pouraille a released convict who for five years had eluded the most active search on the part of the police under the protection of seven or eight different names this villain's disguises were so perfect that he had served two years of imprisonment under the name of del souk who was one of his own disciples and a famous thief though he never in any of his achievements went beyond the jurisdiction of the lower courts la pouraille had committed no less than three murders since his dismissal from the hulks the certainty that he would be executed not less than the large fortune he was supposed to have made this man an object of terror and admiration to his fellow prisoners for not a farthing of the stolen money had ever been recovered even after the events of july eighteen thirty some persons may remember the terror caused in paris by this daring crime worthy to compare in importance with the robbery of medals from the public library for the unhappy tendency of our age is to make a murder the more interesting in proportion to the greater sum of money secured by it la pouraille a small lean dry man with a face like a ferret forty-five years old and one of the celebrities of the prisons he had successively lived in since the age of nineteen knew jacques collin well how and why will be seen two other convicts brought with la pouraille from la force within these twenty-four hours had at once acknowledged and made the whole prison yard acknowledge the supremacy of this past master sealed to the scaffold one of these convicts a ticket of leave man named Célérier, alias l'auvergnat pere Rallot, and le rouleur who in the sphere known to the hulks as the swell mob was called fille de soie or silken thread a nickname he owed to the skill with which he slipped through the various perils of the business was an old ally of jacques collin's 
trompe la mort so keenly suspected fi de soi of playing a double part of being at once in the secrets of the swell mob and a spy laid by the police that he had supposed him to be the prime mover of his arrest in the maison vauquer in eighteen nineteen le pere goriot Célérier, whom we must call fi de soi as we shall also call Danepont la pouraille already guilty of evading surveillance was concerned in certain well-known robberies without bloodshed which would certainly take him back to the hulks for at least twenty years the other convict named rigancon and his kept woman known as la biffe were a most formidable couple members of the swell mob rigancon on very distant terms with the police from his earliest years was nicknamed le biffon biffon was the male of la biffe for nothing is sacred to the swell mob these fiends respect nothing neither the law nor religions nor even natural history whose solemn nomenclature it is seen is parodied by them here a digression is necessary for jacques collin's appearance in the prison-yard in the midst of his foes as had been so cleverly contrived by bibi lupin and the examining judge and the strange scenes to ensue would be incomprehensible and impossible without some explanation as to the world of thieves and of the hulks its laws its manners and above all its language its hideous figures of speech being indispensable in this portion of my tale so first of all a few words must be said as to the vocabulary of sharpers pickpockets thieves and murderers known as argo or thieves cant which has of late been introduced into literature with so much success that more than one word of that strange lingo is familiar on the rosy lips of ladies has been heard in gilded boudoirs and become the delight of princes who have often proclaimed themselves dun brown fluet and it must be owned to the surprise no doubt of many persons that no language is more vigorous or more vivid than that of this underground world which from the beginnings of countries with capitals has dwelt in cellars and slums in the third limbo of society everywhere le troisième dessous as the expressive and vivid slang of the theatres has it for is not the world a stage le troisième dessous is the lowest cellar under the stage at the opera where the machinery is kept and men stay who work it whence the footlights are raised the ghosts the blue devils shot up from hell and so forth every word of this language is a bold metaphor ingenious or horrible a man's breeches are his kicks or trucks montante a word that need not be explained in this language you do not sleep you snooze or doze pionce and note how vigorously expressive the word is of the sleep of the hunted weary distrustful animal called a thief which as soon as it is in safety drops rolls into the gulf of deep slumber so necessary under the mighty wings of suspicion always hovering over it a fearful sleep like that of a wild beast that can sleep nay and snore and yet its ears are alert with caution in this idiom everything is savage the syllables which begin or end the words are harsh and curiously startling a woman is a trip or a mall un largue and it is poetical too straw is la plume de bosse a farmyard feather bed the word midnight is paraphrased by twelve leads striking it makes one shiver Rince un cambriole is to screw the shop to rifle a room what a feeble expression is to go to bed in comparison with to dos 
people say make a new skin what picturesque imagery work your dominoes jouer des dominos is to eat how can men eat with the police at their heels and this language is always growing it keeps pace with civilization and is enriched with some new expression by every fresh invention the potato discovered and introduced by louis the sixteenth and parmentier was at once dubbed in french slang as the pig's orange orange à cochon the irish have called them bog oranges banknotes are invented the mob at once call them flimsies fafio garrote from garro the name of the cashier whose signature they bear flimsy fafio cannot you hear the rustle of the thin paper the thousand franc note is male flimsy in french the five hundred franc note is the female and convicts will you may be sure find some whimsical name for the hundred and two hundred franc notes in seventeen ninety guillotin invented with humane intent the expeditious machine which solved all the difficulties involved in the problem of capital punishment convicts and prisoners from the hulks forthwith investigated this contrivance standing as it did on the monarchical borderland of the old system and the frontier of modern legislation they instantly gave it the name of l'abbaye de montarugua they looked at the angle formed by the steel blade and described its action as reaping faucher and when it is remembered that the hulks are called the meadow le pre philologists must admire the inventiveness of these horrible vocables as charles nodier would have said the high antiquity of this kind of slang is also noteworthy a tenth of the words are of old romanesque origin another tenth are the old gaulish french of rabelais effondre to thrash a man to give him what for autolandre to annoy or to spur him cambriolet doing anything in a room aubert money gironde a beauty the name of a river of languedoc fouillus a pocket a cly are all french of the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries the word af meaning life is of the highest antiquity from af anything that disturbs life is called affre a rowing or scolding hence affre anything that troubles life about a hundred words are derived from the language of panurge a name symbolizing the people for it is derived from two greek words signifying all working science is changing the face of the world by constructing railroads in argo the train is le roulant vif the rattler the name given to the head while still on the shoulders la sorbonne shows the antiquity of this dialect which is mentioned by very early romance writers as cervantes the italian storytellers and aretino in all ages the mall the prostitute the heroine of so many old-world romances has been the protectress companion and comfort of the sharper the thief the pickpocket the area sneak and the burglar prostitution and robbery are the male and female forms of protest made by the natural state against the social state even philosophers the innovators of today the humanitarians with the communists and fourierists in their train come at last without knowing it to the same conclusion prostitution and theft the thief does not argue out questions of property of inheritance and social responsibility in sophistical books he absolutely ignores them to him theft is appropriating his own 
he does not discuss marriage he does not complain of it he does not insist in printed utopian dreams on the mutual consent and bond of souls which can never become general he pairs with a vehemence of which the bonds are constantly riveted by the hammer of necessity modern innovators write unctuous theories long drawn and nebulous or philanthropical romances but the thief acts he is as clear as a fact as logical as a blow and then his style another thing worth noting the world of prostitutes thieves and murderers of the galleys and the prisons forms a population of about sixty to eighty thousand souls men and women such a world is not to be disdained in a picture of modern manners and a literary reproduction of the social body the law the gendarmerie and the police constitute a body almost equal in number is not that strange this antagonism of persons perpetually seeking and avoiding each other and fighting a vast and highly dramatic duel are what are sketched in this study it has been the same thing with thieving and public harlotry as with the stage the police the priesthood and the gendarmerie in these six walks of life the individual contracts an indelible character he can no longer be himself the stigmata of ordination are as immutable as those of the soldier are and it is the same in other callings which are strongly in opposition strong contrasts with civilization these violent eccentric singular signs sui generis are what make the harlot the robber the murderer the ticket of leave man so easily recognizable by their foes the spy and the police to whom they are as game to the sportsman they have a gait a manner a complexion a look a color a smell in short infallible marks about them hence the highly developed art of disguise which the heroes of the hulks acquire one word yet as to the constitution of this world apart which the abolition of branding the mitigation of penalties and the silly leniency of juries are making a threatening evil in about twenty years paris will be beleaguered by an army of forty thousand reprieved criminals the department of the seine and its fifteen hundred thousand inhabitants being the only place in france where these poor wretches can be hidden to them paris is what the virgin forest is to beasts of prey the swell mob or more exactly the upper class of thieves which is the faubourg saint germain the aristocracy of the tribe had in eighteen sixteen after the peace which made life hard for so many men formed an association called les grands fonandelles the great pals consisting of the most noted master thieves and certain bold spirits at that time bereft of any means of living this word pal means brother friend and comrade all in one and these great pals the cream of the thieving fraternity for more than twenty years were the court of appeal the institute of learning and the chamber of peers of this community these men all had their private means with funds in common and a code of their own they knew each other and were pledged to help and succor each other in difficulties and they were all superior to the tricks or snares of the police had a charter of their own passwords and signs of recognition from eighteen fifteen to eighteen nineteen these dukes and peers of the prison world had formed the famous association of the ten thousand see le pere goriot so styled by reason of an agreement in virtue of which no job was to be undertaken by which less than ten thousand francs could be got at that very time in eighteen twenty nine to thirty 
some memoirs were brought out in which the collective force of this association and the names of the leaders were published by a famous member of the police force it was terrifying to find there an army of skilled rogues male and female so numerous so clever so constantly lucky that such thieves as pastorel collange or chimot men of fifty and sixty were described as outlaws from society from their earliest years what a confession of the ineptitude of justice that rogues so old should be at large jacques collin had been the cashier not only of the ten thousand but also of the great pals the heroes of the hulks competent authorities admit that the hulks have always owned large sums this curious fact is quite conceivable stolen goods are never recovered but in very singular cases the condemned criminal who can take nothing with him is obliged to trust somebody's honesty and capacity and to deposit his money as in the world of honest folks money is placed in a bank long ago bibi lupin now for ten years a chief of the department of public safety had been a member of the aristocracy of pals his treason had resulted from offended pride he had been constantly set aside in favor of trompe la mort's superior intelligence and prodigious strength hence his present vindictiveness against jacques collin hence also certain compromises between bibi lupin and his old companions which the magistrates were beginning to take seriously so in his desire for vengeance to which the examining judge had given play under the necessity of identifying jacques collin the chief of the safety had very skilfully chosen his allies by setting la pouraille fille de soie and le biffon on the sham spaniard for la pouraille and fille de soie both belonged to the ten thousand and le biffon was a great pal la biff le biffon's formidable trip who to this day evades all the pursuit of the police by her skill in disguising herself as a lady was at liberty this woman who successfully apes a marquise a countess a baroness keeps a carriage and men-servants this jacques collin in petticoats is the only woman who can compare with asie jacques collin's right hand and in fact every hero of the hulks is backed up by a devoted woman prison records and the secret papers of the law courts will tell you this no honest woman's love not even that of the bigot for her spiritual director has ever been greater than the attachment of a mistress who shares the dangers of a great criminal with these men a passion is almost always the first cause of their daring enterprises and murders the excessive love which constitutionally as the doctors say makes woman irresistible to them calls every moral and physical force of these powerful natures into action hence the idleness which consumes their days for excesses of passion necessitate sleep and restorative food hence their loathing of all work driving these creatures to have recourse to rapid ways of getting money and yet the need of a living and of high living violent as it is is but a trifle in comparison with the extravagance to which these generous medors are prompted by the mistress to whom they want to give jewels and dress and who always greedy love rich food the baggage wants a shawl the lover steals it and the woman sees in this a proof of love this is how robbery begins and robbery if we examine the human soul through a lens will be seen to be an almost natural instinct in man robbery leads to murder and murder 
leads the lover step by step to the scaffold ill-regulated physical desire is therefore in these men if we may believe the medical faculty at the root of seven-tenths of the crimes committed and indeed the proof is always found evident palpable at the post-mortem examination of the criminal after his execution and these monstrous lovers the scarecrows of society are adored by their mistresses it is this female devotion squatting faithfully at the prison gate always eagerly balking the cunning of the examiner and incorruptibly keeping the darkest secrets which makes so many trials impenetrable mysteries in this again lies the strength as well as the weakness of the accused in the vocabulary of a prostitute to be honest means to break none of the laws of this attachment to give all her money to the man who is nabbed to look after his comforts to be faithful to him in every way to undertake anything for his sake the bitterest insult one of these women can fling in the teeth of another wretched creature is to accuse her of infidelity to a lover in quad in prison in that case such a woman is considered to have no heart la Pouraille was passionately in love with a woman as will be seen fille de soie an egotistical philosopher who thieved to provide for the future was a good deal like paccard jacques collin's satellite who had fled with prudence servien and the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs between them he had no attachment he condemned women and loved no one but fille de soie as to le biffon he derived his nickname from his connection with la biff la biff is scavenging rag-picking and these three distinguished members of la haute pègre the aristocracy of roguery had a reckoning to demand of jacques collin accounts that were somewhat hard to bring to book no one but the cashier could know how many of his clients were still alive and what each man's share would be the mortality to which the depositors were peculiarly liable had formed a basis for trompe la mort's calculations when he resolved to embezzle the funds for lucien's benefit by keeping himself out of the way of the police and of his pals for nine years jacques collin was almost certain to have fallen heir by the terms of the agreement among the associates to two-thirds of the depositors besides could he not plead that he had repaid the pals who had been scragged in fact no one had any hold over these great pals his comrades trusted him by compulsion for the hunted life led by convicts necessitates the most delicate confidence between the gentry of this crew of savages so jacques collin a defaulter for a hundred thousand crowns might now possibly be quit for a hundred thousand francs at this moment as we see la Pouraille, one of jacques collin's creditors had but ninety days to live and la Pouraille, the possessor of a sum vastly greater no doubt than that place Section 57 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 6. One of the infallible signs by which prison governors and their agents, the police and warders, recognize old stagers chevaux de retour that is to say men who have already eaten beans les gourganes a kind of haricots provided for prison fare is their familiarity with prison ways 
those who have been in before of course know the manners and customs they are at home and nothing surprises them and jacques collin thoroughly on his guard had until now played his part to admiration as an innocent man and stranger both at la force and at the conciergerie but now broken by grief and by two deaths for he had died twice over during that dreadful night he was jacques collin once more the warder was astounded to find that the spanish priest needed no telling as to the way to the prison yard the perfect actor forgot his part he went down the corkscrew stairs in the tour bonbec as one who knew the conciergerie bibi lupin is right said the turnkey to himself he is an old stager he is jacques collin at the moment when trompe la mort appeared in the sort of frame to his figure made by the door into the tower the prisoners having made their purchases at the stone table called after saint louis were scattered about the yard always too small for their number so the newcomer was seen by all of them at once and all the more promptly because nothing can compare for keenness with the eye of a prisoner who in a prison yard feels like a spider watching in its web and this comparison is mathematically exact for the range of vision being limited on all sides by high dark walls the prisoners can always see even without looking at them the doors through which the warders come and go the windows of the parlor and the stairs of the tour bonbec the only exits from the yard in this utter isolation every trivial incident is an event everything is interesting the tedium a tedium like that of a tiger in a cage increases their alertness tenfold it is necessary to note that jacques collin dressed like a priest who is not strict as to costume wore black knee-breeches black stockings shoes with silver buckles a black waistcoat and a long coat of dark brown cloth of a certain cut that betrays the priest whatever he may do especially when these details are completed by a characteristic style of hair-cutting jacques collin's wig was eminently ecclesiastical and wonderfully natural hallo said la pouraille to le biffon that's a bad sign a rook sanglier a priest how did he come here he is one of their narcs truc spies of a new make replied fille de soie some runner with the bracelets marchand de lacet equivalent to a bow street runner looking out for his man the gendarme boasts of many names in french slang when he is after a thief he is the man with the bracelets marchand de lacet when he has him in charge he is a bird of ill omen hirondelle de la greve when he escorts him to the scaffold he is groom to the guillotine Usad de la guillotine to complete our study of the prison yard two more of the prisoners must be hastily sketched in Célérier, alias l'auvergnat alias le père Rallo, called le rouleur alias fille de soie he had thirty names and as many passports will henceforth be spoken of by this name only as he was called by no other among the swell mob this profound philosopher who saw a spy in the sham priest was a brawny fellow of about five feet eight whose muscles were all marked by strange bosses he had an enormous head in which a pair of half-closed eyes sparkled like fire the eyes of a bird of prey with gray dull skinny eyelids at first glance his face resembled that of a wolf his jaws were so broad powerful and prominent but the cruelty and even ferocity suggested by this likeness were counterbalanced 
by the cunning and eagerness of his face though it was scarred by the smallpox the margin of each scar being sharply cut gave a sort of wit to his expression it was seamed with ironies the life of a criminal a life of danger and thirst of nights spent bivouacking on the quays and river banks on bridges and streets and the orgies of strong drink by which successes are celebrated had laid as it were a varnish over these features fee de soie if seen in his undisguised person would have been marked by any constable or gendarme as his prey but he was a match for jacques collin in the arts of make-up and dress just now fee de soie in undress like a great actor who is well got up only on the stage wore a sort of shooting-jacket bereft of buttons and whose ripped buttonholes showed the white lining squalid green slippers nankin trousers now a dingy gray and on his head a cap without a peak under which an old bandana was tied streaky with rents and washed out le biffon was a complete contrast to fille de soie this famous robber short burly and fat but active with a livid complexion and deep-set black eyes dressed like a cook standing squarely on very bandy legs was alarming to behold for in his countenance all the features predominated that are most typical of the carnivorous beast fille de soie and le biffon were always wheedling la Pouraille, who had lost all hope the murderer knew that he would be tried sentenced and executed within four months indeed fille de soie and le biffon la Pouraille's chums never called him anything but le chanoine de l'abbaye de montaureguet a grim paraphrase for a man condemned to the guillotine it is easy to understand why fille de soie and le biffon should fawn on la Pouraille. the man had somewhere hidden two hundred and fifty thousand francs in gold his share of the spoil found in the house of the crottaz the victims in newspaper phrase what a splendid fortune to leave to two pals though the two old stagers would be sent back to the galleys within a few days le biffon and fille de soie would be sentenced for a term of fifteen years for robbery with violence without prejudice to the ten years penal servitude on a former sentence which they had taken the liberty of cutting short so though one had twenty-two and the other twenty-six years of imprisonment to look forward to they both hoped to escape and come back to find la Pouraille's mine of gold but the ten thousand man kept his secret he did not see the use of telling it before he was sentenced he belonged to the upper ten of the hulks and had never betrayed his accomplices his temper was well known m popinot who had examined him had not been able to get anything out of him this terrible trio were at the further end of the prison-yard that is to say near the better class of cells fille de soie was giving a lecture to a young man who was in for his first offence and who being certain of ten years penal servitude was gaining information as to the various convict establishments well my boy fille de soie was saying sententiously as jacques collin appeared on the scene the difference between brest toulon and rochefort is well old cock said the lad with the curiosity of a novice this prisoner a man of good family accused of forgery had come down from the cell next to that where lucien had been my son fille de soie went on at brest you are sure to get some beans at the third turn if you dip your spoon in the bowl at toulon you never get any till the fifth 
and at rochefort you get none at all unless you are an old hand having spoken the philosopher joined le biffon and la pouraille and all three greatly puzzled by the priest walked down the yard while jacques collin lost in grief came up it trompe la mort absorbed in terrible meditations the meditations of a fallen emperor did not think of himself as the centre of observation the object of general attention and he walked slowly gazing at the fatal window where lucien had hanged himself none of the prisoners knew of this catastrophe since for reasons to be presently explained the young forger had not mentioned the subject the three pals agreed to cross the priest's path he is no priest said fi de soie he is an old stager look how he drags his right foot it is needful to explain here for not every reader has had a fancy to visit the galleys that each convict is chained to another an old one and a young one always as a couple the weight of this chain riveted to a ring above the ankle is so great as to induce a limp which the convict never loses being obliged to exert one leg much more than the other to drag this fetter manicle is the slang name for such irons the prisoner inevitably gets into the habit of making the effort afterwards though he no longer wears the chain it acts upon him still as a man still feels an amputated leg the convict is always conscious of the anklet and can never get over that trick of walking in police slang he drags his right and this sign as well known to convicts among themselves as it is to the police even if it does not help to identify a comrade at any rate confirms recognition in trompe la mort who had escaped eight years since this trick had to a great extent worn off but just now lost in reflections he walked at such a slow and solemn pace that slight as the limp was it was strikingly evident to so practised an eye as la Pourais and it is quite intelligible that convicts always thrown together as they must be and never having any one else to study will so thoroughly have watched each other's faces and appearance that certain tricks will have impressed them which may escape their systematic foes spies gendarmes and police inspectors thus it was a peculiar twitch of the maxillary muscles of the left cheek recognized by a convict who was sent to a review of the legion of the seine which led to the arrest of the lieutenant-colonel of that corps the famous coignard for in spite of bibi lupin's confidence the police could not dare believe that the comte ponty de saint hélène and coignard were one and the same man he is our boss dab or master said fi de soie seeing in jacques collin's eyes the vague glance a man sunk in despair casts on all his surroundings by jingo yes it is trompe la mort said le biffon rubbing his hands yes it is his cut his build but what has he done to himself he looks quite different i know what he is up to cried fi de soie he has some plan in his head he wants to see the boy sa tante who is to be executed before long the persons known in prison as tante or aunts may be best described in the ingenious words of the governor of one of the great prisons to the late lord durham who during his stay in paris visited every prison so curious was he to see every detail of french justice that he even persuaded sanson at that time the executioner to erect the scaffold and decapitate a living calf that he might thoroughly understand the working of the machine made famous by the revolution 
the governor having shown him everything the yards the workshops and the underground cells pointed to a part of the building and said i need not take your lordship there it is the quartier des tantes oh said lord durham what are they the third sex my lord and they are going to scrag theodore said la pouraille such a pretty boy and such a light hand such cheek what a loss to society yes theodore calvi is yamming his last meal said le biffon his trips will pipe their eyes for the little beggar was a great pet so you're here old chap said la pouraille to jacques collin and arm in arm with his two acolytes he barred the way to the new arrival why boss have you got yourself japanned he went on i hear you have nobbled our pile stolen our money le biffon added in a threatening tone you have just got to stump up the tin said fille de soie the three questions were fired at him like three pistol shots do not make game of an unhappy priest sent here by mistake jacques collin replied mechanically recognizing his three comrades that is the sound of his pipe if it is not quite the cut of his mug said la pouraille laying his hand on jacques collin's shoulder this action and the sight of his three chums startled the boss out of his dejection and brought him back to a consciousness of reality for during that dreadful night he had lost himself in the infinite spiritual world of feeling seeking some new road do not blow the gaff on your boss said jacques collin in a hollow threatening tone not unlike the low growl of a lion the reelers are here let them make fools of themselves i am faking to help a pal who is awfully down on his luck he spoke with the unction of a priest trying to convert the wretched and a look which flashed round the yard took in the warders under the archways and pointed them out with a wink to his three companions are there not narks about keep your peepers open and a sharp lookout don't know me nanty parnarly and soap me down for a priest or i will do for you all you and your malls and your blunt what do you funk our blabbing said fille de soie have you come to help your boy to guy madeleine is getting ready to be turned off in the square the place de greve said la pouraille theodore said jacques collin repressing a start and a cry they will have his nut off la pouraille went on he was booked for the scaffold two months ago jacques collin felt sick his knees almost failed him but his three comrades held him up and he had the presence of mind to clasp his hands with an expression of contrition la pouraille and le biffon respectfully supported the sacrilegious trompe la mort while fille de soie ran to a warder on guard at the gate leading to the parlor that venerable priest wants to sit down send out a chair for him said he and so bibi lupin's plot had failed trompe la mort like a napoleon recognized by his soldiers had won the submission and respect of the three felons two words had done it your malls and your blunt your women and your money epitomizing every true affection of man this threat was to the three convicts an indication of supreme power the boss still had their fortune in his hands still omnipotent outside the prison their boss had not betrayed them as the false pal said their chief's immense reputation for skill and inventiveness stimulated their curiosity for in prison curiosity is the only goad of these blighted spirits 
and jacques collin's daring disguise kept up even under the bolts and locks of the conciergerie dazzled the three felons i have been in close confinement for four days and did not know that theodore was so near the abbaye said jacques collin i came in to save the poor little chap who scragged himself here yesterday at four o'clock and now here is another misfortune i have not an ace in my hand poor old boy said fi de soie old scratch has cut me cried jacques collin tearing himself free from his supporters and drawing himself up with a fierce look there comes a time when the world is too many for us the beaks gobble us up at last the governor of the conciergerie informed of the spanish priest's weak state came himself to the prison-yard to observe him he made him sit down on a chair in the sun studying him with the keen acumen which increases day by day in the practice of such functions though hidden under an appearance of indifference oh heaven cried jacques collin to be mixed up with such creatures the dregs of society felons and murderers but god will not desert his servant my dear sir my stay here shall be marked by deeds of charity which shall live in men's memories i will convert these unhappy creatures they shall learn they have souls that life eternal awaits them and that though they have lost all on earth they still may win in heaven heaven which they may purchase by true and genuine repentance twenty or thirty prisoners had gathered in a group behind the three terrible convicts whose ferocious looks had kept a space of three feet between them and their inquisitive companions and they heard this address spoken with evangelical unction ah monsieur go said the formidable la Pouraille. we will listen to what this one may say i have been told jacques collin went on that there is in this prison a man condemned to death the rejection of his appeal is at this moment being read to him said m gault i do not know what that means said jacques collin artlessly looking about him golly what a flat said the young fellow who a few minutes since had asked fi de soie about the beans on the hulks why it means that he is to be scragged to-day or to-morrow scragged asked jacques collin whose air of innocence and ignorance filled his three pals with admiration in their slang said the governor that means that he will suffer the penalty of death if the clerk is reading the appeal the executioner will no doubt have orders for the execution the unhappy man has persistently refused the offices of the chaplain ah monsieur le directeur this is a soul to save cried jacques collin and the sacrilegious wretch clasped his hands with the expression of a despairing lover which to the watchful governor seemed nothing less than divine fervor ah monsieur trompe la mort went on let me prove to you what i am and how much i can do by allowing me to incite that hardened heart to repentance god has given me a power of speech which produces great changes i crush men's hearts i open them what are you afraid of send me with an escort of gendarmes of turnkeys whom you will i will inquire whether the prison chaplain will allow you to take his place said m gault and the governor withdrew struck by the expression perfectly indifferent though inquisitive with which the convicts and the prisoners on remand stared at this priest whose unctuous tones lent a charm to his half french half spanish lingo how did you come in here monsieur l'abbe asked the youth who had questioned fi de soie 
oh by a mistake replied jacques collin eyeing the young gentleman from head to foot i was found in the house of a courtesan who had died and was immediately robbed it was proved that she had killed herself and the thieves probably the servants have not yet been caught and it was for that theft that your young man hanged himself the poor boy no doubt could not endure the thought of being blighted by his unjust imprisonment said trompe la mort raising his eyes to heaven ay said the young man they were coming to set him free just when he had killed himself what bad luck only innocent souls can be thus worked on by their imagination said jacques collin for observe he was the loser by the theft how much money was it asked fi de soie the deep and cunning seven hundred and fifty thousand francs said jacques collin blandly the three convicts looked at each other and withdrew from the group that had gathered round the sham priest he screwed the mall's place himself said fi de soie in a whisper to le biffon and they want to put us in a blue funk for our cartwheels tune de bal five franc pieces he will always be the boss of the swells replied la pouraille our pieces are safe enough la pouraille wishing to find some man he could trust had an interest in considering jacques collin an honest man and in prison of all places a man believes what he hopes i lay you anything he will come round the big boss and save his chum said fi de soie if he does that said le biffon though i don't believe he is really god he must certainly have smoked a pipe with old scratch as they say didn't you hear him say old scratch has cut me said fi de soie oh cried la pouraille if only he would save my nut what a time i would have with my whack of the shiners and the yellow boys i have stowed do what he bids you said fi de soie you don't say so retorted la pouraille looking at his pal what a flat you are you will be booked for the abbaye said le biffon you have no other door to budge if you want to keep on your pins to yam wet your whistle and fake to the end you must take his orders that's all right said la pouraille there is not one of us that will blow the gaff or if he does i will take him where i am going Section 58 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Voltrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 7. The least sympathetic reader, who has no pity for this strange race, may conceive of the state of mind of Jacques Collin finding himself between the dead body of the idol whom he had been bewailing during five hours that night and the imminent end of his former comrade the dead body of theodore the young corsican only to see the boy would demand extraordinary cleverness to save him would need a miracle but he was thinking of it for the better comprehension of what jacques collin proposed to attempt it must be remarked that murderers and thieves all the men who people the galleys are not so formidable as is generally supposed with a few rare exceptions these creatures are all cowards in consequence no doubt of the constant alarms which weigh on their spirit the faculties being perpetually on the stretch in thieving and the success of a stroke of business depending on the exertion of every vital force 
with a readiness of wit to match their dexterity of hand and an alertness which exhausts the nervous system these violent exertions of will once over they become stupid just as a singer or a dancer drops quite exhausted after a fatiguing pas seul or one of those tremendous duets which modern composers inflict on the public malefactors are in fact so entirely bereft of common sense or so much oppressed by fear that they become absolutely childish credulous to the last degree they are caught by the bird-lime of the simplest snare when they have done a successful job they are in such a state of prostration that they immediately rush into the debaucheries they crave for they get drunk on wine and spirits and throw themselves madly into the arms of their women to recover composure by dint of exhausting their strength and to forget their crime by forgetting their reason then they are at the mercy of the police when once they are in custody they lose their head and long for hope so blindly that they believe anything indeed there is nothing too absurd for them to accept it an instance will suffice to show how far the simplicity of a criminal who has been nabbed will carry him bibi lupin not long before had extracted a confession from a murderer of nineteen by making him believe that no one under age was ever executed when this lad was transferred to the conciergerie to be sentenced after the rejection of his appeal this terrible man came to see him are you sure you are not yet twenty said he yes i am only nineteen and a half well then replied bibi lupin you may be quite sure of one thing you will never see twenty why because you will be scragged within three days replied the police agent the murderer who had believed even after sentence was passed that a minor would never be executed collapsed like an omelette souffle such men cruel only from the necessity for suppressive evidence for they murder only to get rid of witnesses and this is one of the arguments adduced by those who desire the abrogation of capital punishment these giants of dexterity and skill whose sleight of hand whose rapid sight whose every sense is as alert as that of a savage are heroes of evil only on the stage of their exploits not only do their difficulties begin as soon as the crime is committed for they are as much bewildered by the need for concealing the stolen goods as they were depressed by necessity but they are as weak as a woman in childbed the vehemence of their schemes is terrific in success they become like children in a word their nature is that of the wild beast easy to kill when it is full fed in prison these strange beings are men in dissimulation and in secretiveness which never yields till the last moment when they are crushed and broken by the tedium of imprisonment it may hence be understood how it was that the three convicts instead of betraying their chief were eager to serve him and as they suspected he was now the owner of the stolen seven hundred and fifty thousand francs they admired him for his calm resignation under bolt and bar of the conciergerie believing him capable of protecting them all when m gault left the sham priest he returned through the parlor to his office and went in search of bibi lupin who for twenty minutes since jacques collin had gone downstairs had been on the watch with his eye at a peephole in a window looking out on the prison yard not one of them recognized him said m gault and napolita who is on duty did not hear a word the poor priest all through the night in his deep distress did not say a word which could imply that his gown covers jacques collin that shows that he is used to prison life said the police agent napolita bibi lupin's secretary being unknown to the criminals then in the conciergerie was playing the part of the young gentleman imprisoned for forgery 
well but he wishes to be allowed to hear the confession of the young fellow who is sentenced to death said the governor to be sure that is our last chance cried bibi lupin i had forgotten that theodore calvi the young corsican was the man chained to jacques collin they say that on the hulks jacques collin made him famous pads the convicts on the galleys contrive a kind of pad to slip between their skin and the fetters to deaden the pressure of the iron ring on their ankles and instep these pads made of tow and rags are known as pataras who is warder over the man asked bibi lupin Ker la virole very well i will go and make up as a gendarme and be on the watch i shall hear what they say i will be even with them but if it should be jacques collin are you not afraid of his recognizing you and throttling you said the governor to bibi lupin as a gendarme i shall have my sword replied the other and besides if he is jacques collin he will never do anything that will risk his neck and if he is a priest i shall be safe then you have no time to lose said m gault it is half-past eight father sauteloup has just read the reply to his appeal and m sanson is waiting in the order-room yes it is to-day's job the widow Cesars, les hussards de la veuve another horrible name for the functionaries of the guillotine are ordered out replied bibi lupin still i cannot wonder that the prosecutor-general should hesitate the boy has always declared that he is innocent and there is in my opinion no conclusive evidence against him he is a thorough corsican said m gault he has not said a word and has held firm all through the last words of the governor of the prison summed up the dismal tale of a man condemned to die a man cut off from among the living by law belongs to the bench the bench is paramount it is answerable to nobody it obeys its own conscience the prison belongs to the bench which controls it absolutely poetry has taken possession of this social theme the man condemned to death a subject truly apt to strike the imagination and poetry has been sublime on it prose has no resource but fact still the fact is appalling enough to hold its own against verse the existence of a condemned man who has not confessed his crime or betrayed his accomplices is one of fearful torment this is no case of iron boots of water poured into the stomach or of limbs racked by hideous machinery it is hidden and so to speak negative torture the condemned wretch is given over to himself with a companion whom he cannot but trust the amiability of modern philanthropy fancies it has understood the dreadful torment of isolation but this is a mistake since the abolition of torture the bench in a natural anxiety to reassure the too sensitive consciences of the jury had guessed what a terrible auxiliary isolation would prove to justice in seconding remorse solitude is void and nature has as great a horror of a moral void as she has of a physical vacuum solitude is habitable only to a man of genius who can people it with ideas the children of the spiritual world or to one who contemplates the works of the creator to whom it is bright with the light of heaven alive with the breath and voice of god excepting for these two beings so near to paradise solitude is to the mind what torture is to the body between solitude and the torture chamber there is all the difference that there is between a nervous malady and a surgical disease it is suffering multiplied by infinitude the body borders on the infinite through its nerves as the spirit does through thought and in fact in the annals of the paris law courts the criminals who do not confess can be easily counted 
this terrible situation which in some cases assumes appalling importance in politics for instance when a dynasty or a state is involved will find a place in the human comedy but here a description of the stone box in which after the restoration the law shut up a man condemned to death in paris may serve to give an idea of the terrors of a felon's last day on earth before the revolution of july there was in the conciergerie and indeed there still is a condemned cell this room backing on the governor's office is divided from it by a thick wall in strong masonry and the other side of it is formed by a wall seven or eight feet thick which supports one end of the immense salle des pas perdus it is entered through the first door in the long dark passage in which the eye loses itself when looking from the middle of the vaulted gateway this ill-omened room is lighted by a funnel barred by a formidable grating and hardly perceptible on going into the conciergerie yard for it has been pierced in the narrow space between the office window close to the railing of the gateway and the place where the office clerk sits a den like a cupboard contrived by the architect at the end of the entrance court this position accounts for the fact that the room thus enclosed between four immensely thick walls should have been devoted when the conciergerie was reconstituted to this terrible and funereal service escape is impossible the passage leading to the cells for solitary confinement and to the women's quarters faces the stove where gendarmes and warders are always collected together the air-hole the only outlet to the open air is nine feet above the floor and looks out on the first court which is guarded by sentries at the outer gate no human power can make any impression on the walls besides a man sentenced to death is at once secured in a strait waistcoat a garment which precludes all use of the hands he is chained by one foot to his camp bed and he has a fellow prisoner to watch and attend on him the room is paved with thick flags and the light is so dim that it is hard to see anything it is impossible not to feel chilled to the marrow on going in even now though for sixteen years the cell has never been used in consequence of the changes effected in paris in the treatment of criminals under sentence imagine the guilty man there with his remorse for company in silence and darkness two elements of horror and you will wonder how he ever failed to go mad what a nature must that be whose temper can resist such treatment with the added misery of enforced idleness and inaction and yet theodore calvi a corsican now twenty-seven years of age muffled as it were in a shroud of absolute reserve had for two months held out against the effects of this dungeon and the insidious chatter of the prisoner placed to entrap him these were the strange circumstances under which the corsican had been condemned to death though the case is a very curious one our account of it must be brief it is impossible to introduce a long digression at the climax of a narrative already so much prolonged since its only interest is in so far as it concerns jacques collin the vertebral column so to speak which by its sinister persistency connects le pere goriot with illusion perdue and illusion perdue with this study and indeed the reader's imagination will be able to work out the obscure case which at this moment was causing great uneasiness to the jury of the sessions before whom theodore calvi had been tried for a whole week since the criminal's appeal had been rejected by the supreme court m de granville had been worrying himself over the case and postponing from day to day the order for carrying out the sentence so anxious was he to reassure the jury by announcing that on the threshold of death the accused had confessed the crime a poor widow of nanterre whose dwelling stood apart from the township 
which is situated in the midst of the infertile plain lying between mount valerien saint germain the hills of sartreville and argentoy had been murdered and robbed a few days after coming into her share of an unexpected inheritance this windfall amounted to three thousand francs a dozen silver spoons and forks a gold watch and chain and some linen instead of depositing the three thousand francs in paris as she was advised by the notary of the wine merchant who had left it her the old woman insisted on keeping it by her in the first place she had never seen so much money of her own and then she distrusted everybody in every kind of affairs as most common and country folk do after long discussion with a wine merchant of nanterre a relation of her own and of the wine merchant who had left her the money the widow decided on buying an annuity on selling her house at nanterre and living in the town of saint germain the house she was living in with a good-sized garden enclosed by a slight wooden fence was the poor sort of dwelling usually built by small landowners in the neighborhood of paris it had been hastily constructed with no architectural design of cement and rubble the materials commonly used near paris where as at nanterre they are extremely abundant the ground being everywhere broken by quarries open to the sky this is the ordinary hut of the civilized savage the house consisted of a ground floor and one floor above with garrets in the roof the quarryman her deceased husband and the builder of this dwelling had put strong iron bars to all the windows the front door was remarkably thick the man knew that he was alone there in the open country and what a country his customers were the principal master masons in paris so the more important materials for his house which stood within five hundred yards of his quarry had been brought out in his own carts returning empty he could choose such as suited him where houses were pulled down and got them very cheap thus the window frames the ironwork the doors shutters and wooden fittings were all derived from sanctioned pilfering presents from his customers and good ones carefully chosen of two window frames he could take the better the house entered from a large stable yard was screened from the road by a wall the gate was of strong iron railing watch-dogs were kept in the stables and a little dog indoors at night there was a garden of more than two acres behind his widow without children lived here with only a woman servant the sale of the quarry had paid off the owner's debts he had been dead about two years this isolated house was the widow's sole possession and she kept fowls and cows selling the eggs and milk at nanterre having no stable boy or carter or quarryman her husband had made them do every kind of work she no longer kept up the garden she only gathered the few greens and roots that the stony ground allowed to grow self-sown the price of the house with the money she had inherited would amount to seven or eight thousand francs and she could fancy herself living very happily at saint germain on seven or eight hundred francs a year which she thought she could buy with her eight thousand francs she had had many discussions over this with the notary at saint germain for she refused to hand her money over for an annuity to the wine merchant at nanterre who was anxious to have it under these circumstances then after a certain day the widow picot and her servant were seen no more the front gate the house door the shutters all were closed at the end of three days the police being informed made inquisition monsieur popinot the examining judge and the public prosecutor arrived from paris and this was what they reported neither the outer gate nor the front door showed any marks of violence the key was in the lock of the door inside not a single bar had been wrenched 
the locks shutters and bolts were all untampered with the walls showed no traces that could betray the passage of the criminals the chimney posts of red clay afforded no opportunity for ingress or escape and the roofing was sound and unbroken showing no damage by violence on entering the first floor rooms the magistrates the gendarmes and bibi lupin found the widow pigot strangled in her bed and the woman strangled in hers each by means of the bandana she wore as a nightcap the three thousand francs were gone with the silver plate and the trinkets the two bodies were decomposing as were those of the little dog and of a large yard dog the wooden palings of the garden were examined none were broken the garden paths showed no trace of footsteps the magistrate thought it probable that the robber had walked on the grass to leave no footprints if he had come that way but how could he have got into the house the back door to the garden had an outer guard of three iron bars uninjured and there too the key was in the lock inside as in the front door all these impossibilities having been duly noted by monsieur popinot by bibi lupin who stayed there a day to examine every detail by the public prosecutor himself and by the sergeant of the gendarmerie at nanterre this murder became an agitating mystery in which the law and the police were nonplussed this drama published in the gazette des tribunaux took place in the winter of eighteen twenty eight to twenty nine god alone knows what excitement this puzzling crime occasioned in paris but paris has a new drama to watch every morning and forgets everything the police on the contrary forgets nothing three months after this fruitless inquiry a girl of the town whose extravagance had invited the attention of bibi lupin's agents who watched her as being the ally of several thieves tried to persuade a woman she knew to pledge twelve silver spoons and forks and a gold watch and chain the friend refused this came to bibi lupin's ears and he remembered the plate and the watch and chain stolen at nanterre the commissioners of the monde de piete and all the receivers of stolen goods were warned while manon la blonde was subjected to unremitting scrutiny it was very soon discovered that manon la blonde was madly in love with a young man who was never to be seen and was supposed to be deaf to all the fair manon's proofs of devotion mystery on mystery however this youth under the diligent attentions of police spies was soon seen and identified as an escaped convict the famous hero of the corsican vendetta the handsome theodore calvi known as madeleine a man was turned on to entrap calvi one of those double-dealing buyers of stolen goods who serve the thieves and the police both at once he promised to purchase the silver and the watch and chain at the moment when the dealer of the cour saint guillaume was counting out the cash to theodore dressed as a woman at half-past six in the evening the police came in and seized theodore and the property the inquiry was at once begun on such thin evidence it was impossible to pass a sentence of death calvi never swerved he never contradicted himself he said that a countrywoman had sold him these objects at argentoy that after buying them the excitement over the murder committed at nanterre had shown him the danger of keeping this plate and watch and chain in his possession since in fact they were proved by the inventory made after the death of the wine merchant the widow pigot's uncle to be those that were stolen from her compelled at last by poverty to sell them he said he wished to dispose of them by the intervention of a person to whom no suspicion could attach and nothing else could be extracted from the convict who by his taciturnity and firmness contrived to insinuate that the wine merchant at nanterre had committed the crime 
and that the woman of whom he theodore had bought them was the wine merchant's wife the unhappy man and his wife were both taken into custody but after a week's imprisonment it was amply proved that neither the husband nor the wife had been out of their house at the time also calvi failed to recognize in the wife the woman who as he declared had sold him the things as it was shown that calvi's mistress implicated in the case had spent about a thousand francs since the date of the crime and the day when calvi tried to pledge the plate and trinkets the evidence seemed strong enough to commit calvi and the girl for trial this murder being the eighteenth which theodore had committed he was condemned to death for he seemed certainly to be guilty of this skilfully contrived crime though he did not recognize the wine merchant's wife both she and her husband recognized him the inquiry had proved by the evidence of several witnesses that theodore had been living at nanterre for about a month he had worked at a mason's his face whitened with plaster and his clothes very shabby at nanterre the lad was supposed to be about eighteen years old for the whole month he must have been nursing that brat nourrice poupon that is hatching the crime the lawyers thought he must have had accomplices the chimney-pots were measured and compared with the size of manon la blonde's body to see if she could have got in that way but a child of six could not have passed up or down those red clay pipes which in modern buildings take the place of the vast chimneys of old-fashioned houses but for this singular and annoying difficulty theodore would have been executed within a week Section fifty nine of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honore de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter eight. All this business and the name of Calvi must have escaped the notice of Jacques Collin who at the time was absorbed in his single-handed struggle with contenson corentin and peyrade it had indeed been a point with trompe la mort to forget as far as possible his chums and all that had to do with the law courts he dreaded a meeting which should bring him face to face with a pal who might demand an account of his boss which collin could not possibly render the governor of the prison went forthwith to the public prosecutor's court where he found the attorney-general in conversation with m de granville an order for the execution in his hand m de granville who had spent the whole night at the hotel de serizy was in consequence of this important case obliged to give a few hours to his duties though overwhelmed with fatigue and grief for the physicians could not yet promise that the countess would recover her sanity after speaking a few words to the governor m de granville took the warrant from the attorney and placed it in gault's hands let the matter proceed said he unless some extraordinary circumstances should arise of this you must judge i trust to your judgment the scaffold need not be erected till half-past ten so you still have an hour on such an occasion hours are centuries and many things may happen in a century do not allow him to think he is reprieved prepare the man for execution if necessary and if nothing comes of that give sanson the warrant at half-past nine let him wait as the governor of the prison left the public prosecutor's room under the archway of the passage into the hall he met m camusot who was going there he exchanged a few hurried words with the examining judge and after telling him what had been done in the conciergerie with regard to jacques collin he went on to witness the meeting of trompe la mort and madeleine and he did not allow the so-called priest to see the condemned criminal 
till bibi lupin admirably disguised as a gendarme had taken the place of the prisoner left in charge of the young corsican no words can describe the amazement of the three convicts when a warder came to fetch jacques collin and led him to the condemned cell with one consent they rushed up to the chair on which jacques collin was sitting to-day isn't it monsieur asked fi de soie of the warder yes jack ketch is waiting said the man with perfect indifference charlot is the name by which the executioner is known to the populace and the prison world in paris the nickname dates from the revolution of seventeen eighty nine the words produced a great sensation the prisoners looked at each other it is all over with him the warder went on the warrant has been delivered to monsieur go and the sentence has just been read to him and so the fair madeleine has received the last sacraments said la pouraille and he swallowed a deep mouthful of air poor little theodore cried le biffon he is a pretty chap too what a pity to drop your nut éternué dans le son so young the warder went towards the gate thinking that jacques collin was at his heels but the spaniard walked very slowly and when he was getting near to julien he tottered and signed to la pouraille to give him his arm he is a murderer said napolita to the priest pointing to la pouraille and offering his own arm no to me he is an unhappy wretch replied jacques collin with the presence of mind and the unction of the archbishop of cambrai and he drew away from napolita of whom he had been very suspicious from the first then he said to his pals in an undertone he is on the bottom step of the abbaye de montaregret but i am the prior i will show you how well i know how to come round the beaks i mean to snatch this boy's nut from their jaws for the sake of his breeches said fi de soie with a smile i mean to win his soul to heaven replied jacques collin fervently seeing some other prisoners about him and he joined the warder at the gate he got in to save madeleine said fi de soie we guessed rightly what a boss he is but how can he jack catch's men are waiting he will not even see the kid objected le biffon the devil is on his side cried la pouraille he claim our blunt never he is too fond of his old chums we are too useful to him they wanted to make us blow the gaff but we are not such flats if he saves his madeleine i will tell him all my secrets the effect of this speech was to increase the devotion of the three convicts to their boss for at this moment he was all their hope jacques collin in spite of madeleine's peril did not forget to play his part though he knew the conciergerie as well as he knew the hulks in the three ports he blundered so naturally that the warder had to tell him this way that way till they reached the office there at a glance jacques collin recognized a tall stout man leaning on the stove with a long red face not without distinction it was sanson monsieur is the chaplain said he going towards him with simple cordiality the mistake was so shocking that it froze the bystanders no monsieur said sanson i have other functions sanson the father of the last executioner of that name for he has recently been dismissed was the son of the man who beheaded louis the sixteenth after four centuries of hereditary office this descendant of so many executioners had tried to repudiate the traditional burden the sansons were for two hundred years executioners at rouen before being promoted to the first rank in the kingdom and had carried out the decrees of justice from father to son since the thirteenth century 
few families can boast of an office or of nobility handed down in a direct line during six centuries this young man had been captain in a cavalry regiment and was looking forward to a brilliant military career when his father insisted on his help in decapitating the king then he made his son his deputy when in seventeen ninety three two guillotines were in constant work one at the barriere du trône and the other in the place de greve this terrible functionary now a man of about sixty was remarkable for his dignified air his gentle and deliberate manners and his entire contempt for bibi lupin and his acolytes who fed the machine the only detail which betrayed the blood of the medieval executioner was the formidable breadth and thickness of his hands well informed too caring greatly for his position as a citizen and an elector and an enthusiastic florist this tall brawny man with his low voice his calm reserve his few words and a high bald forehead was like an english nobleman rather than an executioner and a spanish priest would certainly have fallen into the mistake which jacques collin had intentionally made he is no convict said the head warder to the governor i begin to think so too replied m gault with a nod to that official jacques collin was led to the cellar-like room where theodore calvi in a strait waistcoat was sitting on the edge of the wretched camp-bed trompe la mort under a transient gleam of light from the passage at once recognized bibi lupin in the gendarme who stood leaning on his sword io sono gabamotto parla nostro italiano said jacques collin very rapidly lingo ti salvar i am trompe la mort talk our italian i have come to save you all the two chums wanted to say had of course to be incomprehensible to the pretended gendarme and as bibi lupin was left in charge of the prisoner he could not leave his post the man's fury was quite indescribable theodore calvi a young man with a pale olive complexion light hair and hollow dull blue eyes well built hiding prodigious strength under the lymphatic appearance that is not uncommon in southerners would have had a charming face but for the strongly arched eyebrows and low forehead that gave him a sinister expression scarlet lips of savage cruelty and a twitching of the muscles peculiar to corsicans denoting that excessive irritability which makes them so prompt to kill in any sudden squabble theodore startled at the sound of that voice raised his head and at first thought himself the victim of a delusion but as the experience of two months had accustomed him to the darkness of this stone box he looked at the sham priest and sighed deeply he did not recognize jacques collin whose face scarred by the application of sulphuric acid was not that of his old boss it is really your shock i am your confessor and have come to get you off do not be such a ninny as to know me and speak as if you were making a confession he spoke with the utmost rapidity this young fellow is very much depressed he is afraid to die he will confess everything said jacques collin addressing the gendarme bibi lupin dared not say a word for fear of being recognized say something to show me that you are he you have nothing but his voice said theodore you see poor boy he assures me that he is innocent said jacques collin to bibi lupin who dared not speak for fear of being recognized sempre me said jacques returning close to theodore and speaking the word in his ear sempre ti replied theodore giving the countersign yes you are the boss did you do the trick yes tell me the whole story that i may see what can be done to save you make haste jack ketch is waiting 
the corsican at once knelt down and pretended to be about to confess bibi lupin did not know what to do for the conversation was so rapid that it hardly took as much time as it does to read it theodore hastily told all the details of the crime of which jacques collin knew nothing the jury gave their verdict without proof he said finally child you want to argue when they are waiting to cut off your hair but i might have been sent to spout the wedge and that is the way they judge you and in paris too but how did you do the job asked trompe la mort ah there you are since i saw you i made acquaintance with a girl a corsican i met when i came to paris men who are such fools as to love a woman cried jacques collin always come to grief that way they are tigers on the loose tigers who blab and look at themselves in the glass you were a gaby but well what good did she do you that curse of a mall that duck of a girl no taller than a bundle of firewood as slippery as an eel and as nimble as a monkey got in at the top of the oven and opened the front door the dogs were well crammed with balls and as dead as herrings i settled the two women then when i got the swag ginetta locked the door and got out again by the oven such a clever dodge deserves life said jacques collin admiring the execution of the crime as a sculptor admires the modelling of a figure and i was fool enough to waste all that cleverness for a thousand crowns no for a woman replied jacques collin i tell you they deprive us of all our wits and jacques collin eyed theodore with a flashing glance of contempt but you were not there said the corsican i was all alone and do you love the slut asked jacques collin feeling that the reproach was a just one oh i want to live but it is for you now rather than for her be quite easy i am not called trompe la mort for nothing i undertake the case what life cried the lad lifting his swaddled hands towards the damp vault of the cell my little madeleine prepare to be lagged for life penal servitude replied jacques collin you can expect no less they won't crown you with roses like a fatted ox when they first set us down for rochefort it was because they wanted to be rid of us but if i can get you ticketed for toulon you can get out and come back to pantin paris where i will find you a tidy way of living a sigh such as had rarely been heard under that inexorable roof struck the stones which sent back the sound that has no fellow in music to the ear of the astounded bibi lupin it is the effect of the absolution i promised him in return for his revelations said jacques collin to the gendarme these corsicans monsieur are full of faith but he is as innocent as the immaculate babe and i mean to try to save him Section 60 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 9. Trompe la Mort, more Carlos Herrera, more the canon than ever, left the condemned cell, rushed back to the hall, and appeared before Monsieur Go in affected horror indeed sir the young man is innocent he has told me who the guilty person is he was ready to die for a false point of honour he is a corsican go and beg the public prosecutor to grant me five minutes interview monsieur de granville cannot refuse to listen at once to a spanish priest who is suffering so cruelly from the blunders of the french police 
i will go said monsieur gault to the extreme astonishment of all the witnesses of this extraordinary scene and meanwhile said jacques send me back to the prison-yard where i may finish the conversion of a criminal whose heart i have touched already they have hearts these people this speech produced a sensation in all who heard it the gendarmes the registry clerk sanson the warders the executioner's assistant all awaiting orders to go and get the scaffold ready to rig up the machine in prison slang all these people usually so indifferent were agitated by very natural curiosity just then the rattle of a carriage with high-stepping horses was heard it stopped very suggestively at the gate of the conciergerie on the quay the door was opened and the step let down in such haste that every one supposed that some great personage had arrived presently a lady waving a sheet of blue paper came forward to the outer gate of the prison followed by a footman and a chasseur dressed very handsomely and all in black with a veil over her bonnet she was wiping her eyes with a floridly embroidered handkerchief jacques collin at once recognized asie or to give the woman her true name jacqueline collin his aunt this horrible old woman worthy of her nephew whose thoughts were all centred in the prisoner and who was defending him with intelligence and mother wit that were a match for the powers of the law had a permit made out the evening before in the name of the duchesse de maufrigneuse's waiting-maid by the request of monsieur de serizy allowing her to see lucien de rubempre and the abbe carlos herrera so soon as he should be brought out of the secret cells on this the colonel who was the governor-in-chief of all the prisons had written a few words and the mere colour of the paper revealed powerful influences for these permits like theatre tickets differ in shape and appearance so the turnkey hastened to open the gate especially when he saw the chasseur with his plumes and a uniform of green and gold as dazzling as a russian general's proclaiming a lady of aristocratic rank and almost royal birth oh my dear abbe exclaimed this fine lady shedding a torrent of tears at the sight of the priest how could any one ever think of putting such a saintly man in here even by mistake the governor took the permit and read introduced by his excellency the comte de serizy ah madame de saint esteban madame la marquise cried carlos herrera what admirable devotion but madame such interviews are against the rules said the good old governor and he intercepted the advance of this bale of black watered silk and lace but at such a distance said jacques collin and in your presence and he looked round at the group his aunt whose dress might well dazzle the clerk the governor the warders and the gendarmes stank of musk she had on besides a thousand crowns of lace a black india cashmere shawl worth six thousand francs and her chasseur was marching up and down outside with the insolence of a lackey who knows that he is essential to an exacting princess he spoke never a word to the footman who stood by the gate on the quay which is always open by day what do you wish what can i do said madame de san esteban in the lingo agreed upon by this aunt and nephew this dialect consisted in adding terminations in r or in or or in al or in e to every word whether french or slang so as to disguise it by lengthening it it was a diplomatic cipher adapted to speech put all the letters in some safe place take out those that are most likely to compromise the ladies come back dressed very poorly to the salle des pas perdus and wait for my orders asie otherwise jacqueline 
knelt as if to receive his blessing and the sham priest blessed his aunt with evangelical unction addio marchesa said he aloud and he added in their private language find europe and Picard with the seven hundred and fifty thousand francs they bagged we must have them Picard is out there said the pious marquise pointing to the chasseur her eyes full of tears this intuitive comprehension brought not merely a smile to the man's lips but a gesture of surprise no one could astonish him but his aunt the sham marquise turned to the bystanders with the air of a woman accustomed to give herself airs he is in despair at being unable to attend his son's funeral said she in broken french for this monstrous miscarriage of justice has betrayed the saintly man's secret i am going to the funeral mass here monsieur she added to the governor handing him a purse of gold this is to give your poor prisoners some comforts what slap-up style her nephew whispered in approval jacques collin then followed the warder who led him back to the yard bibi lupin quite desperate had at last caught the eye of a real gendarme to whom since jacques collin had gone he had been addressing significant ahems and who took his place on guard in the condemned cell but trompe la mort's sworn foe was released too late to see the great lady who drove off in her dashing turnout and whose voice though disguised fell on his ear with a vicious twang three hundred shiners for the boarders said the head warder showing bibi lupin the purse which monsieur go had handed over to his clerk let's see monsieur jacometti said bibi lupin the police agent took the purse poured out the money into his hand and examined it curiously yes it is gold sure enough said he and a coat of arms on the purse the scoundrel how clever he is what an all-round villain he does us all brown and all the time he ought to be shot down like a dog why what's the matter asked the clerk taking back the money the matter why the hussy stole it cried bibi lupin stamping with rage on the flags of the gateway the words produced a great sensation among the spectators who were standing at a little distance from monsieur sanson he too was still standing his back against the large stove in the middle of the vaulted hall awaiting the order to crop the felon's hair and erect the scaffold on the place de greve on re-entering the yard jacques collin went towards his chums at a pace suited to a frequenter of the galleys what have you on your mind said he to la Pouraille. my game is up said the man whom jacques collin led into a corner what i want now is a pal i can trust what for la Pouraille, after telling the tale of all his crimes but in thieves slang gave an account of the murder and robbery of the two crottas you have my respect said jacques collin the job was well done but you seem to me to have blundered afterwards in what way well having done the trick you ought to have had a russian passport have made up as a russian prince bought a fine coach with a coat of arms on it have boldly deposited your money in a bank have got a letter of credit on hamburg and then have set out posting to hamburg with a valet a lady's maid and your mistress disguised as a russian princess at hamburg you should have sailed for mexico a chap of spirit with two hundred and eighty thousand francs in gold ought to be able to do what he pleases and go where he pleases flathead oh yes you have such notions because you are the boss your nut is always square on your shoulders but i in short a word of good advice in your position is like broth to a dead man 
said jacques collin with a serpent-like gaze at his old pal true enough said la pouraille looking dubious but give me the broth all the same if it does not suit my stomach i can warm my feet in it here you are nabbed by the justice with five robberies and three murders the latest of them those of two rich and respectable folks now juries do not like to see respectable folks killed you will be put through the machine and there is not a chance for you i have heard all that said la pouraille lamentably my aunt jacqueline with whom i have just exchanged a few words in the office and who is as you know a mother to the pals told me that the authorities mean to be quit of you they are so much afraid of you but i am rich now said la pouraille with a simplicity which showed how convinced a thief is of his natural right to steal what are they afraid of we have no time for philosophizing said jacques collin to come back to you what do you want with me said la pouraille interrupting his boss you shall see a dead dog is still worth something to other people said la pouraille i take you into my game said jacques collin well that is something said the murderer what next i do not ask you where your money is but what you mean to do with it la pouraille looked into the convict's impenetrable eye and jacques coldly went on have you a trip you are sweet upon or a child or a pal to be helped i shall be outside within an hour and i can do much for any one you want to be good-natured to la pouraille still hesitated he was delaying with indecision jacques collin produced a clinching argument your whack of our money would be thirty thousand francs do you leave it to the pals do you bequeath it to anybody your share is safe i can give it this evening to any one you leave it to the murderer gave a little start of satisfaction i have him said jacques collin to himself but we have no time to play consider he went on in la pouraille's ear we have not ten minutes to spare old chap the public prosecutor is to send for me and i am to have a talk with him i have him safe and can wring the old boss's neck i am certain i shall save madeleine if you save madeleine my good boss you can just as easily don't waste your spittle said jacques collin shortly make your will well then i want to leave the money to la Gonore, replied la pouraille piteously what are you living with moses's widow the jew who led the swindling gang in the south asked jacques collin for trompe la mort like a great general knew the person of every one of his army that's the woman said la pouraille much flattered a pretty woman said jacques collin who knew exactly how to manage his dreadful tools the mall is a beauty she is well informed and stands by her mates and a first-rate hand yes la gonore has made a new man of you what a flat you must be to risk your nut when you have a trip like her at home you noodle you should have set up some respectable little shop and lived quietly and what does she do she is settled in the rue saint barbe managing a house and she is to be your legatee ah my dear boy this is what such sluts bring us to when we are such fools as to love them yes but don't you give her anything till i am done for it is a sacred trust said jacques collin very seriously and nothing to the pals nothing they blowed the gaff for me answered la pouraille vindictively who did shall i serve em out asked jacques collin eagerly trying to rouse the last sentiment that survives in these souls till the last hour 
who knows old pal but i might at the same time do them a bad turn and serve you with the public prosecutor the murderer looked at his boss with amazed satisfaction at this moment the boss replied to this expressive look i am playing the game only for theodore when this farce is played out old boy i might do wonders for a chum for you are a chum of mine if i see that you really can put off the engagement for that poor little theodore i will do anything you choose there but the trick is done i am sure to save his head if you want to get out of the scrape you see la Pouraille, you must be ready to do a good turn we can do nothing single-handed that's true said the felon his confidence was so strong and his faith in the boss so fanatical that he no longer hesitated la Pouraille revealed the names of his accomplices a secret hitherto well kept this was all jacques needed to know that is the whole story ruffard was the third in the job with me and godet arrache laine cried jacques collin giving ruffard his nickname among the gang that's the man and the blackguards peached because i knew where they had hidden their whack and they did not know where mine was you are making it all easy my cherub said jacques collin what well replied the master you see how wise it is to trust me entirely your revenge is now part of the hand i am playing i do not ask you to tell me where the dibs are you can tell me at the last moment but tell me all about ruffard and godet you are and always will be our boss i have no secrets from you replied la Pouraille. my money is in the cellar at la Gonore's. and you are not afraid of her telling why get along she knows nothing about my little game replied la Pouraille. i made her drunk though she is of the sort that would never blab even with her head under the knife but such a lot of gold yes that turns the milk of the purest conscience replied jacques collin so i could do the job with no peepers to spy me all the chickens were gone to roost the shiners are three feet underground behind some wine bottles and i spread some stones and mortar over them good said jacques collin and the others ruffard's pieces are with la Gonore in the poor woman's bedroom and he has her tight by that for she might be nabbed as accessory after the fact and end her days in saint lazare the villain the reelers teach a thief what's what said jacques godet left his pieces at his sister's a washerwoman honest girl she may be caught for five years in la force without dreaming of it the pal raised the tiles of the floor put them back again and guide now do you know what i want you to do said jacques collin with a magnetizing gaze at la Pouraille. what i want you to take madeleine's job on your shoulders la Pouraille started queerly but he at once recovered himself and stood at attention under the boss's eye so you shy at that you dare to spoil my game come now four murders or three does it not come to the same thing perhaps by the god of good fellowship there is no blood in your veins and i was thinking of saving you how idiot if we promise to give the money back to the family you will only be lagged for life i would not give a piece for your nut if we keep the blunt but at this moment you are worth seven hundred thousand francs you flat good for you boss cried la Pouraille in great glee and then said jacques collin besides casting all the murders on ruffard bibi lupin will be finely cold i have him this time 
la Pouraille was speechless at this suggestion his eyes grew round and he stood like an image he had been three months in custody and was committed for trial and his chums at la force to whom he had never mentioned his accomplices had given him such small comfort that he was entirely hopeless after his examination and this simple expedient had been quite overlooked by these prison-ridden minds this semblance of a hope almost stupefied his brain have ruffar and godet had their spree yet have they forked out any of the yellow boys asked jacques collin they dare not replied la Pouraille. the wretches are waiting till i am turned off that is what my mall sent me word by la Bif when she came to see le biffon very well we will have their whack of money in twenty-four hours said jacques collin then the blackguards cannot pay up as you will you will come out as white as snow and they will be red with all that blood by my kind offices you will seem a good sort of fellow led away by them i shall have money enough of yours to prove alibis on the other counts and when you are back on the hulks for you are bound to go there you must see about escaping it is a dog's life still it is life la Pouraille's eyes glittered with suppressed delirium with seven hundred thousand francs you can get a good many drinks said jacques collin making his pal quite drunk with hope ay ay boss i can bamboozle the minister of justice aha ruffar will shell out to do for a reeler bibi lupin is fairly gulled very good it is a bargain said la Pouraille, with savage glee you order and i obey and he hugged jacques collin in his arms while tears of joy stood in his eyes so hopeful did he feel of saving his head that is not all said jacques collin the public prosecutor does not swallow everything you know especially when a new count is entered against you the next thing is to bring a maul into the case by blowing the gaff but how and what for do as i bid you you will see and trompe la mort briefly told the secret of the nanterre murders showing him how necessary it was to find a woman who would pretend to be ginetta then he and la Pouraille, now in good spirits went across to le biffon i know how sweet you are on la Bif, said jacques collin to this man the expression in le biffon's eyes was a horrible poem what will she do while you are on the hulks a tear sparkled in le biffon's fierce eyes well suppose i were to get her lodgings in the l'orsafe des largues the women's la force that is les madelinettes or saint lazare for a stretch allowing that time for you to be sentenced and sent there to arrive and to escape even you cannot work such a miracle she took no part in the job replied la Bif's partner oh my good biffon said la Pouraille, our boss is more powerful than god almighty what is your password for her asked jacques collin with the assurance of a master to whom nothing can be refused sorgapontin night in paris if you say that she knows you have come from me and if you want her to do as you bid her show her a five-franc piece and say pendif she will be involved in the sentence on la Pouraille, and let off with a year in quad for snitching said jacques collin looking at la Pouraille. la Pouraille understood his boss's scheme and by a single look promised to persuade le biffon to promote it by inducing la Bif to take upon herself this complicity in the crime la Pouraille was prepared to confess farewell my children you will presently hear that i have saved my boy from jack ketch said trompe la mort 
yes jack ketch and his hairdresser were waiting in the office to get madeleine ready there he added they have come to fetch me to go to the public prosecutor and in fact a warder came out of the gate and beckoned to this extraordinary man who in face of the young corsican's danger had recovered Section 61 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac. Translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 10. It is worthy of note that at the moment when Lucien's body was taken away from him, Jacques Collin had, with a crowning effort, made up his mind to attempt a last incarnation not as a human being but as a thing he had at last taken the fateful step that napoleon took on board the boat which conveyed him to the bellerophon and a strange concurrence of events aided this genius of evil and corruption in his undertaking but though the unlooked-for conclusion of this life of crime may perhaps be deprived of some of the marvellous effect which in our day can be given to a narrative only by incredible improbabilities it is necessary before we accompany jacques collin to the public prosecutor's room that we should follow madame camusot in her visits during the time we have spent in the conciergerie one of the obligations which the historian of manners must unfailingly observe is that of never marring the truth for the sake of dramatic arrangement especially when the truth is so kind as to be in itself romantic social nature particularly in paris allows of such freaks of chance such complications of whimsical entanglements that it constantly outdoes the most inventive imagination the audacity of facts by sheer improbability or indecorum rises to heights of situation forbidden to art unless they are softened cleansed and purified by the writer madame camusot did her utmost to dress herself for the morning almost in good taste a difficult task for the wife of a judge who for six years has lived in a provincial town her object was to give no hold for criticism to the marquise d'espard or the duchesse de maufrigneuse in a call so early as between eight and nine in the morning amelie cecile camusot née tyrion it must be said only half succeeded and in a matter of dress is this not a twofold blunder few people can imagine how useful the women of paris are to ambitious men of every class they are equally necessary in the world of fashion and the world of thieves where as we have seen they fill a most important part for instance suppose that a man not to find himself left in the lurch must absolutely get speech within a given time with the high functionary who was of such immense importance under the restoration and who is to this day called the keeper of the seals a man let us say in the most favourable position a judge that is to say a man familiar with the way of things he is compelled to seek out the presiding judge of a circuit or some private or official secretary and prove to him his need of an immediate interview but is a keeper of the seals ever visible that very minute in the middle of the day if he is not at the chamber he is at the privy council or signing papers or hearing a case in the early morning he is out no one knows where in the evening he has public and private engagements if every magistrate could claim a moment's interview under any pretext that might occur to him the supreme judge would be besieged the purpose of a private and immediate interview is therefore submitted 
to the judgment of one of those mediatory potentates who are but an obstacle to be removed a door that can be unlocked so long as it is not held by a rival a woman at once goes to another woman she can get straight into her bedroom if she can arouse the curiosity of mistress or maid especially if the mistress is under the stress of a strong interest or pressing necessity call this female potentate madame la marquise d'espard with whom a minister has to come to terms this woman writes a little scented note which her manservant carries to the minister's manservant the note greets the minister on his waking and he reads it at once though the minister has business to attend to the man is enchanted to have a reason for calling on one of the queens of paris one of the powers of the faubourg saint germain one of the favorites of the dauphiness of madame or of the king casimir perrier the only real statesman of the revolution of july would leave anything to call on a retired gentleman of the bedchamber to king charles x this theory accounts for the magical effect of the words madame madame camusot on very important business which she says you know of spoken in madame d'espard's ear by her maid who thought she was awake and the marquise desired that amelie should be shown in at once the magistrate's wife was attentively heard when she began with these words madame la marquise we have ruined ourselves by trying to avenge you how is that my dear replied the marquise looking at madame camusot in the dim light that fell through the half-open door you are vastly sweet this morning in that little bonnet where do you get that shape you are very kind madame well you know that camusot's way of examining lucien de rubempre drove the young man to despair and he hanged himself in prison oh what will become of madame de serizy cried the marquise affecting ignorance that she might hear the whole story once more alas they say she is quite mad said amelie if you could persuade the lord keeper to send for my husband this minute by special messenger to meet him at the palais the minister would hear some strange mysteries and report them no doubt to the king then camusot's enemies would be reduced to silence but who are camusot's enemies asked madame d'espard the public prosecutor and now monsieur de serizy very good my dear replied madame d'espard who owed to monsieur de granville and the comte de serizy her defeat in the disgraceful proceedings by which she had tried to have her husband treated as a lunatic i will protect you i never forget either my foes or my friends she rang the maid drew open the curtains and daylight flooded the room she asked for her desk and the maid brought it in the marquise hastily scrawled a few lines tell godard to go on horseback and carry this note to the chancellor's office there is no reply said she to the maid the woman went out of the room quickly but in spite of the order remained at the door for some minutes there are great mysteries going forward then asked madame d'espard tell me all about it dear child has clotilde de grandlieu put a finger in the pie you will know everything from the lord keeper for my husband has told me nothing he only told me he was in danger it would be better for us that madame de serizy should die than that she should remain mad poor woman said the marquise but was she not mad already women of the world by a hundred ways of pronouncing the same phrase illustrate to attentive hearers the infinite variety of musical modes 
the soul goes out into the voice as it does into the eyes it vibrates in light and in air the elements acted on by the eyes and the voice by the tone she gave to the two words poor woman the marquise betrayed the joy of satisfied hatred the pleasure of triumph oh what woes did she not wish to befall lucien's protectress revenge which nothing can assuage which can survive the person hated fills us with dark terrors and madame camusot though harsh herself vindictive and quarrelsome was overwhelmed she could find nothing to say and was silent diane told me that leontine went to the prison madame d'espard went on the dear duchess is in despair at such a scandal for she is so foolish as to be very fond of madame de serizy however it is comprehensible they both adored that little fool lucien at about the same time and nothing so effectually binds or severs two women as worshipping at the same altar and our dear friend spent two hours yesterday in leontine's room the poor countess it seems says dreadful things i heard that it was disgusting a woman of rank ought not to give way to such attacks bah, a purely physical passion the duchess came to see me as pale as death she really was very brave there are monstrous things connected with this business my husband will tell the keeper of the seals all he knows for his own justification for they wanted to save lucien and he madame la marquise did his duty an examining judge always has to question people in private at the time fixed by law he had to ask the poor little wretch something if only for form's sake and the young fellow did not understand and confessed things he was an impertinent fool said madame d'espard in a hard tone the judge's wife kept silence on hearing this sentence though we failed in the matter of the commission in lunacy it was not camusot's fault i shall never forget that said the marquise after a pause it was lucien monsieur de serizy monsieur de bauvin and monsieur de granville who overthrew us with time god will be on my side all those people will come to grief be quite easy i will send the chevalier d'espard to the keeper of the seals that he may desire your husband's presence immediately if that is of any use oh madame listen said the marquise i promise you the ribbon of the legion of honor at once to-morrow it will be a conspicuous testimonial of satisfaction with your conduct in this affair yes it implies further blame on lucien it will prove him guilty men do not commonly hang themselves for the pleasure of it now good-bye my pretty dear ten minutes later madame camusot was in the bedroom of the beautiful diane de maufrigneuse who had not gone to bed till one and at nine o'clock had not yet slept however insensible duchesses may be even these women whose hearts are of stone cannot see a friend a victim to madness without being painfully impressed by it and besides the connection between diane and lucien though at an end now eighteen months since had left such memories with the duchess that the poor boy's disastrous end had been to her also a fearful blow all night diane had seen visions of the beautiful youth so charming so poetical who had been so delightful a lover painted as leontine depicted him with the vividness of wild delirium she had letters from lucien that she had kept intoxicating letters worthy to compare with mirabeau's to sophie but more literary more elaborate for lucien's letters had been dictated by the most powerful of passions vanity 
having the most bewitching of duchesses for his mistress and seeing her commit any folly for him secret follies of course had turned lucien's head with happiness the lover's pride had inspired the poet and the duchess had treasured these touching letters as some old men keep indecent prints for the sake of their extravagant praise of all that was least duchess-like in her nature and he died in a squalid prison cried she to herself putting the letters away in a panic when she heard her maid knocking gently at the door madame camusot said the woman on business of the greatest importance to you madame la duchesse diane sprang to her feet in terror oh cried she looking at amelie who had assumed a duly condoling air i guess it all my letters it is about my letters oh my letters my letters she sank on to a couch she remembered now how in the extravagance of her passion she had answered lucien in the same vein had lauded the man's poetry as he had sung the charms of the woman and in what a strain alas yes madame i have come to save what is dearer to you than life your honour compose yourself and get dressed we must go to the duchesse de grandlieu happily for you you are not the only person compromised but at the palais yesterday leontine burned i am told all the letters found at poor lucien's but madame behind lucien there was jacques collin cried the magistrate's wife you always forget that horrible companionship which beyond question led to that charming and lamented young man's end that machiavelli of the galleys never loses his head monsieur camusot is convinced that the wretch has in some safe hiding-place all the most compromising letters written by you ladies to his his friend the duchess hastily put in you are right my child we must hold counsel at the grandlieus we are all concerned in this matter and serizy happily will lend us his aid extreme peril as we have observed in the scenes in the conciergerie has a hold over the soul not less terrible than that of powerful reagents over the body it is a mental voltaic battery the day perhaps is not far off when the process shall be discovered by which feeling is chemically converted into a fluid not unlike the electric fluid the phenomena were the same in the convict and the duchess this crushed half-dying woman who had not slept who was so particular over her dressing had recovered the strength of a lioness at bay and the presence of mind of a general under fire diane chose her gown and got through her dressing with the alacrity of a grisette who is her own waiting woman it was so astounding that the lady's maid stood for a moment stock still so greatly was she surprised to see her mistress in her shift not ill-pleased perhaps to let the judge's wife discern through the thin cloud of lawn a form as white and as perfect as that of canova's venus it was like a gem in a fold of tissue paper diane suddenly remembered where a pair of stays had been put that fastened in front sparing a woman in a hurry the ill-spent time and fatigue of being laced she had arranged the lace trimming of her shift and the fullness of the bosom by the time the maid had fetched her petticoat and crowned the work by putting on her gown while amelie at a sign from the maid hooked the bodice behind the woman brought out a pair of thread stockings velvet boots a shawl and a bonnet amelie and the maid each drew on a stocking you are the loveliest creature i ever saw said amelie insidiously kissing diane's elegant and polished knee with an eager impulse madame has not her match cried the maid 
there there josette hold your tongue replied the duchess have you a carriage she went on to madame camusot then come along my dear we can talk on the road and the duchess ran down the great stairs of the hotel de cadignan putting on her gloves as she went a thing she had never been known to do to the hotel de grandlieu and drive fast said she to one of her men signing to him to get up behind the footman hesitated it was a hackney coach ah madame la duchesse you never told me that the young man had letters of yours otherwise camusot would have proceeded differently leontine's state so occupied my thoughts that i forgot myself entirely the poor woman was almost crazy the day before yesterday imagine the effect on her of this tragical termination if you could only know child what a morning we went through yesterday it is enough to make one forswear love yesterday leontine and i were dragged across paris by a horrible old woman an old clothes buyer a domineering creature to that stinking and blood-stained sty they call the palace of justice and i said to her as i took her there is not this enough to make us fall on our knees and cry out like madame de nucingen when she went through one of those awful mediterranean storms on her way to naples dear god save me this time and never again these two days will certainly have shortened my life what fools we are ever to write but love prompts us we receive pages that fire the heart through the eyes and everything is in a blaze prudence deserts us we reply but why reply when you can act said madame camusot it is grand to lose oneself utterly cried the duchess with pride it is the luxury of the soul beautiful women are excusable said madame camusot modestly they have more opportunities of falling than we have the duchess smiled we are always too generous said diane de maufrigneuse i shall do just like that odious madame d'espard and what does she do asked the judge's wife very curious she has written a thousand love notes so many exclaimed amelie interrupting the duchess well my dear and not a word that could compromise her is to be found in any one of them you would be incapable of maintaining such coldness such caution said madame camusot you are a woman you are one of those angels who cannot stand out against the devil i have made a vow to write no more letters i never in my life wrote to anybody but that unhappy lucien i will keep his letters to my dying day my dear child they are fire and sometimes we want but if they were found said amelie with a little shocked expression oh i should say they were part of a romance i was writing for i have copied them all my dear and burned the originals oh madame as a reward allow me to read them perhaps child said the duchess and then you will see that he did not write such letters as those to leontine this speech was woman Section 62 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac Translated by James Waring This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary Vautrin's Last Avatar Chapter 11 Madame Camusot, like the frog in La Fontaine's fable, was ready to burst her skin with the joy of going to the grand lieus in the society of the beautiful diane de maufrigneuse 
this morning she would forge one of the links that are so needful to ambition she could already hear herself addressed as madame la presidente she felt the ineffable gladness of triumphing over stupendous obstacles of which the greatest was her husband's ineptitude as yet unrevealed but to her well known to win success for a second-rate man that is to a woman as to a king the delight which tempts great actors when they act a bad play a hundred times over it is the very drunkenness of egoism it is in a way the saturnalia of power power can prove itself to itself only by the strange misapplication which leads it to crown some absurd person with the laurels of success while insulting genius the only stronghold which power cannot touch the knighting of caligula's horse an imperial farce has been and always will be a favorite performance in a few minutes diane and amelie had exchanged the elegant disorder of the fair diane's bedroom for the severe but dignified and splendid austerity of the duchesse de grandlieu's rooms she a portuguese and very pious always rose at eight to attend mass at the little church of saint balaire a chapelry to saint thomas d'aquin standing at that time on the esplanade of the invalides this chapel now destroyed was rebuilt in the rue de bourgogne pending the building of a gothic church to be dedicated to saint clotilde on hearing the first words spoken in her ear by diane de maufrigneuse this saintly lady went to find monsieur de grandlieu and brought him back at once the duke threw a flashing look at madame camusot one of those rapid glances with which a man of the world can guess at a whole existence or often read a soul amelie's dress greatly helped the duke to decipher the story of a middle-class life from alencon to mantes and from mantes to paris oh if only the lawyer's wife could have understood this gift in dukes she could never have endured that politely ironical look she saw the politeness only ignorance shares the privileges of fine breeding this is madame camusot a daughter of tyrion's one of the cabinet ushers said the duchess to her husband the duke bowed with extreme politeness to the wife of a legal official and his face became a little less grave the duke had rung for his valet who now came in go to the rue st honore take a coach ring at a side door number ten tell the man who opens the door that i beg his master will come here and if the gentleman is at home bring him back with you mention my name that will remove all difficulties and do not be gone more than a quarter of an hour in all another footman the duchess's servant came in as soon as the other was gone go from me to the duc de chaulieu and send up this card the duke gave him a card folded down in a particular way when the two friends wanted to meet at once on any urgent or confidential business which would not allow of note-writing they used this means of communication thus we see that similar customs prevail in every rank of society and differ only in manner civility and small details the world of fashion too has its argot its slang but that slang is called style are you quite sure madame of the existence of the letters you say were written by mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu to this young man said the duc de grandlieu and he cast a look at madame camusot as a sailor casts a sounding line i have not seen them but there is reason to fear it replied madame camusot quaking my daughter can have written nothing we would not own to said the duchess poor duchess thought diane with a glance at the duke that terrified him what do you think my dear little diane 
said the duke in a whisper as he led her away into a recess clotilde is so crazy about lucien my dear friend that she had made an assignation with him before leaving if it had not been for little lenoncourt she would perhaps have gone off with him into the forest of fontainebleau i know that lucien used to write letters to her which were enough to turn the brain of a saint we are three daughters of eve in the coils of the serpent of letter-writing the duke and diane came back to the duchess and madame camusot who were talking in undertones amelie following the advice of the duchesse de maufrigneuse affected piety to win the proud lady's favour we are at the mercy of a dreadful escaped convict said the duke with a peculiar shrug this is what comes of opening one's house to people one is not absolutely sure of before admitting an acquaintance one ought to know all about his fortune his relations all his previous history this speech is the moral of my story from the aristocratic point of view that is past and over said the duchesse de maufrigneuse now we must think of saving that poor madame de serizy clotilde and me we can but wait for henri i have sent to him but everything really depends on the man gentil is gone to fetch god grant that man may be in paris madame he added to madame camusot thank you so much for having thought of us this was madame camusot's dismissal the daughter of the court usher had wit enough to understand the duke she rose but the duchesse de maufrigneuse with the enchanting grace which had won her so much friendship and discretion took amelie by the hand as if to show her in a way to the duke and duchess on my own account said she to say nothing of her having been up before daybreak to save us all i may ask for more than a remembrance for my little madame camusot in the first place she has already done me such a service as i cannot forget and then she is wholly devoted to our side she and her husband i have promised her that camusot shall have advancement and i beg you above everything to help him on for my sake you need no such recommendation said the duke to madame camusot the grandlieus always remember a service done them the king's adherents will ere long have a chance of distinguishing themselves they will be called upon to prove their devotion your husband will be placed in the front madame camusot withdrew proud happy puffed up to suffocation she reached home triumphant she admired herself she made light of the public prosecutor's hostility she said to herself supposing we were to send monsieur de granville flying it was high time for madame camusot to vanish the duc de chaulieu one of the king's prime favorites met the bourgeoise on the outer steps henri said the duc de grandlieu when he heard his friend announced make haste i beg of you to get to the chateau try to see the king the business is this and he led the duke into the window recess where he had been talking to the airy and charming diane now and then the duc de chaulieu glanced in the direction of the flighty duchess who while talking to the pious duchess and submitting to be lectured answered the duc de chaulieu's expressive looks my dear child said the duc de grandlieu to her at last the aside being ended do be good come now and he took diane's hands observe the proprieties of life do not compromise yourself any more write no letters letters my dear have caused as much private woe as public mischief what might be excusable in a girl like clotilde in love for the first time had no excuse in an old soldier who has been under fire said diane with a pout 
this grimace and the duchess's jest brought a smile to the face of the two much troubled dukes and of the pious duchess herself but for four years i have never written a billet doux are we saved asked diane who hid her curiosity under this childishness not yet said the duc de chaulieu you have no notion how difficult it is to do an arbitrary thing in a constitutional king it is what infidelity is in a wife it is adultery the fascinating sin said the duc de grandlieu forbidden fruit said diane smiling oh how i wish i were the government for i have none of that fruit left i have eaten it all oh my dear my dear said the elder duchess you really go too far the two dukes hearing a coach stop at the door with the clatter of horses checked in full gallop bowed to the ladies and left them going into the duc de grandlieu's study whither came the gentleman from the rue honore chevalier no less a man than the chief of the king's private police the obscure but puissant corentin go on said the duc de grandlieu go first monsieur de saint denis corentin surprised that the duke should have remembered him went forward after bowing low to the two noblemen always about the same individual or about his concerns my dear sir said the duc de grandlieu but he is dead said corentin he has left a partner said the duc de chaulieu a very tough customer the convict jacques collin replied corentin will you speak ferdinand said the duc de chaulieu to his friend that wretch is an object of fear said the duc de grandlieu for he has possessed himself so as to be able to levy blackmail of the letters written by madame de serizy and madame de maufrigneuse to lucien chardon that man's tool it would seem that it was a matter of system in the young man to extract passionate letters in return for his own for i am told that mademoiselle de grandlieu had written some at least so we fear and we cannot find out from her she is gone abroad that little young man replied corentin was incapable of so much foresight that was a precaution due to the abbe carlos herrera corentin rested his elbow on the arm of the chair on which he was sitting and his head on his hand meditating money the man has more than we have said he esther gobseck served him as a bait to extract nearly two million francs from that well of gold called nucingen gentlemen get me full legal powers and i will rid you of the fellow and the letters asked the duc de grandlieu listen to me gentlemen said corentin standing up his weasel face betraying his excitement he thrust his hands into the pockets of his black doeskin trousers shaped over the shoes this great actor in the historical drama of the day had only stopped to put on a waistcoat and frock coat and had not changed his morning trousers so well he knew how grateful men can be for immediate action in certain cases he walked up and down the room quite at his ease haranguing loudly as if he had been alone he is a convict he could be sent off to bicetre without trial and put in solitary confinement without a soul to speak to and left there to die but he may have given instructions to his adherents foreseeing this possibility but he was put into the secret cells said the duc de grandlieu the moment he was taken into custody at that woman's house is there such a thing as a secret cell for such a fellow as he is said corentin he is a match for for me what is to be done said the dukes to each other by a glance we can send the scoundrel back to the hulks at once to rochefort he will be dead in six months 
oh without committing any crime he added in reply to a gesture on the part of the duc de grandlieu what do you expect a convict cannot hold out more than six months of a hot summer if he is made to work really hard among the marshes of the charente but this is of no use if our man has taken precautions with regard to the letters if the villain has been suspicious of his foes and that is probable we must find out what steps he has taken then if the present holder of the letters is poor he is open to bribery so no we must make jacques collin speak what a jewel he will beat me the better plan would be to purchase those letters by exchange for another document a letter of reprieve and to place the man in my gang jacques collin is the only man alive who is clever enough to come after me poor contenson and dear old peyrade both being dead jacques collin killed those two unrivalled spies on purpose as it were to make a place for himself so you see gentlemen you must give me a free hand jacques collin is in the conciergerie i will go to see monsieur de granville in his court send some one you can trust to meet me there for i must have a letter to show to monsieur de granville who knows nothing of me i will hand the letter to the president of the council a very impressive sponsor you have half an hour before you for i need half an hour to dress that is to say to make myself presentable to the eyes of the public prosecutor monsieur said the duc de chaulieu i know your wonderful skill i only ask you to say yes or no will you be bound to succeed yes if i have full powers and your word that i shall never be questioned about the matter my plan is laid this sinister reply made the two fine gentlemen shiver go on then monsieur said the duc de chaulieu you can set down the charges of the case among those you are in the habit of undertaking corentin bowed and went away henri de lenancourt for whom ferdinand de grandlieu had a carriage brought out went off forthwith to the king whom he was privileged to see at all times in right of his office thus all the various interests that had got entangled from the highest to the lowest ranks of society were to meet presently in monsieur de granville's room at the palais all brought together by necessity embodied in three men justice in monsieur de granville and the family in corentin face to face with jacques collin the Section 63 of Scenes from a Courtesan's Life by Honoré de Balzac, translated by James Waring. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Vautrin's Last Avatar. Chapter 12. What a jewel is that between justice and arbitrary wills on one side, and the hulks and cunning on the other? The hulks symbolical of that daring which throws off calculation and reflection which avails itself of any means which has none of the hypocrisy of high-handed justice but is the hideous outcome of the starving stomach the swift and bloodthirsty pretext of hunger is it not attack as against self-protection theft as against property the terrible quarrel between the social state and the natural man fought out on the narrowest possible ground in short it is a terrible and vivid image of those compromises hostile to social interests which the representatives of authority when they lack power submit to with the fiercest rebels 
when m camusot was announced the public prosecutor signed that he should be admitted m de granville had foreseen this visit and wished to come to an understanding with the examining judge as to how to wind up this business of lucien's death the end could no longer be that on which he had decided the day before in agreement with camusot before the suicide of the hapless poet sit down monsieur camusot said monsieur de granville dropping into his armchair the public prosecutor alone with the inferior judge made no secret of his depressed state camusot looked at monsieur de granville and observed his almost livid pallor and such utter fatigue such complete prostration as betrayed greater suffering perhaps than that of the condemned man to whom the clerk had announced the rejection of his appeal and yet that announcement in the forms of justice is as much as to say prepare to die your last hour has come i will return later monsieur le comte said camusot though business is pressing no stay replied the public prosecutor with dignity a magistrate monsieur must accept his anxieties and know how to hide them i was in fault if you saw any traces of agitation in me camusot bowed apologetically god grant you may never know these crucial perplexities of our life a man might sink under less i have just spent the night with one of my most intimate friends i have but two friends the comte octave de beauvin and the comte de serizy we sat together monsieur de serizy the count and i from six in the evening till six this morning taking it in turns to go from the drawing-room to madame de serizy's bedside fearing each time that we might find her dead or irremediably insane Desplein, Bianchon, and Sinard never left the room, and she has two nurses. The Count worships his wife. Imagine the night I have spent between a woman crazy with love and a man crazy with despair. And a statesman's despair is not like that of an idiot. Serizy, as calm as if he were sitting in his place in council, clutched his chair to force himself to show us an unmoved countenance while sweat stood over the brows bent by so much hard thought worn out by want of sleep i dozed from five till half-past seven and i had to be here by half-past eight to warrant an execution take my word for it monsieur camusot when a judge has been toiling all night in such gulfs of sorrow feeling the heavy hand of god on all human concerns and heaviest on noble souls it is hard to sit down here in front of a desk and say in cold blood cut off a head at four o'clock destroy one of god's creatures full of life health and strength and yet this is my duty sunk in grief myself i must order the scaffold the condemned wretch cannot know that his judge suffers anguish equal to his own at this moment he and i linked by a sheet of paper i society avenging itself he the crime to be avenged embody the same duty seen from two sides we are two lives joined for the moment by the sword of the law who pities the judge's deep sorrow who can soothe it our glory is to bury it in the depth of our heart the priest with his life given to god the soldier with a thousand deaths for his country's sake seem to me far happier than the magistrate with his doubts and fears and appalling responsibility you know who the condemned man is monsieur de granville went on a young man of seven-and-twenty as handsome as he who killed himself yesterday and as fair condemned against all our anticipations for the only proof against him was his concealment of the stolen goods though sentenced the lad will confess nothing 
for seventy days he has held out against every test constantly declaring that he is innocent for two months i have felt two heads on my shoulders i would give a year of my life if he would confess for juries need encouragement and imagine what a blow it would be to justice if some day it should be discovered that the crime for which he is punished was committed by another in paris everything is so terribly important the most trivial incidents in the law courts have political consequences the jury an institution regarded by the legislators of the revolution as a source of strength is in fact an instrument of social ruin for it fails in action it does not sufficiently protect society the jury trifles with its functions the class of jurymen is divided into two parties one averse to capital punishment the result is a total upheaval of true equality in administration of the law parricide a most horrible crime is in some departments treated with leniency while in others a common murder so to speak is punished with death there are in penal servitude twenty-three parricides who have been allowed the benefit of extenuating circumstances and what would happen if here in paris in our home district an innocent man should be executed he is an escaped convict said monsieur camusot diffidently the opposition and the press would make him a paschal lamb cried monsieur de granville and the opposition would enjoy whitewashing him for he is a fanatical corsican full of his native notions and his murders were a vendetta in that island you may kill your enemy and think yourself and be thought a very good man a thorough-paced magistrate i tell you is an unhappy man they ought to live apart from all society like the pontiffs of old the world should never see them but at fixed hours leaving their cells grave and old and venerable passing sentence like the high priests of antiquity who combined in their person the functions of judicial and sacerdotal authority we should be accessible only in our high seat as it is we are to be seen every day amused or unhappy like other men we are to be found in drawing-rooms and at home as ordinary citizens moved by our passions and we seem perhaps more grotesque than terrible this bitter cry broken by pauses and interjections and emphasized by gestures which gave it an eloquence impossible to reduce to writing made camusot's blood run chill and i monsieur said he began yesterday my apprenticeship to the sufferings of our calling i could have died of that young fellow's death he misunderstood my wish to be lenient and the poor wretch committed himself ah you ought never to have examined him cried monsieur de granville it is so easy to oblige by doing nothing and the law monsieur replied camusot he had been in custody two days the mischief is done said the public prosecutor i have done my best to remedy what is indeed irremediable my carriage and servants are following the poor weak poet to the grave serizy has sent his too nay more he accepts the duty imposed on him by the unfortunate boy and will act as his executor by promising this to his wife he won from her a gleam of returning sanity and count octave is attending the funeral in person well then monsieur le comte said camusot let us complete our work we have a very dangerous man on our hands he is jacques collin and you know it as well as i do the ruffian will be recognized then we are lost cried monsieur de granville he is at this moment shut up with your condemned murderer who on the hulks was to him what lucien has been in paris 
a favorite protege bibi lupin disguised as a gendarme is watching the interview what business has the superior police to interfere said the public prosecutor he has no business to act without my orders all the conciergerie must know that we have caught jacques collin well i have come on purpose to tell you that this daring felon has in his possession the most compromising letters of lucien's correspondence with madame de serizy the duchesse de maufrigneuse and mademoiselle clotilde de grandlieu are you sure of that asked monsieur de granville his face full of pained surprise you shall hear monsieur le comte what reason i have to fear such a misfortune when i untied the papers found in the young man's rooms jacques collin gave a keen look at the parcel and smiled with satisfaction in a way that no examining judge could misunderstand so deep a villain as jacques collin takes good care not to let such a weapon slip through his fingers what is to be said if these documents should be placed in the hands of counsel chosen by that rascal from among the foes of the government and the aristocracy my wife to whom the duchesse de maufrigneuse has shown so much kindness is gone to warn her and by this time they must be with the grandlieus holding counsel but we cannot possibly try the man cried the public prosecutor rising and striding up and down the room he must have put the papers in some safe place i know where said camusot these words finally effaced every prejudice the public prosecutor had felt against him well then said monsieur de granville sitting down again on my way here this morning i reflected deeply on this miserable business jacques collin has an aunt an aunt by nature not putative a woman concerning whom the superior police have communicated a report to the prefecture he is this woman's pupil and idol she is his father's sister her name is jacqueline collin this wretched woman carries on a trade as a wardrobe purchaser and by the connection this business has secured her she gets hold of many family secrets if jacques collin has entrusted those papers which would be his salvation to any one's keeping it is to that of this creature have her arrested the public prosecutor gave camusot a keen look as much as to say this man is not such a fool as i thought him he is still young and does not yet know how to handle the reins of justice but camusot went on in order to succeed we must give up all the plans we laid yesterday and i came to take your advice your orders the public prosecutor took up his paper knife and tapped it against the edge of the table with one of the tricky movements familiar to thoughtful men when they give themselves up to meditation three noble families involved he exclaimed we must not make the smallest blunder you are right as a first step let us act on fouche's principle arrest and jacques collin must at once be sent back to the secret cells that is to proclaim him a convict and to ruin lucien's memory what a desperate business